Church on your brother Zachwa and with me is Brother Kasafo. We have a great lesson today. We're going to be going into narcissism. First and foremost, this is going to be a pretty lengthy lesson. Um, all the solutions and all the remedies for narcissism will be explained closer to the end of the lesson. So we hope that everyone actually takes the time and actually views the lesson and actually view it in its entirety so you can have a complete understanding both worldly and biblically, to be able to put the two together to get a complete understanding. So what we're first going to do, we're going to go over narcissism and its complexities, and then we're going to go into scriptures to then tie everything together to formulate a complete understanding. Brother Kasafo, if you don't mind, if we can go ahead and start at the beginning, please. Okay. A covert narcissist displays most subtle signs of narcissism, like hypersensitivity to criticism, chronic envy or jealousy, gaslighting, lack of empathy, and feelings of superiority. All right. So we have the covert narcissist, which there are two different types of narcissists. There is a covert narcissist and an overt narcissist. Both of these narcissists display things very differently in the way that they go about things, but they both have the same end goal at the end of what we call narcissism. Uh, go ahead, Brother Kasim. And we're going to go over these things. We're going to go over the hypersensitivity, the criticism, um, the chronic envy, the jealousy, the gaslight, and the lack of empathy, and the feelings of superiority. We're going to go over all those things. All right, go ahead, Brother Kasim. Unlike most narcissists, who can be grandoise and outgoing, covert narcissists are often introverted and better at hiding feelings of self-importance. Right. So we're getting the dynamic of a covert narcissist and a overt narcissist. Now we're going to go into both of these types. First, we're going to give information so that you can understand both of these different um I guess you will call them categories of narcissism. All right. Go ahead, Brother Costa. This can make it easier to fall victim to their problematic behaviors. Right. So what it's explaining is that a covert narcissist, as the word implies covert, is harder to detect than an overt narcissist. So a covert narcissist, they can lure you in a little bit better and you're going to understand why they can lower you in a little bit better as we continue to go on uh, learning about them because of some of the factors that they implement in their behavior patterns that seems to be something else. But if you actually look at it and actually understand what you're looking at, then it makes sense to what they're doing and what they're trying to get accomplished. Um, continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Those with narcissistic personality disorder present with high energy, discuss plans for future success, and speak with embellished terms and movements. Right. You see the embellished terms and movements. So everything is embellished. Everything is grandized. So go ahead, Brother Costa. Narcissists may believe others are failures if they fail to meet expectations of jobs, money, cars, or houses. All right. So it's very um it's very materialistic. Go ahead, Brother Costa. On the outside, narcissists will seem confident, self-assured, and mentally healthy. Right. So on the outside, this is how it seems. They give up this persona that they're confident, they're self-assured, they're mentally healthy. 
So, of course, we're talking about things on a spiritual level. So they can believe you're a failure if you don't add up also to their belief of spirituality or their belief of how a person should go about things or how you should operate. These are things, too, that actually impact how a narcissist looks at you or pretty much judges you based off of where you are in your life, what's your stature, what do you have, and so on and so on. Um, can you continue, Brother Costa, please? Sure. Researchers and clinicians note significant differences in people with this disorder, which means not every type of narcissist will act, think, or feel the same way. Right. So what's being said is that they're going to be different based off of who they are. Although a narcissist, at the end of the day, they have their specific goals, whether it be controlling, whether it be um, getting what they want, though what they may want may be different depending on the person. Although it does have the same end goal which is them getting what they want or them getting control or them having dominance or whatever the case is, those things may be the same, but what the actual thing is that they want may be different depending on the person. So you can see, and some of them will act differently when it comes to not getting what they want or whatever the case is. Some may cry and wail out. Some may cut you off. Like there's different things that they do once, depending on the person, if that makes so everybody can understand. Um, continue by the Casa, please. Covert narcissists, sometimes called vulnerable narcissists, are emotionally fragile and sensitive to even limited amounts of perceived criticism. Right. So they're very fragile. So you may say something very easy like, hey, um, I don't like when you um, fold my clothes that way. Can you fold it like this? That may trigger a whole episode because they're very fragile and they're sensitive to criticism. So although it may be very simple and very innocent, it doesn't get perceived that way because they're very critical of themselves. All right. Go ahead, Brother Casa. They appear highly stressed and worried, shy, reserved, and self-deprecating. Right. So you see these traits as far as a covert narcissist. And you can see how you can get lured in with a covert narcissist not really understanding what's going on with that person because they seem very highly stressed and worried like they they have a lot of anxiety for a person that has a lot of anxiety you don't necessarily think that they feel superior they act shy and reserved and self-deprecating like they're they come off as a humble person so you can see how you can get sucked in at the beginning until they actually start coming out of that shell and actually showing you who they truly are. A covert narcissist, it takes time for them to actually come out and be the true person, the true self that they are. Whereas a, a overt narcissist, it just comes out who they are a lot of times. Like they're not really trying to put on a show or trying to uh, manipulate. They're just who they are. And... And we're, we're going to get into it. Continue reading, please, Brother Casafo. Sure. They will often compare and judge themselves against what others have in terms of happiness, possessions, and relationships. Right. So for us, we get to see the covetousness. As we continue, you're going to see that the traits are against quote unquote, the scriptures of how we're supposed to be as a people. So you see that they'll compare themselves, right? Which is one of the things that we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to be comparing ourselves one to another, right? 
against what others have in terms of happiness, possessions, or relationships. So instead of focusing on their blessing or whatever it is that they have or that they're giving, they're looking outwardly to other people and seeing what other people have or what or this or that, which innately causes them to go into the depression, causes them to be worried and stressed. It causes them to be self-deprecating because they're not actually content with what Allah has given to them. Yet they're still trying to fulfill their own needs and their own wants. And innately what happens is, is they become void. Is that they never feel satisfied because they're going to continue to want and want because that's what the spirit of coveting does. It continues to want and it's never filled. So we're going to continue to learn and we're going to keep on diving into this thing so that we can actually really understand. Now we're about to go into learning the difference of a covert narcissist and an overt narcissist and how they truly differ. Um, Brother Costa, if you don't mind reading this overview real quickly, please. Okay. Overt versus covert narcissism. Whereas covert narcissists do well to hide their problematic behaviors, thoughts, and feelings, Overt narcissists boldly display typical narcissistic qualities. They will appear ambitious, demeaning, and demanding by presenting themselves as special, important, and entitled, regardless of another person's needs and wants. The arrogance and self-importance of an overt or grandois narcissist will be evident moments after starting a conversation with them. The covert narcissist will experience similar thoughts and feelings, but these will be less obvious in their expression of uniqueness. Because of this, it may take friends and co-workers longer to notice the traits. Right. So you see, you're starting to see the difference between an overt and a covert narcissist. The overt narcissist is the one that usually their pride is very outward. They may be loud. They may speak a lot. They need the attention. They need that energy around them. So you will see them. They have this sense of specialness or importance about themselves, regardless of another person's needs and wants. So they're very self-centered or self-pleasing. And both of them, the over and the covert narcissist, are actually both very self-pleasing. It's just the way that they go about it which makes it very different. And that's why it's very hard sometimes to actually categorize or to understand what a person is actually dealing with when it comes to narcissism. Because yes, it's easy to identify the overt narcissist because of their grandeur's personality, but the covert narcissist is very different. So it makes it hard to be like, okay, that's what's going on that person is a narcissist it's very hard to identify unless you truly know what and how a covert narcissist actually operates okay let's get into covert narcissist and we're going to go into a lot of broad terms and things that pertain to both a covert and overt narcissist so that we can get a full understanding before we actually dive into one directly. Um, let's get some of the covert narcissist traits and then we're going to start breaking down and understanding some of the actual technical terms to get an understanding of what they're actually seeking after. Uh, can you go ahead and read Brother Kassifo if you don't mind, please? Yes. While several covert narcissism traits overlap with overt narcissism, how they present outwardly will look very different. Unlike overt narcissist characteristics, covert narcissists will appear more emotionally available and vulnerable. However, the underlying purpose of their behaviors is to fill their narcissistic supply maintain control within their relationships and get their own needs met. Right. So we see the end goal 
of the covert narcissist and we also see the end goal of the overt narcissist they're both the same that's the end goal but how they get to the end goal differs and that's where we run into the difference between a covert and an overt narcissist let's touch on narcissistic supply so that we can actually understand what that technical term means so that if it comes up again we can understand what it's actually talking about all right. Narcissistic supply is a form of psychological addiction where the narcissist requires and even demands limitless special treatment, admiration, importance, or validation to feed their sense of entitlement and self-centeredness. Narcissistic supply is how individuals with narcissistic personality disorder cope with the world and make it a place for them to thrive right so a lot of times this is done by them trying to recreate their childhood environment because this is what actually shaped the narcissist is their childhood environment so when they get older and they're in a relationship or they're around the people that they're used to being around or they're around the people they're around a lot they would try to recreate an environment where they were actually nourished and they were actually getting a lot of supply where it actually cultivated who they were. So you'll run into scenarios where you'll be like, okay, where are you going? You're, you're telling me that you don't like this. You don't like that. You don't like the way I'm doing this. You don't not like when I do that. And being a person that is trying to be at peace, more than likely you're going to start making those changes so that that person is comfortable, not understanding that they're going to continue to keep making changes while they're not going to be changing. You may say, hey, this is something that I don't like, whatever the case is. They may even change it for a time, but they're going to continue to do it again. And they're going to continue to go back into the patterns of how they were because it's not about you. It's about them recreating that childhood environment where people were around them being their enablers. Where they can just continue to be the person that they are and are doing what they're comfortable doing, which is getting their way and not being opposed. So you see, they have to pretty much tear you down to lift themselves up to get that environment back. Continue reading, Brother Cossifel. Attention-seeking behavior, positive or negative, is essentially narcissistic supply. Wanting attention, accolades, and validation are not inherently narcissistic, so we want to decipher that. We all need to feel heard and accepted, but narcissists crave this attention constantly. They will deliberately find or create situations in which they are regularly at the center of attention, often to stave off their underlying narcissistic depression. Right. So everything is to create a mask of what actually they want. So essentially, it's manipulation. Uh, narcissists are hugely advocates of manipulation. So you can see the attention-seeking behavior, whether um, for overt narcissists, the attention-seeking behavior is usually positive. It's usually a lot of things like they're giving you things, they're giving you gifts, they're taking you out to a nice restaurant, there's perks of the relationship. Um, everybody loves them, uh, and we're going to go into these different things. They get the attention by doing things positive, whereas the covert narcissist, usually it's the one that's more negative because they're suffering from that depression more than the overt narcissist. So that depression really creates things to be very negative, where they continue to do negative things or to say negative things about themselves so that you will not say anything to criticize them. Instead, you will try to help them and uplift them 
but they will stay in the negative because that's how they're getting their attention. That's how they're getting their narcissistic supply. So you can see how both of them differ, yet they're both after the same thing. All right, so you see how they become more emotionally and vulnerable. They come in that guys to actually gain you. We're gonna we're gonna go further into it because we're we're just we're just starting. So we're gonna really, really break these things down. Can you continue reading the brother Kasafu if you don't mind, please? Sure. Vulnerable narcissists tend to be most at risk of developing depression. Mm -hmm. They're often introverted, sensitive, and prone to experiencing anxiety and shame. They may also struggle to maintain close friendships as they focus heavily on themselves, require attention, and are hypersensitive to perceived criticism. Their lack of insight into these patterns may lead them to feel disappointed, underappreciated, ashamed, angry, and lacking in external validation. Right. So you can see the the hypersensitivity to criticism and the lacking into these patterns. You see, it's the patterns that they're actually doing over and over, which with any narcissist, you're going to learn if you ever had any uh, relationship or have any person that suffered from these spirits in your life, you will notice a pattern because they all have a pattern. So this pattern for the covert narcissist or the vulnerable narcissist is the feeling of disappointment, the feeling of underappreciation. They're going to continue to tell you, I don't feel appreciated. You should figure out how I feel appreciated. No matter if you're doing a million things to make them feel appreciated, you're making changes, you're giving words of affirmation, it doesn't matter. They're going to feel underappreciated because that's how they're wired. That's how their mind is set up. They're not going to see the good things that you're doing. They're going to see the negative things that you're doing. And that's why you find that the vulnerable or the covert narcissist is more prone to depression because their viewpoint is according to negativity. Whereas the overt narcissist, their viewpoint is more geared to positivity. So you can actually start to differentiate those two. Now, if a covert narcissist say you corrected them about something or you've seen something that they were doing that you didn't like and you came to them and you spoke to them, that's where the shame, the, the shame comes in. And that's when the anger comes in. And we're going to go into these things. So um, let's go ahead and touch on the signs of depression. And then we're going to continue on from there so that everybody can get a full understanding. Signs of narcissistic depression. Someone may be experiencing narcissistic depression if, in addition to having depression symptoms, they are hostile towards others or towards themselves. So this is how we can identify this depression that we're actually dealing with when it comes to a narcissist or when it comes to someone that is actually struggling with these things so that they can actually understand for themselves to be able to stand against it, to actually know what's going on with themselves, because that's part of it. When a narcissist doesn't understand that they are a narcissist or that they're experiencing these patterns and they're not able to identify it, then that makes it hard for them to be able to come out of it or to stand against it. So for us, we're bringing the awareness and then bringing the understanding to help the narcissist so that they can overcome their struggle. And it's actually prophesied that this is actually going to happen once we get further into the lesson. So um, person, we're more specifically talking about a covert narcissist that would be hostile toward others and also toward themselves. So in some cases, they may afflict um, physical harm on other people, or they may afflict physical harm on themselves, right? So these are different signs to let us know that, hey, 
there may be depression in the midst of this, right? Continue, Brother Casa, please. Destructive interpersonally. That means that they'll tear themselves down. They'll speak things about themselves that are bad. They're literally just starting tearing themselves down. Go ahead, Brother Casa. And feel a temporary alleviation of symptoms with increased social contact. Right. So they may be around people, though they're suffering from these depressive states. When they get around people, they may have a temporary relief where they'll be fine. They'll be able to socialize and they'll be able to, you know, seem like like they're up, like they're on the up. But as soon as that's over, they go right back into the depression. Go ahead, Brother Casa. Whereas someone with non-narcissistic depression may experience suicidality resulting from general hopelessness or low self-worth, those with narcissistic depression tend to experience suicidality in response to external factors such as perceived criticism or abandonment. Right. So we get to see the difference between a person just struggling with depression in general and a narcissist actually dealing with depression. And they're very different in context. A person who just deals with depression, they're going to generally always feel hopeless. And they're going to always feel like they have a low self-worth. It's not going to change. It's going to be across the board because that's how they feel about themselves. That's how they feel about life. That's depression. Narcissistic depression tends to only be experienced when something goes wrong or when they're getting criticized about something or they're having a feeling of abandonment from a person then they go into depression. So you can actually differentiate normal depression and narcissistic depression. Continue, Brother Casa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Narcissists tend to never be satisfied, no matter how much validation they receive. Narcissists seek individuals who are easily lured by their charm, and naive to manipulation and exploitation. Once the supply is received, the narcissist will soon become low and empty, usually needing more. Feeding narcissistic supply is like trying to fill a bottomless pit. And when they don't get it, they may react with narcissistic rage. All right. So now we're going into where the narcissistic rage actually comes from. So we see that covetousness because the spirit of covet actually enters into them. And that's why they tend to never be satisfied. Even when you give them what they're asking for, it's not over. It just goes to the next thing because they're not satisfied with anything. It's just a flex of power and control and dominion over whoever it is that they're seeking to have it over. So they would ask for things, sometimes things that they really don't care about. They're just seeing if they can get over on you for you to do it. So you see how no matter how much validation they receive, even because they, they love the validation, they love for you to tell them how much they're worth or whatever the case is, because that's what they're lacking within themselves. So the more you give it to them, it's, it's like you're filling a bottomless pit because it really, it's a nice gesture and it's nice things. And you're really trying to be kind. You're really trying to, to bring them out of wherever it is that they are, but essentially is to no avail because they have to find that within themselves. They have to find that worth within themselves. You can't create their worth. And that's where they lack. They have this mind about themselves and they create this false illusion of themselves. But 
inwardly, they know that it's a lie. So they're living a lie. And that's where we're going to get into eventually at the end of this lesson to actually deal with these things so that narcissists or anyone struggling with anything like this can actually come out of it. So you see who they target. They target people that are easily lured by their charm. They target people that are naive to manipulation. Someone who's not going to be able to understand what they're doing. And someone that is naive to exploitation. That means that they're taking advantage of you. Okay. Let's go into narcissistic rage so we can understand because now we get to see when the narcissist isn't getting what they want, whether it be the admiration that they desire, whether it be them getting criticized or you calling out some of their behavior, whether it be any of those things in that nature, they usually respond in what they call a narcissistic rage. Um, Brother Costa, if you don't mind reading so we can understand this. Sure. Narcissistic rage is a sudden and powerful outburst of anger, aggression, and violence from an individual with narcissistic personality disorder. The behavior may occur when the negative feedback that a narcissist receives causes discomfort and their defense mechanisms are activated. Once given a dose of their own medicine, narcissists become emotionally psychologically, physically, or verbally abusive. Upon recognizing that direct exposure threatens their idealized false identity, narcissists will blow up to deflect from the underlying issue. All right. So right here in the midst of one of the attributes of the narcissistic rage is them blowing up so that you will forget the underlying issue is that they don't actually have to deal with it. So it's a mechanism to blow up so that you will say, okay, don't worry about it. Or you'll get sidetracked and go into whatever it is that they're blowing up about and what they're saying to leave off from the initial issue that you brought forward. Go ahead, um, Brother Kasim. The rage associated with a narcissistic injury ranges from mild irritation to outright physical attacks. Some narcissists will gaslight, deflect, project, verbally assault, or experience a narcissistic collapse. All right. And we're going to go into all these things. We're going to go into gaslighting, um, deflect, I should have deflect in here. Deflect means to cause something to change direction by interposing something. Turn aside from a straight course. So you're literally deflecting means like, just like I stated just a moment ago, how you will bring forth an issue and they'll go into a narcissistic rage, get upset about it. Start talking about all these different things that they don't like or that they're upset about or that they don't like that you're doing to deflect from the initial issue that you actually brought to them. So that's the deflecting, right? Gaslighting, to gaslight someone means to manipulate another person into doubting their own perceptions, experiences, and understanding of events. So gaslighting, they'll say, hey, you... um." You'll, you'll come forward and you'll say, hey, uh, remember when this happened? Or they will bring up something that happened a time ago, but the story will be different than what actually happened. And then when you say, hey, I don't remember it that way, they'll probably say something like, well, um, that's just your memory. That's the way that you remember it. I remember it differently. You know, so you can see the gaslighting where nothing is definite. Everything is up for question. So what happens is there's never a definitive line. 
there's never a definitive line of right and wrong because everything goes into how I perceive it and how you perceive it, how I experienced it and how you experienced it. It's not about the truth of what actually occurred. And a lot of the gaslighting has to do with lying. So they'll lie to cover up what may make them look bad. So you see, it's all about their image. It's all about the image of a narcissist. And we're going to further go into these things because that's what they're trying to hold fast in their ideological image of themselves, not actually who they are. We're going to go into project. We have another portion where we're going to actually go into projecting so that we can actually understand what that is. Okay. Let's go into the possible causes of narcissistic rage so that we can understand it if we ever have encountered or do encounter it, or if you're actually a victim to narcissistic rage yourself, or if you're actually struggling dealing with narcissistic rage, your own self being a narcissist. Um, Brother Katafo, um, can you go ahead and go if you don't mind, please? Sure. One possible cause, their self-esteem or image has been harmed. A narcissistic injury occurs when a narcissist thinks their self-esteem or self-worth is threatened. Because narcissists have very low self-esteem, they become incredibly defensive and frustrated when their shortcomings are pointed out. Thus, the distress associated with their false self being exposed can result in narcissistic rage. All right. So we have one, their self-esteem or their image has been harmed. And that's usually an image that they've created of who they want to be, not actually who they are. So that's why a lot of times you can see the person is struggling because these are spirits at work. So for you being on the outside, it's easy to say, hey, the person that you want to be is different than the person who you actually are. And you're going to say things like, hey, I noticed that you're doing this. But to the narcissist, they're not doing that. They're going according to the image of who they want to be not who they actually are. So it creates a lot of confusion for both parties. And that's why relationships, when a person is with a narcissist, it gets very blurry and very confusing because of these factors. So you have to be very strong-minded and focused and praying and calling upon Allah and truly serving him keeping the commandments and bearing the fruits of the spirit to have a guideline, not to be able to be taken away from what you actually believe, because that's part of it. They're trying to suck you into their world instead of actually having to conform to what's right. Uh, continue, Brother Casa, please. Another possible cause of narcissistic rage they do not get their way. Narcissists truly believe that the world revolves around them and that their needs are superior and more important than anyone else's. When they do not get their way, narcissists feel a loss of control, resulting in bouts of rage as a way to regain the upper hand. All right. So to go into rage... And to be able to get you to react shows them that they still have power over you. And that's what they're seeking. They're seeking to have control or power over you. So if they go into a, a, a frenzy and you're trying to figure out what you can do to help them and bring them down and you're getting upset maybe yourself, it's not making anything better. It's only showing the narcissist that they still have control and dominion over you. 
And though they may not be getting what they want, they're still getting what they want because you're showing them that they have control and power over you. And for them, that's how they view it. They view it. If I can get a reaction out of you, I control you. So you have to be very, very temperate when dealing with a narcissist. You have to be very self-controlled. You have to be able to control your emotions, not giving over to anger, not giving over to frustration, not being vexed, as we learned in the anger lesson. And if you need to, go back over the spirit of anger lesson, the spirit of pride lesson. Both of those lessons are going to be essential for those specific areas when dealing with anyone of the sort of a narcissist, because you have to understand those spirits and everything that comes with those spirits to be able to understand and, and put together the narcissist. Okay. Uh, continue, Brother Casafo, please. Another way is they are criticized. When a narcissist is criticized, their inflated sense of self is damaged. Any perceived negative feedback, even if offered in gentle or productive ways, can easily result in outbursts of narcissistic rage. A narcissist cannot tolerate threats to their massive egos and grandoise self-image. Right. When we're dealing with two different narcissists, when we're dealing with the overt narcissist and the covert narcissist, you have one that is grandoised on the outside and on the inside. And then you have one that is lowly on the outside and grandoised on the inside. So they both have this major ego of self though on the outside to display it very differently. You'll see the covert narcissist will be more shy, maybe introverted. Um, they'll have struggles with depression, um, struggles with self-worth, um, self-doubting. But at the same time, they have a lot of pride and they'll be very stubborn. Whereas the grandoise the overt narcissist is all those things on the outside and on the inside so when they're criticized it's hard for them to receive it and a lot of times they're going to go into a narcissistic rage and get upset and angry and lash out about it because they don't want to be criticized they don't want to be wrong and unfortunately it makes it hard to grow because you have to be wrong to grow, especially in this walk. We have to look at the law and examine ourselves and examine our lives by the law and correct ourselves by the law. For a narcissist, it's very hard to humble or submit themselves to the law because they're walking according to their own law. And as we know, there's no such thing as your own law. Either you're walking according to the law of Elohim or you're walking according to the law of the devil. And as we continue to go further, we're going to actually understand what spirits is actually leading them so that we can understand what is actually going on spiritually. Uh, continue, Brother Kasifo, please. Okay. I just found out the, the word is grandiose. I apologize. Grandiose. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, Don't worry. I say grandiose too. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Okay, another possibility for narcissistic rage. They are no longer the center of attention. To remain powerful and in control, a narcissist needs to have a constant source of admiration and validation to fuel their narcissistic supply and ego. When the attention of others is directed elsewhere, they may use anger, verbal aggression, or shouting to shift the situation back to them. Right. So these are just different examples of what they may do. Now, remember at the beginning of the lesson, all of them are different. So they all have different tactics, though the end goal is the same. Continue, Brother Kasifo, please. Another possibility is they're exposed for their behaviors. Being exposed for one's actions brings vulnerability. For narcissists, 
This emotion is an uncomfortable or unbearable experience. For example, if their delusions of grandeur are put on display or inadequacies are highlighted, they might react with anger to avoid shame or accountability. Continue, Brother Kasa, please. Another possibility is they are asked to be accountable for their actions. Upholding and maintaining their image is what makes a narcissist thrive. Being held accountable for hurting or abusing someone directly targets their ego and induces shame. Reacting with anger, deflection, and fury allows the narcissist to pivot the direction of a situation away from owning up to their mistakes and behavior. Right. So you may come to a narcissist and you may say, hey, what you did hurt my feelings. Now, a lot of times they may deflect. A lot of times they may change the subject or sometimes they may even say, hey, you know, they may give you like a, a not an apology. I'm sorry you felt that way. You know, you may get some some type of response in that way. Um, or they may just justify their actions altogether and say, this is what happened to me. So this is why I did what I did. So you have to, you, you see how they're not taking true accountability. And that's where it, it allows them to stay where they are and allows that spirit to continue to have the stronghold over them by them not being able to confess their fault and not being able to take accountability to actually change it. Now, all of these are different examples of what can trigger narcissistic rage. Um, continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Another possibility is they face a setback, disappointment, or conflict. A narcissist can become easily enraged if a setback occurs in their life, job, or relationship. Not getting their way results in both a loss of control and a bruised ego. In these situations, they may lash out with rage to either deflect from the conflict or regain a sense of authority. All right. So you can see how they get enraged because of a setback. So they may be in a relationship with you and they may feel like they have control over you. But once they start feeling that they're losing that control over you, they'll go into a rage. Or if they feel like something's not going well at their job, that may be making them dwindle according to how people were treating them, how people were viewing them, then they were going to a rage a lot of times. So you can see how that deflecting is a major thing for narcissists to not actually take accountability or not actually have to admit anything and actually put forth the effort to change. Um, continue, Brother Costa, please. Another possibility is they feel a loss of control. If the narcissist feels like they are losing control of the situation, a rage fit allows them to regain power over those around them. Even if they are receiving unfavorable reactions from their targets, the narcissist revels in the attention and superiority they have restored. All right. So they relish when they get that control back. So just like I was stating earlier, you may be in a relationship with one and you may be viewing the things that they're doing and you may start distancing yourself or separating yourself. And when they feel that, they may go into a rage. Now, how that rage is depends on the person. Some may pull up at your job. Some may pull up at your house. Some may blow your phone up. You just don't know, depending on the person, how they're going to act or operate to regain that control. Because if they can reach out to you and they can see, hey, I still can get a reaction out of that person or whatever the case is. They feel like that superiority has been restored for them. Okay. Now this rage actually has a cycle. 
just like everything else with a narcissist. It's a cycle that continues over and over and over. Um, can we learn about the narcissistic rage cycle, please, for the customer? Sure. Narcissistic rage cycle. Anger in healthy individuals is proportionate to the situation at hand. However, with narcissistic rage, a narcissist's reaction is illogical and extreme. When triggered, they may become stressed and anxious before the intense blow up. The cycle continues, leading to emotional dysfunction and dysregulation. Below are the stages of a narcissistic rage cycle. Stress. A narcissist may subconsciously ignore anger for a moment when met with a stressful trigger. Anxiety. After becoming stressed, the anger begins to seep through in small ways, such as outward displays of anxiety. Agitation and frustration. Eventually, and often very fast, the narcissist shows the first signs of anger through words or facial expressions. Rage. Finally, a narcissistic rage fit occurs with visible acts of aggression and loss of temper. Right. So the narcissistic rage cycle, for us, it would seem like a downward spiral. You'll see that they're stressed, whatever have caused them to be stressed maybe it may have happened 15 minutes 30 minutes an hour ago but they're stressed and they can't leave it alone then they become anxious the anxiety comes in so you'll see like they just they can't get themselves together they can't they can't gather themselves then you'll see the agitation and the frustration and this usually just like i said eventually and often very fast the agitation and frustration comes. So the agitation and frustration, a lot of times you don't know how that is going to be displayed depending on the person. But usually it's, um, that's when like they start saying things that are maybe mean or they start making facial expressions or their body language is very, very um, attitude-ish towards you. And it's like, they don't want to hear anything you got to say. So you can see the agitation and frustration and finally going into the rage, depending on the person. Um, the rage can be just like we learned in the anger lesson. The rage can be um, uh, calamus crying where they're just crying hysterically. Or they can go into um, malice. They can go into um, tearing you down with words, uh, verbal abuse. Um, physical abuse um, they can just be angry and speak however they want and say whatever they want so it just really depends on the person how that narcissistic rage actually plays out so you have to be very very careful when dealing with narcissists and, and dealing with narcissistic rage because usually that's when someone usually either gets verbally mentally or physically abused and emotionally and emotionally Thank you, Brother Kasafo. All right. Now, we did for a moment that we touched on the collapse. Now, since we're actually going into the narcissistic rage, let's actually talk about that collapse or that downward spiral and see how that actually looks all together. Because like we said before, these things are patterns. So if you're able to identify it and you know what you're looking for, you can actually identify it every time because it doesn't change. Um, let's touch on the collapse. There's 11 signs of a narcissistic collapse. Uh, go ahead, Brother Kathafu, please. Sign one, impulsive behaviors. Impulsivity is a trademark characteristic of narcissism. When a narcissist overinflated confidence is injured, they may ignore advice and make impulsive decisions to show they are always right. Impulsive behaviors such as fornication, gambling, or excessive spending, for example, help them counteract challenges to their ego. All right, so those are just examples 
of what one may do when it comes to impulsive behaviors because what's happening is when they're going into a collapse unfortunately they're trying to hurt you so what they're doing everything that they're doing is going to make you feel bad or for you to feel the way that they feel essentially though you may have not done what they're doing to you or you may not even be the reason for them to feel the way that they feel because you may have only just asked them a question but they're going to start projecting how they feel onto you and that's where the projection actually comes in they're going to project how they feel about themselves and project that you feel the way that they feel about themselves. So you can see why when they're on the collapse, they start going into impulsive behaviors because they're like, I want you to feel the way that I feel. And that's the whole narrative of what they're doing. So they may go and commit fornication against you. They may harm you. They may verbally assault you. They may emotionally assault you because they want you to feel the way that they feel about themselves. All right. Go ahead, Brother Cosifo, please. Number two, depression. Depression and narcissism often go hand in hand. Narcissists frequently have trouble regulating their emotions which can cause depressive episodes when they cannot cope with a challenge to their self-worth. The narcissist's access to supply dwindles during a narcissistic collapse, contributing to these low moods. All right, so you can see how things go hand in hand with the depression, because when something goes on or something goes wrong or whatever the case is, then that supply, like they're, constant admiration or you whatever the case is that you're giving them that they're constantly needing dwindles or it goes away because you actually have to deal with the issue now and in those cases they still require that supply although you may be upset with them although there may be something going on that they may have done wrong or whatever the case is they may have done something to you but yet they're still looking for their supply, even in the midst of it. So usually a lot of times they will come and they'll say, well, there's things that you can do better. You should be saying things that are more encouraging to me. But at the same time, they want you to give them the supply, although they may have done something that may have hurt you or may have impacted you. But you see that self, that self-centeredness that actually comes with them, that actually, it doesn't matter if I hurt you, you're supposed to still do for me. And that's what this is explaining right here. Uh, continue, Brother Costa, please. Number three, gaslighting. Narcissistic gaslighting is a narcissistic manipulation tactic used to distort a person's reality or memory. A narcissist may gaslight others when they feel threatened to divert attention from their shortcomings. When a narcissist collapse occurs, they use this tactic to hurt the person questioning them. So you see what is actually the motive for gaslighting. When they're going on a collapse, it's to hurt you. Anything that they say or anything that they bring up from past experiences or whatever the case is, is to lift themselves up, even if they're lying about the past experience. Because the whole thing is to hurt you or to show that you're not as good as you think you are. Or you're not the person that you think that you are. I'm going to show you that you make mistakes too, so that you can't hold me accountable for my mistake or for something that I've done. So you can see how the gaslighting gets implemented. 
You ready, Brother Casa? Yes, I am. Okay. Number four, mental breakdowns. A narcissist may have a breakdown if their supply is cut off or separated from them and they feel vulnerable, embarrassed, or out of control. Narcissistic breakdown symptoms can include rage, impulsive behaviors, or other ways of showcasing intense mental suffering. A narcissist will lash out at you in any way they can or hurt themselves to cope with the same. Usually more like a downward spiral. Right. So they will lash out at you to hurt you or they will hurt themselves to cope with the shame. So essentially when they hurt themselves, it's to gain back that attention. It's to gain back that control. Because now you need to come and tend to me. You see how things are being used. Although they're going through a mental breakdown. But they're still trying to get what they want. Even in the midst of going through a mental breakdown. So you can see how strong these spirits are on a person. To literally be going through a mental breakdown. Inflicting pain upon themselves. Inflicting pain upon you. However they can. And then still wanting your admiration, still wanting your attention. So we're not dealing with anything light here. All right. So let's get to it so that we can actually understand and actually heal these things. Continue, Brother Kasafo, please. Number five, anger, outbursts, and rage. Rage outbursts are commonly seen during a narcissistic collapse episode. In the narcissist's mind, it is easier to be angry than deal with the uncomfortable emotions of embarrassment, rejection, or shame. Rage is especially typical with the vindictive narcissist. Right. And both covert and over narcissists can be vindictive. So it's speaking about both of them. Uh, continue to go, Brother Kasafo, please. Number six, smearing someone's reputation. A narcissist smear campaign may happen after a narcissist ends a relationship or feels shamed in one because of their actions, especially if they lose control of or access to supply. Smear campaigns are intended to harm a person's social, familial, or professional reputation. The narcissist would do so by saying the victim is crazy or unstable or has a problem. A smear campaign ensures the narcissist maintains control of the narrative and that their image is sustained. Right. So they have to flip everything so that they can stay uh, in control and they can continue their um, idolized figmented reality of themselves because usually when a person when they lose control of the supply or the person that they're with and they feel that shame they have to hurry up and quickly cover that shame by making you the problem so that they're not in shame to other people so a lot of times they will try to use that manipulation to make it seem like you're crazy because you are leaving me and I haven't done anything to you. Though they know full well all the things that they've done to you. So you can see how their reputation, how they're viewed is far more important than love for you being the person being with them. So you have to really understand that because they will go to your family. If they have a relationship with your family, they will go to your family and they will make you out to be this terrible person to make it seem like you're struggling and they're worried about you. They will go to anybody that they can that has a, a part of your life to make sure that they understand their narrative and that they are in agreement with their narrative and not yours, and that you're the one who actually has the problem.
Continue, Brother Kasifu, please. Number seven, self-harm behaviors. A covert narcissist may engage in self-harming behaviors when they feel slighted. By doing so, the narcissist can maintain control and regain attention or sympathy during a narcissistic collapse. Right. Continue, Brother Kasifu, please. Number eight, making accusations. During a narcissistic collapse, a narcissist may make untrue accusations towards another person to deflect from their behaviors. Such allegations distract from a narcissist's mistakes or faults if they are called out. In this way, they avoid feeling ashamed or embarrassed if they can place blame on their victim and negate taking accountability for their actions. So you can see that's very straightforward, and that's that's a big thing for many narcissists is making the accusations and saying that you feel this way or you or you meant this by what you did. Like they're creating their own narrative so that they're justified in everything that they do instead of actually taking accountability for the things that they're doing. Yeah. Continue, Brother Castle. Number nine, intense anxiety. Narcissists may experience anxiety during a narcissistic collapse, possibly as irritability, increased distressing thoughts, or engaging in rituals. Anxiety may develop if they fear certain behaviors will be exposed or they are ignored, lose control, or receive too little attention. Right. Now, this one is interesting because the anxiety, which we know anxiety comes from anger, we can see the anxiety that they experience. And that shows off in irritability, increased distressing thoughts. So that means that their thoughts get very outlandish. They go in and start listening to the angel of iniquity, the angel of wickedness, and they create thoughts. That's how it would seem to you. That's how it would seem to us, that it's thoughts coming out of nowhere, things that haven't even happened. But it's the angel of iniquity and the anger and anxiety that's actually causing them. They're actually listening to the idol that's actually giving them these thoughts and they're internalizing those thoughts as true and accurate, which then if that continues and it worsens, they actually start engaging. They will engage in witchcraft because the witchcraft gives them back the control. So they feel. Because if I feel like I'm losing control, how far am I willing to go to regain it? So you can see how a lot of people who struggle with narcissism end up finding themselves in, in witchcraft. Because they're willing to do anything to have that control, to have that power over people. And then once we really understand what is leading the narcissist, we can understand why it makes sense. I'll continue, Brother Kasifu, please. Number 10, stonewalling. Stonewalling refers to a narcissist's refusal to communicate with others, allowing them to preserve control by making their challenger feel guilty confused or stressed the narcissist wants their victim to respond and engage with them so they can twist the situation in their favor and recover from a collapse right so you see how stonewalling is used to actually regain power over you now let's understand what stonewalling is before i actually dive into it and explain how it's used um stonewalling is to delay or block a request, a process, or a person 
by refusing to answer questions or by giving evasive replies. So you may ask them a question and they may not answer you. Or you may ask them a question and they gave you an answer that doesn't answer the question. That's stonewalling. So how they use that to actually get back on top, so to speak, is you will try to figure out what's going on with them. Though you may have corrected them. You may have said, gave them some type of um, correction or admonishment or whatever the case is, not understanding that that's what they're dealing with because it was minute to you. It was something that you like, hey, don't do this, do that. And it's something very easy going for you. But for them, it's not easy going. And you may forget that you even done that or even said that. And the next thing you know, they're going down. They're going on a downward spiral and you're trying to help them. You're like, hey, baby, tell me what's going on. Tell me what's happening. Why are you not feeling well? What is it? What's going on? And they don't answer your question or they give you an evasive reply. So you see how the stonewalling actually gets the attention back to them. Because now you may feel guilty. You may feel confused. You may feel stressed because you don't know why they feel the way they feel or what's happening with them. So now they regain that attention. They regain that supply. And they, they're able to recover from whatever it is that they were feeling because now you feel bad. Welcome to Manipulation 101, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We're learning today so that we can be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We have to understand what's against us and what's at play in the world. Continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Um, number 11, suddenly ending a relationship. A narcissist may end a relationship if it fails to meet their needs or feel guilty and end the relationship in attempts to end it before you if they feel they have done wrong, which is a form of manipulation. This action or the narcissistic discard is often considered the final stage of narcissistic collapse. If the narcissist realizes their supply is being cut off, they move on to their next victim, but remain involved in the person's life by spreading a smear campaign or hovering. Right. Now, we said that all narcissists are different, right? Because everybody has their own complexity, right? So if a narcissist ends the relationship, this is what they call the narcissistic discard and what they're doing is they're gaining control by being the one to call it off even though they may be in the wrong they're going to call off the relationship or try to beat you calling off the relationship so that they have the upper hand and say they may say hey i want to call off the relationship what do you want to do and then you say, hey, I'm in agreement with calling off the relationship. They're going to then flip it and say, why are you in agreement to calling off the relationship? We're supposed to, you see how the manipulation starts working, right? So a lot of narcissists, after they may have cut off the relationship, depending on the person, some will go and find a new supply. They will go and find a new person to deal with because they're trying to make you upset. They're trying to get a reaction out of you so that they can regain the power. And a lot of times that's when either the smear campaign or the hovering will take place. Either they'll be with that person 
the new supply or the new person and they'll hover you and say, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't want to leave. Uh, man, she's nothing like you or he's nothing like you. You know, like I want to be with you. That's the hovering. The smear campaign, of course, we went over the smear campaign already, so we should understand that. So you can see how everything is for power. Everything is for control. And you can see how dealing with these type of spirits, it makes it very hard to serve Alahayim. Because serving Alahayim is about not having control. It's about bestowing yourself and humbling yourself to something or someone greater than yourself. So we can see the struggle dynamic of a person who deals with narcissism and trying to conform to the law and trying to conform to Alahayim, which is very difficult. All right. Now, let's understand some of the behavioral patterns of a narcissist and some of the tactics that are used against people to then stay where they are. Because everything essentially with a narcissist is to stay where they are. They don't want to actually change. Because changing actually takes work and changing actually makes them have to be accountable for what they're doing. Instead, they're trying to relinquish all accountability so that they can continue living the way that they want to live or staying the same. These types of situations, a tactic such as DARVL may be used. This is the technical term, DARVL. Deny, attack, reverse, victim, offender. That's what DARVL stands for. Okay, Kazdi, do you reading? the explanation of Darvo, please. Sure. The perpetrator or offender may deny the behavior. All right. So that's the first thing. They're going to deny the behavior. So say you come to them and you say, you say, hey, um, I noticed that when you get angry, you speak to people any type of way. And I don't think it's right. Right? So say you come and say that to them. The first thing they're going to do, they're going to deny the behavior. I wasn't speaking wrong. I didn't say anything wrong to anyone. I was expressing myself. All right? What's the next thing, Brother Kasafo? Attack the individual doing the confronting. All right. So then they're going to turn it around and attack you. Like, why are you coming to me and telling me that I did something wrong when I was just expressing myself? Continue, Brother Coffin. And reverse the roles of victim and offender such that the perpetrator assumes the victim role and turns the true victim or the whistleblower into an alleged offender. All right. So now I'm going to reverse it. So, you know, you're wrong for coming to me and saying that I'm wrong for expressing myself. Like, I'm expressing myself because something was done wrong to me and I'm expressing it. And you're saying to me that I'm wrong because I'm hurt. I'm hurt from what happened to me. And I'm speaking in my hurt and I'm expressing myself. So you're wrong for not seeing my point of view and seeing how it affected me. So you see how they became the victim in the situation? They literally became the victim and you became the offender just by speaking up and saying something. That's Darvo. Okay, these are manipulation tactics and these things are used by more than just narcissists because these are the same spirits that are in a lot of people when it comes to being what they call a perpetrator. This specific tactic is used a lot when it comes to like uh, child molesters and people of that nature so you can see it's the same spirits that are actually operating in them that's actually operating in narcissists and they do the same thing to stay where they are the spirits do the same thing to stay where they are so that they're not called out and that they don't have to actually leave the vessel 
Uh, can you finish if you don't mind, Brother Kasava, please? Sure. This occurs, for instance, when an actually guilty perpetrator assumes the role of falsely accused and attacks the accuser's credibility and blames the accuser being the perpetrator of a false accusation. Right. All right. So definitely keep that in mind and stand on what you're saying. If somebody's doing something wrong, there's no justification for it. There's no justification when someone does something wrong or is doing something wrong to someone else. No matter what that person has done to them, there's no justification for someone to render evil for evil. And that's where the law actually keeps us in subjection to actually keep us from falling into such spirits, but not taking judgment into our own hands or to render evil for evil toward another person because someone has done something to us or we feel validated to then go and reciprocate that behavior or how we feel toward that person. Now, why do narcissists need a supply? Why? Let's truly understand this. Let's truly understand narcissism. And that's what we're here to do is to truly understand it its whole nature and not just bits and pieces. Um, Brother Kasafo, are you ready, please? Yes. Narcissists seek endless validation, attention, and praise to compensate for low self-esteem, confidence, and a perceived lack of acceptance. These struggles are often a result of early childhood trauma and attachment issues. Typically, the narcissist did not receive enough love as a child. They used people as objects to obtain what was lacking in their childhood, further feeding their supply. Caregivers may have ignored their emotional needs, never catering to the inner child. This happens a lot when a parent suffers from narcissism, usually the main caregiver. Their caregivers emotionally abandoned them usually because of their own needs, resulting in psychological damage that extends into adulthood. As a result, the narcissist uses people and things to provide for their emotional needs and narcissistic supply. The primary function of narcissistic supply is to foster ego, self-worth, confidence, and self-esteem. It also defines the boundaries in a relationship so the false self remains intact. The false self develops to protect a narcissist from a world viewed as hostile, unstable, unrewarding, unjust, and unpredictable. This defense mechanism helps the narcissist feel a sense of security for a short period of time, but when the facade crumbles, the narcissist collapses. All right. All right. So let's find out nine ways a narcissist gains their supply. And we're just compiling information so that we can have a full understanding of this. There are many tactics that narcissists use in order to get their narcissistic supply. They may pretend to be an expert on something, emotionally manipulate others, or violate boundaries. The nine ways narcissists get their supply. Number one, dominating and controlling others. Narcissists position themselves in personal or professional relationships to control through dominating, minimizing, and devaluing their target. These behaviors may even look like rescuing others to put the narcissist in a position as the good Samaritan or dependable savior. The narcissist thrives on the feeling of fully controlling and conquering others. Right. So that's pretty self-exclamatory. They put themselves in positions where they can receive their supply so they can get what they want. Continue, Brother Gossip, please. Number two, receiving constant attention, compliments, and praise. 
Narcissists rely on praise and admiration to gain a sense of emotional stability that they did not receive in the past. Accumulating these compliments not only satisfies this, but also fuels their grandiosity and ego. Additionally, admiration hides their narcissistic tendencies and shows the world that people love and accept them. All right. So they're looking for everything external because what they're lacking internally. Continue, Brother Kata, please. Number three, aggressive and abuse. Although aggression is not an abnormal reaction to injury or shame, narcissists use it to feed their narcissistic supply. If a person responds to a narcissist's anger, they fuel the fire and offer the narcissist the attention they desire. Arguments give the narcissist more motivation to keep going and continue the narcissistic abuse because it's eliciting a reaction to their behavior. Right. So as we remember in the pride lesson, only by pride cometh contention. It says arguments give the narcissist more motivation to keep going. All right. So you can see how the argument gives the narcissist more motivation to keep going because only through pride comes contention. So when you go into pride and you're arguing with them, it's only giving them more motivation because that's what they want in the first place. A lot of things are based on pride in their ego and their self-centeredness. So you're only adding fire to the flame of what they actually desire and what they love operating in in the first place. So you can't be reactive. Even when they're being aggressive and they're coming and they're trying to harm you or hurt you, whether emotionally or verbally, you can't be reactive. Not to get into a debate and or argument with them that's going to only foster more pride and more anger. Yeah. That's the hateful pride God was talking about. Mm -hmm. Taking the poison from one. It's less taking the poison from thee. He's sin doubling. You know, they get into a back and forth about it. All right. <clears throat> You can continue when you're ready, Brother Carson. Okay. Number four, being intentionally negative. Being intentionally negative. Okay. Some narcissists are often unreasonably, deliberately, and persistently demanding, uncooperative, or argumentative. There is a perceived power that comes from being disliked. This pattern of behavior confirms the narcissist's inner self-loathing that they do not deserve love, acceptance, or to be in a happy, healthy relationship. Yes, that's very straightforward. I'll continue, Brother Casa, please. Number five, exploiting others. Many narcissists do not relate to others. They use them. Narcissists utilize charm, power of persuasion, or manipulation to force people to give in to unreasonable, one-sided demands or surrender their boundaries. The narcissist views this as winning and another way to feed their ego. They bask in the reflected glory of those whom they abuse and exploit. So essentially your possession, right? You're there to cater to them, essentially. And that's usually how it feels when someone's in a relationship with a narcissist is that they're constantly catering and constantly sacrificing. And there's no sacrifices on the other side. It's, it feels like a one-sided relationship. I'll continue, Brother Kasafo, please. Number six, using addictive substances. Narcissists tend to have co-occurring mental health or substance use disorders. 
Misusing substances allows the narcissist to feel superior or above everyone else, further satisfying their narcissistic supply. The associated momentary thrills also aid them in avoiding any other underlying issues, such as traumas. All right. So just like any uh, substance, it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary <clears throat> moment of relief. So it makes them feel on top. So when they do their substance, they feel um, unconquerable. And that's another form of narcissistic supply. All of them are different. So some may use substances and some may not, but they will use it for that euphoria. Right. And not having to deal with anything. It's an escape. <clears throat> it's an escape from actually taking accountability of anything. So... Yeah. Ready when you are both possible. Yes. Number seven, feeling powerful. The feelings of power and entitlement that come from constant admiration feed the narcissist's ego. In their mind, the narcissist solidifies their superiority and deserving of high status. Furthermore, appearing reputable allows the narcissist to gain the trust of others building up the power to control and manipulate them for supply. Right. So you can see they use the status. So um, usually narcissists have to um, have someone vouch for them. You know, they have to have someone to say, yeah, this is who I am. That person knows me. That person knows who I am. They're, they're going to tell you who I am. And that sense gives them the power that anything that you say or anything that you see can't be accurate because these other people view me differently. Though they may have had a different relationship or only showed them some of who they truly were, it discredits you. So it, it makes them feel powerful. All right, so they use that to manipulate and to control. All right, uh, continue, Brother Costello, please. Number eight, intercourse. Intercourse with a narcissist is often one-sided because a narcissist may use it to fill their supply. Intimacy requires attention from both partners. But the narcissist may demand or expect praise or compliments while ignoring their partner's needs. Feeling intimately superior to a partner helps them obtain their desire to be the best. All right. So you can see everything is about power, even when it comes to uh, intimacy. Go ahead, Brother Costa. Number nine, feeding off of others' emotional energy. If someone is happy... A narcissist uses this person's happiness as an opportunity to tear them down. When someone is sad, the narcissist views this as an opening to manipulate or make them feel worse. Either way, a narcissist uses another person's emotional energy and emotions to redirect the attention back to themselves for their own gain. Right. So an example of this is, say you're at dinner. And you're there with friends and you and your spouse are there and your spouse is a narcissist, right? And everybody's having a great time. Everybody's laughing. They just enjoying themselves. And then the narcissist may say something or do something where it completely changes the energy that everyone is in being happy. That's feeding off of others' emotional energy because they have to have that control. Everything, everyone's having such a good time and they're having a good time without me. And I'm not the center of attention. So I'm going to do something where I am the center of attention. 
and I'm going to control everyone's energy because that's what I desire. So if I can get everyone not to be happy, then I'm the one in control. So you see how this actually works. All right, we're getting through. All right, so let's learn some of the, the common covert narcissist traits. Um, go ahead, Brother Kosovo, please. All right. Common covert narcissist traits. Self-servant empathy. A covert narcissist may outwardly show what looks like empathy, but their underlying purpose is to get you to engage with them so they serve their own needs in some way. Right. So now we're about to actually start actually digging into a covert narcissist so that we can actually understand them fully and entirely and and very in depth. Okay. And then we're going to end up going into an overt narcissist so that we can actually understand them in depth as well. So the covert narcissist has a self-servant empathy. Right. And that empathy is usually underlined by their own desire. So let's continue, Brother Kasifo, please. Inflated sense of self-importance. A covert narcissist may use more subliminal ways of exerting superiority over others with subtle indications. For example, they may roll their eyes during conversation rather than directly confront someone. All right. So you'll you'll see the inflated sense of self-importance. They may feel like they're too good to have a conversation. Or they may feel like the conversation is not worth their time. So those are the inflated senses of self-importance. Or you may be talking and they'll roll their eyes or they'll do something with their body language to show that they really don't care about what you're saying. You know. Go ahead, Brother Cuss. Excessive need for admiration. A covert narcissist may use a woe is me approach to getting attention by encouraging someone to pity or reassure them. Right. And that happens a lot when a covert narcissist is usually the woe is me because they constantly need that pity and admiration from you. All right. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Appearing shy or withdrawn. Presenting outwardly as an introvert allows a covert narcissist to hide and protect their insecurities. However, once they begin talking about themselves, there will still be an underlying sense of superiority and condescension. Right. So they may present themselves outwardly as introvert. But as time progresses, you get to see that they're not very introvert. That is all a hoax because they get very bold about how they feel and about what they want. And you get to actually see through their speech and by the way they operate, you get to see that they feel like they're superior and they're kind of sent other people to lift themselves up. All right. So covert narcissists and relationships. Let's go ahead and get into this, Brother Kasifo. All right. While covert narcissists can be difficult to spot initially, their traits will eventually become apparent in every relationship. They will always have an excessive need for reassurance, use manipulation for control, and seek to establish control over another person. All right. All right. Let's look at the signs of a covert narcissist. And let's actually get into these so we can understand. Um, can you start, Brother Cosmo, right at covert narcissist, please? Yes. Covert narcissists will not present in ways stereotypical of standard narcissists. So you have to look deeper to know what and who you are dealing with. 
Some narcissists make it clear from the first contact that they have narcissistic traits, meaning they're easier to spot. Being aware of the signs of covert narcissism can help you know how to respond accordingly. All right, so let's look at the first one. Number one, they're insecure. Whereas other narcissists seem to hit people over the head with their grandiosity and confidence, the covert narcissist has a presentation of uncertainty and self-doubt. They may let other people make important choices for them because they claim to be indecisive. Because they constantly compare themselves to others, covert narcissists may feel they don't stack up to friends, families, or coworkers. For example, a narcissist in the workplace may need constant reassurance and validation from coworkers. They may be quick to compliment others for their successes, but instead of feeling happy for the person, they only feel bad for themselves. Right. So this can play in a number of ways, the insecurity. Um, they may allow a person to make an important decision for them. And though they already know exactly what they want, they will allow you to make the decision, then use the decision that you made against you because it wasn't what they wanted. So like even in their insecurity, it's still a ploy to actually use to gain power over you. Like, Instead of giving me what I wanted, well, you didn't ask me what I wanted. I allowed you to make a decision, but you didn't ask me what I wanted. You see, so it, it gets used against you. And instead of feeling happy for a person when a person does well or whatever the case is, they only feel bad for themselves because that's where the jealousy and envy actually comes in because they struggle with a lot of jealousy and envy. And that makes it very hard for them. And that's why a lot of times they go into depression for covert narcissists. Uh, go ahead, Brother Kassifo, please. Sure. Kassifo, if you have anything to ask, uh, um, please, by all means. I, I figured you were going to go into the spirits down the line. I'm just listening to it. I'm, I'm just opening the door for you. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Number two, they're passive aggressive. Covert narcissists do not have the same extroversion as overt narcissists, so they tend to use more indirect communication methods. Covert narcissists are incredibly sensitive to criticism, so using indirect communication, passive aggressive behavior, and judgment allows them to protect themselves from confrontation. All right. So you can see the passive aggressiveness. And a lot of times, instead of coming and having a conversation with you to clarify or to rectify something, they will create their own judgment. And that allows them to protect themselves from confrontation or to protect themselves from what you may say that may not go in their favor. Right? So it's easier to make a judgment or to create my own um, assumption of something than to actually talk to you and speak to you about it. Mm. All right, let's continue. Number three, hypersensitive to criticism. Due to unstable self-esteem, people with covert narcissism are incredibly fragile and sensitive. If someone criticizes their work, family or personality the covert narcissist will respond extremely and emotionally they may become overly sad from even a minor comment all right that's pretty straightforward that's, that's, oh you got something custom yeah this is this is the man pleasing respect on person designed to be liked and this is the pride at work mm -hmm. wanting to maintain that image anybody says anything say like, oh no like not my my what is it the the false perception not the false me that i've created is being tampered with you know that's exactly what it is like you're rippling my reality yeah 
of what I created. My illusion. I'm going through an extreme reaction because you you see you exposing something. You you're calling me out. That's very accurate. Number four, they procrastinate and disregard others' needs. Narcissists lack empathy and believe they are the most important person in any situation. Therefore, they will struggle to understand that procrastinating on a project that someone else needs will negatively impact that person. If both they and another person need something, they will always put their own tasks before others. Continue, please. Number five, they are easily stressed. The mood changes that come with being a covert narcissist creates great discomfort. With so much weight assigned to every critique, the narcissist will feel incredibly stressed and anxious as they stand by for the next comment. This stress commonly builds toward narcissistic rage and aggression resulting in one exploding on others or harming themselves when met with negative feedback. Now, this one is interesting. If anyone has ever dealt with a narcissist, uh, especially a covert narcissist, this is, this, this is very um, direct to a covert narcissist, and you're having a conversation with them, and you may have said something, like you may have critiqued something, or you may have, having a conversation with them that is even trying to help them. You could be having a conversation about something that they're dealing with that has nothing to do with you. And you're trying to get them to see a new viewpoint. Then you may run into this because there's so much weight assigned to every critique because you're trying to get them to see something differently than the way that they view it themselves, the narcissist will feel incredibly stressed and anxious as they stand for the next comment. So you may have said something and they may have responded. And then when it's your time to talk, they may get very stressed and anxious because they don't know what you're going to say. And if you don't say what they want to hear, they're going to go into a downward spiral after that. Because there's so much weight that they're putting on every comment, everything you say, that it just builds toward narcissistic rage. They're going to start going on the decline. And then they're going to usually get upset. And then that rage and aggression is going to come so that they can get out of the conversation and not have to deal with it at all. Or not being able to cope with what was said, which goes into the harming themselves. See, the, it's the difference of the pride and the humility. Because in the pride, in the covert narcissism, I've created a perception of who I want to be seen as, and I'm trying to uphold that. When you make one critique, I'm already on guard now because my jig is up. Like, hold up, you're seeing what I have going on. The first one, now it'll make me anxious because now I'm on guard. What else can you see? All right. So I'm going to say next, you call out something else in my pride. I don't want to be corrected. I've given you a perception that I want you to accept and agree with and compliment so that it, I can know it's there. I'm protected. But if I'm coming in humility, I'm not concerned of something else coming up because I know, as we talked about in the lesson, true friends in the pride lesson, I know you're there to help me. And I myself want to be helped. So I'm not anxious for something else to be revealed. I'm actually looking forward to it. Because I know it's a blessing. So it's the same spirits of pride, anger, the things we've been discussing prior to. 
Because it's interesting if I don't, just for any person, if you don't actually correct the person and you lie to the person, you're actually showing hatred toward the person. Yes. So if I'm lying to you to make you feel better, I'm showing that I hate you, which then I'm falling into sin or I'm falling into hatred, which is the spirit of hatred that's actually going to start working in me. And then I'm enabling the behavior. I'm enabling the thought patterns or whatever the case is where I'm not helping you. I'm only hurting you. So I'm not loving my brother as myself. So then you start actually falling and breaking commandments, trying to appease. So you definitely have to be careful of that. And you have to speak truth, everyone to his neighbor. So we get to see and we get the understanding so we can grow out of it and come out of it, not to be left or covert narcissists because we, we have to help them and they have to understand so that they can help themselves as well. Yeah. I put, I put perspective, uh, like you mentioned the preset way in the Proverbs 26 and 28, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it and the flattering mouth worketh ruin. Lying to me would actually help ruin me by flattering me to say what you think I want to hear or just telling me what I want to hear. You're actually you hating me and you're helping take me further down because it's the devil working in all of it, evidently. Lying goes with hatred at the right hand of Satan, according to what um, Gad taught about. So, I'm going to have to skip that part and listen now. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> Come on, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, number six yeah, they are chronically envious the outward sense of inferiority experienced by a covert narcissist will lead to powerful and chronic envy of others for instance if the covert narcissist has a four bedroom house they will want a five bedroom house when they get the bigger house they will be jealous of a person with a pool movie theater, or bowling alley in the basement. No matter what, the covert narcissist will never be able to appreciate what they have. The focus will only be on what they lack, whether possessions, attributes, status, or employment. Right. So you can see the mindset of the covert narcissist to actually look at what they don't have instead of looking at what they do have. So you can see how we're going to actually end up having to get and talk about contentment and actually be strengthened. Covert narcissists have to be strengthened in contentment and truly trusting in Allah Hayyam. Because if they don't trust in Allah Hayyam, they're going to continue to trust in the devil, which they're never going to be satisfied. Right? They're always going to be in want. I'm ready. Number seven, they put themselves down. A covert narcissist will often make self-deprecating comments before anyone else can to protect themselves ahead of time. Seeing as criticism from others is considered the ultimate narcissistic injury, the narcissist may use the self-deprecation or questioning of themselves to gain reassurance rather than negative feedback. Right. I think that's pretty straightforward unless you got something, Casa. It is what it is. It's twofold. They either use it to stop someone else from calling out anything, or they use it to make it seem like they're going through something to get someone else's reaction to reassure them, give me the attention to make me feel better. Well, they say it before a person can actually say it so they're trying to beat you to it so instead of you making the comment i'm going to make the comment so now you're going to give me feedback and try to help me and lift me up 
from me feeling that way about myself. Yeah. Because I know you feel that way about me. So I'm going to beat you to the punch and say what it is so that you can't say it. Yeah. I would rather say it myself than hear it from you. Yeah. And you remember we talked about in the prior lesson where don't don't call out something else. It's also said to stop you from adding. Like, this is the only part I want to be talked about. So right. I've already said this. Let's stay right here. Let's not go anywhere else. Let's. Right. So it's a protection, protecting that, these spirits. They mm. Number eight. They have difficulties with anxiety and depression. Covert narcissists tend to be more sensitive than overt narcissists which makes them prone to anxiety and the shame associated with depression. If their imperfections are pointed out or there is a threat, they will withdraw and isolate themselves, further contributing to their anxiety and depression. All right. So instead of actually dealing with it, they'll just withdraw and isolate themselves. And they'll stay in the anxiety and depression because they're not actually dealing with it. They're just separating themselves to stay there. In, you got the, that yeah. In the gospel, this is where when the teaching starts to call out our works, the depression, the lack of wanting to come to the light for our deeds to be reproved, like we talked about in the last lesson, the pride causes us to withdraw the prideful sorrow and isolate so we can get away from having to change, having to have things exposed, or having to put in the work to actually change something. And it just takes us further into the anxiety or depression so you can see the spirits like, hey, hold on. This information, now the light's coming. We have to get out of here. This isn't conducive to us dwelling in you. So they pull the person away. This isn't the environment that I want to be in. You know, which is true because it's not the environment they want to be in where they actually have to take accountability and actually have to confess their faults. Yeah. So it's very true. It's interesting how the gospel works. Confess your faults one to another. Like these these works are like what the apostles were saying to do is evident. This spirit isn't something new. This narcissism. They were teaching us the things to combat these very works of these spirits. Mm -hmm. Count it all cheer when you fall into diverse temptations, you know. Paul teaching us how Elohim is a father. He's chasing us out of love, like be, take it joyfully, you know. He's putting us in the right way. Those are whom he loveth. Yeah. That's the only way we're gonna come out of it. If we're not able to to see our faults, or we don't want to see our faults, or to admit that we're wrong, then we can't serve Alahayam. Because Alahayam is humble. We can't be in pride and think that we can serve Alahayim because pride is when one flees from Alahayim. Yeah, we depart. Well, pride is turned away. All right, I'm ready when you are, Brother Kassel. Okay, number nine. They blame others for their behavior. Covert narcissists will not take responsibility for their behavior if they hurt someone when protecting their low self-esteem or avoiding confrontation. Blaming another person through narcissistic projection is just one of many narcissistic manipulation tactics a covert narcissist will use. All right. Uh, let's touch on narcissistic projection. Narcissistic projection is a defense tactic narcissists use to pivot the blame of their actions onto others. This is often done unconsciously to protect their low self-esteem 
as any mistake on their part could rupture the idolized image they create of themselves. Okay. Narcissistic projection is the defense mechanism through which individuals project or see their own negative behaviors, emotions, and traits in someone else. So they're literally how they feel about themselves or what they see in themselves. They'll project it onto you as if that's how you feel toward them. Right. So you can understand how that projection is used to blame others for their behavior as well. Like, you feel this way about me, so that's why I don't care. But I never said that I felt that way about you. You see how that how that works? I actually don't feel that way about you. But that's the way you feel about yourself and you're projecting it onto me. And then you're operating as if that's the way I feel. To actually, to actually justify your behavior. There was some part you touched on earlier where to avoid confrontation, the narcissism would make up in our minds what we already think the person thinks. That's projecting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Same thing we are. Yeah. Yeah. And the mind is set. There's no turn away from it. Because if I turn away from what I already set my mind to about you, then I have to deal with the fact that it's actually me. Right. So it has to be, no, this is my truth. This is what I feel. And you just have to respect it so I can stay where I am. Right. Or they'll use something that you may have actually done to them that was wrong. And that you apologize for it, but they'll never get over it. And they'll continue using that to justify their actions or whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah. Laying it up, laying it up in store. Right. I think that spirit, that's the spirit of wickedness. If I, I may be wrong, but if I may tell this verse to you and tell me what you understand. May I? Go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. It says, Wisdom of Solomon 1711, for wickedness condemned by her own witness is very timorous and being pressed with conscience always forecasts grievous things. So that this spirit of wickedness, this female spirit, she, she always pushes out grievous things. Like whatever she's thinking, she's going to push it out on others for it to be the case. And the word timorous Timorous means showing or suffering from nervousness, fear, or lack of confidence. Sounds like wickedness is one of the spirits at work in this narcissism. I agree. It puts it in perspective learning of this covert narcissism that I was walking in. Because that's all the spirits of wickedness attends on the sons of Levi. So that's why this stuff is making so much. It's ringing bells. Hmm. Praise Allah for the insight. Amen. You ready for me to continue? I'm ready whenever you are, brother. Okay. Number 10. They have superficial relationships. While they do have feelings and narcissists cry from time to time, all narcissists, including covert narcissists, lack the essential qualities necessary to form deep connected relationships. Their shortage of empathy, need for constant reassurance, inability to focus on anyone but themselves, and tendency to manipulate others are all things that make it a challenge to keep people in their lives. You can continue, Brother Cosby. That was straightforward. Okay. Number 11. They have difficulty fitting in. Covert narcissists often carry a lot of anxiety and self-deprecating beliefs about themselves. When they're around other people, Covert narcissists may get stuck on analyzing and monitoring their behaviors, 
making it difficult to catch social cues and build genuine relationships. Right. So they're so busy trying to make sure that they're doing everything right instead of just actually being themselves because the whole point of them is not to be themselves. So this is why they end up being more like loners or introverted. It's because they're constantly trying to make sure that they're the person that they're trying to be and not who they actually are. Or the person that, not who they're trying to be, the person that they want people to see them as, though they're actually not putting in the work and effort to be that person. Ah, that's the vainglory and the work that can remember putting on. Like, basically, it's a show, the right. hypocrisy. Right. And then, yes, it is. It's vainglory. It's definitely vainglory. So you actually get to see that it's, I want to be perceived this way. And because I'm not actually that person or actually putting forth the effort to be that person, I have a hard time building genuine relationships or connecting with people because I'm constantly self-examining, trying to make sure that you're not seeing who I actually am, but you're seeing who I want you to see. Uh, you can continue, Brother Casa. Okay. Because covert narcissists don't want others to judge them, they usually show a curated version of what they think people want to see instead of their true selves. This version will often feel like it doesn't quite fit because they're building a facade based on social cues they don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is being socially awkward. It's not being authentic. And what people is... feel it. Mm. That's why they end up being like introverted or they don't have many friends because people can feel that they're not being sincere and honest. All right, continue, Brother Costa, please. Number 12, they go above and beyond in everything. Covert narcissism can be disguised under a mask of altruism. Doing kind and charitable things is great, but engaging in these to gain praise and admiration from others may indicate narcissism. Because covert narcissists fear they are lacking in some respect, Narcissism disguised as altruism can be their way of proving that fear to be wrong. Right. So that's when it goes into your actual true intentions. Right. Actually understanding that Alahayim weigh if the inclination, Alahayim see if the inclination, and that no matter what you're doing in the sight of men, Alahayim knows what your true intentions are. So in this, they have to do things from a pure heart and a, a good conscience, not to be seen in men's eyes a certain way or to gain the admiration of a certain person or people, but to actually do it because Allah, I am looking for an inclination and knowing that it's the right thing to do. All right, Brother Kassel. You... You mentioned how, well, in what you're discussing, how this stuff can come from childhood, where we develop into these things. One of the spirits of error from youth, according to Ruben, was obsequiousness and chicanery, that one may be fair and seeming, and officious in attention, like trying to seem really good in the sight of men. So, it's a real deal. Yeah, to bring that up so we can get them definitions. <laughs> Obsequiousness and chicanery. Mm -hmm. Obsequious is obedient or attentive in an excessive or servile degree. 
So they want to seem obedient to Allah Hayyam, though they're obedient to themselves. And then chicanery. Chicanery is the use of trickery to achieve political, financial, or legal purpose. So that's why it wasn't authentic. Right. And a good way to know if someone's not authentic and they're operating in chicanery is they would bring up what they've done. Instead of just doing it and actually doing it in secret because Allah Hayyam, they're doing it for Allah Hayyam, not to be praised. They will bring up what they've done and they will speak about it and say, you know, I didn't want to be praised for this. So I didn't do this for, you know, to, to be, you know, to be seen, but I did it for Allah Hayyam, da, 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 or whatever the case is. But they're literally speaking it to people. So you can see how it's not sincere when I am actually bringing it up so that you can actually praise me. Or you can have that perception of me. All right, Kasim, ready? Number 13, they're manipulative for personal gain. Whether covert or overt, a narcissist will be self-absorbed and only consider what is best for them and how they can get what they want. This self-centeredness leads to two outcomes, emotional manipulation and a lack of empathy. Covert narcissists will do anything to achieve their goals, even emotionally manipulating others. They will use people for their personal gain by guilt tripping, threats of violence, and other forms of coercion. Furthermore, a narcissist will never experience empathy. They won't care about others, only what others can do for them. All right. And that's what drives a narcissist. It's their own personal gain or their own personal desires and getting them fulfilled. So you can understand the backbone of a narcissist. Right? But there is salvation for them. Some of them. The one that Allah Hayyam deemeth worthy. And he took on two. We're going to get into that. All right. Let's go ahead and finish up here. Brother Costa, please. Okay. Number 14. They have grandiose fantasies. On the outside, a person with covert narcissism will seem quiet, meek, and self-critical. However, on the inside, they feel an intense sense of specialness. Despite their jealousy, envy, and apparent shyness, covert narcissists will believe they are better than everyone else. Instead of engaging with people like the overt narcissist, the covert narcissist chooses to be alone because no one can live up to their high expectations. Right. So that's why you see them usually seeming to be an introvert or whatever the case is, because one, they don't want to be corrected. They don't want to be exposed. And two, they feel like they are better than others. All right, now let's get into the overt narcissist. So we learned everything about the covert narcissist. We have a good foundation of what drives them, what they do, their tactics, whatever the case is, just the whole plethora of information. Now let's get into the overt narcissist so we can actually understand them as well. Okay, um, Brother Casa, you ready? Yeah. How would a spot an overt narcissist? Lack of empathy. An overt narcissist lacks empathy. Empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is genuinely putting yourself in someone else's shoes and understanding their struggle or pain. The overt narcissist is too self-centered and sees themselves as too far above others to experience empathy. 
because an overt narcissist cannot feel empathy, other people are merely a means to an end. One reason the overt narcissist can seem so charismatic is that often they have many, many friends. The overt narcissist often appears very popular with lots of friends and admirers. This makes others want to be around them. The trouble is, the overt narcissist has very few, if any, real friends. For the overt narcissist, friends are merely fans, groupies, or psychopaths. Mm -hmm. Psychopaths. Okay. A psychopath is a person who acts obsequiously towards someone important in order to gain advantage. Mm -hmm. All right. So you can see how the overt narcissist lacks empathy. So they can treat people however they want because they don't actually empathize with how you feel or being in that position because for them, they don't want to be in that position that you're in to have to feel empathetic or someone to feel empathetic toward them. So they won't put themselves in positions, but if they do find themselves in a position of someone having to be empathetic for them, that's usually when you run into the narcissistic rage. Okay. So if a person actually lacks empathy, they can experience true love or friendship. So the over narcissist calls you a friend, but at the end of the day, you're just a member of the fan club, quote unquote, or they feel they can gain something from you. So essentially, you're expendable. So when dealing with an overt narcissist, you usually find that if you do something wrong to them, they'll ghost you. Like they'll just cut you off and they won't talk to you again. And that's one of the signs of an overt narcissist. All right. Now, overt narcissists are, are different than covert narcissists in different ways, especially on the exterior because overt narcissists are very charming. Um, Brother Costa, you mind reading the charming? Sure. <clears throat> there is a prevailing stereotype of a narcissist as an A-type bully, opinionated and obnoxious. However, the overt narcissist is often charming, smooth-talking, and likable. Remember, despite their grandiose persona, the overt narcissist suffers from low self-esteem. The overt narcissist needs positive affirmation, needs constant validation. That's where other people come in. When an overt narcissist is charming, it's usually an illusion and can't be maintained too long. Hence, they'll feel the need to recharge and be alone. When an overt narcissist appears to care and even listen, the lack of empathy in their own beliefs usually overweighs the person's genuine concern. The overt narcissist is usually charming, generous, or kind with their own ulterior motives. The overt narcissist is obsessed with their public persona, and often that persona includes being a great humanitarian. An overt narcissist is good at faking. They can appear to be good listeners, generous, sensitive, loving, and faithful. These qualities are why so many people are drawn to the overt narcissist. The overt narcissist draws others into their inner circle while at the same time keeping them at an arm's length. Right. And they have to keep you at an arm's length because you'll actually figure out who they really are because over time or being around them in their personal space is when you actually really get to see who that person is. So that's why a lot of over narcissists when they're out and about or they're with people, man, they're the greatest, the funnest people to be around, but actually being in a relationship with one, you will seem like you're in a relationship with two different people. Mm -hmm. 
right. Um, they demand admiration, Brother Kafa. The overt narcissist, while pretending to be a friend, will at the same time demand your admiration. Admiration and praise are prerequisites for having a relationship with an overt narcissist. What this means is that the overt narcissist won't try to trick you or manipulate you into complimenting them. Admiration, affirmation, and praise are conditions for any kind of relationship with an overt narcissist. The overt narcissist will let you know they need to be praised. The overt narcissist will even instruct you in ways they prefer to be praised or what to be praised for. Verbal and emotional abuse are often tools the overt narcissist uses to gain and keep relationships. And yet, because the overt narcissist often has a larger-than-life personality, people will tolerate abuse to be near them. The hard truth. Now, they're also over narcissists are usually hardworking and successful people. Um, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Another reason people often gravitate to an overt narcissist is that they usually are wealthy, successful, and can offer perks of relationships. The overt narcissist is often hardworking and successful. Part of the overt narcissist's desire to be perceived as larger than life is being perceived by others as successful. Many people enjoy being around successful, wealthy, and enlightened people. This makes the overt narcissist very desirable as both a significant other and friend. The overt narcissist doesn't just provide others with their winning personality, but with perks and fringe benefits. Often, the overt narcissist is happy to share the wealth or give you a perk from their friendship, i.e. weekends at their lake house, fine dining, expensive cars, toys, and etc. For the overt narcissist, Hard working brings wealth, wealth brings worldly possessions, and these bring other people closer. Right. So pretty much they'll buy you. They'll buy you and they'll do things for you, but then they'll hold it over you. And so that you'll remember what they done for you. Because it doesn't come without a cost. They're gonna do something, and then when they need something. Or when they need something from you, it's going to come back up of what they've done for you. Right. Continue, Brother Cost, please. All right. But remember, the generosity of an overt narcissist is never without cost. The overt narcissist would always demand their due, always demand your admiration and praise. And if you refuse an overt narcissist, you will not only be without, you may face other consequences. If denied admiration and praise, an overt narcissist will often use their wealth and privilege to exact revenge. An overt narcissist will never let you easily leave their fan club of friends and admirers. Because if you desert an overt narcissist, others may follow suit and expose the charade. Be aware, if you shatter the public persona of an overt narcissist, they will attempt to ostracize you from friends, family, and other valuable relationships. Right. And if you remember, it talks about how they'll use their money. You know the verse I'm talking about? I think that's the spirit of anger. Hold on. Or wrath, actually. Hold on. Testament of Dan, chapter 3, verse 4. Okay, Testament Dan 3 and 4. It says, Therefore, he that is wrathful, if he be a mighty man, hath a threefold power in his anger, one by the help of his servants, and a second by his wealth, whereby he persuadeth and overcometh wrongfully. 
and thoroughly having his own natural power, he worketh thereby the evil. Was that not it? That's it. That's it right there. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see how having that success and having that power, they actually use money for power or wealth or material things for power. So you can see how it's it's used still in the same way as a covert narcissist. It's just how they're going about it and what they're actually using is different. Covert narcissists most of use is their emotions, whereas a uh, overt narcissist uses their success or uses the material things that they have. Or what they've done for you. You good, Casa? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Shallow relationships. Now, a lot of the characteristics of narcissists are the same. That's why we're going into the specific things about overt narcissists that differs them from a covert narcissist or a narcissist in general. So you can actually understand the dichotomy of the two. Um, go ahead, Brother Costa, please. The only relationship an overt narcissist can have is a shallow relationship. Remember, the overt narcissist is a good actor and always protecting themselves by creating an outward persona that differs from their true self. So good that the overt narcissist can play the dutiful lover, a loyal friend, or a trusted mentor. However, the overt narcissist must keep their relationships shallow and superficial so they can control them. True love and friendship mean making yourself vulnerable, accessible, and open to constructive criticism. The overt narcissist rejects all these. Right. So the over narcissist puts up a wall so that they don't feel these things so that they can actually continue to operate the way that they want to. The over narcissist must be in control. All narcissism is about manipulation. An overt narcissist needs the relationship to be shallow so they can offer their approval or discard you if need be. Our relationships are ultimately disposable to the overt narcissist when these things may occur. 1. Challenge to their confidence. When challenged, the narcissist's brittle egos are unable to accept the idea that they were wrong or seen as imperfect. They turn this into a personal attack and respond with rage or a mental breakdown towards that person to regain their sense of superiority. Number two, injury to self-esteem. When a narcissist's shortcomings are pointed out by someone or they are corrected, they feel an overwhelming sense of shame. The rage is executed to seek revenge upon the accuser. The need for revenge results in explosive rage and does not die down until the narcissist feels the person was dealt appropriate punishment. That's going to come back up. We're going to retouch on that. Okay. Number three, false sense of self. Underlying this false sense of self are feelings that he or she is not lovable for who he or she is or what he or she offers in relationships. When a lover or partner begins to feel doubt about the narcissist, that is when the narcissist rage surfaces. Mm -hmm. So they're the same in that sense when it comes to the false sense of self. When they feel like they're getting exposed, that's when the narcissistic rage surfaces. Okay. Now let's look at the cycles of being in a relationship with the narcissist. 
We're going to look at um, relationships. We're going to look at parenting. We're going to look at everything so that we can get a full grasp of all dynamics when dealing with a narcissist, whether overt or covert. All right. So we're going to go into the first stage of a relationship with the narcissist, and that's the idealization stage. Okay, so we're going to start there. The idealization stage. All right. The overt narcissist has decided that you are a good source of supply. You give them a lot of attention or the attention they desire. They will commence love bombing you and finding out as much about you as possible. The danger being that if you give them too much information, they will use it against you in the future. They will also do their utmost to convince you that they have never been in a relationship with somebody quite like you. They will be on their best behavior. And the euphoria felt during this stage will draw you close to them. Like the covert narcissist, the overt narcissist also has a tendency to play the victim and the martyr. They will speak of the abuse that they had to endure in past relationships to get sympathy. They will use love bombing and mirroring excessively at this stage of the relationship. You will be put on a pedestal and can do no wrong. Right. So this is idealization stage, and this is where they're forming, just like they do to themselves, how they form this concept of who they are, they actually do it to you as well at the very beginning of the relationship. They create this idealization of who you are, and then eventually you're not going to be able to live up to the idealization that they created of you. So then we go into the next stage, all right? But let's touch on mirroring real quick. Mirroring is the behavior in which one person subconsciously imitates the gesture, speech pattern, or attitude of another. So at the beginning of the relationship, it works out so well because they're actually mirroring you. They're actually taking on your gestures and your speech pattern and your attitude. And they're literally meeting you where you are. They're on their best behavior. All right? So they may make comments about how much y'all have in common or how much y'all are alike, though they may be nothing like you. All right? So that's the idealization stage. That's the beginning of the relationship. Right. So usually at the beginning of the relationship, it's when they actually win you over because it's like, man, this relationship is great. This person is great. We have a lot in common They're, You know, you're not understanding that they're actually mimicking you and mirroring you. But it's like, yeah, man, we're, we're so much alike. Like we have so much in common. Then we get to the next phase, right? The devaluation stage. Cost whenever you're ready, please. Okay. Well, I'm getting the definition of love bombing. Oh, okay. I need to go over that. I know I need to go over love bombing. I didn't know what it was. If you know it offhand, please. Hmm? I can read it. Love bombing is a tactic in which someone bombs you with extreme displays of affection and attention with the intent to manipulate you. You. All right. Devaluation stage. Once they have you hooked, the over narcissist will start to pull away. They will find faults in you, and to them, you are now not as perfect as they perceive you to be in the idealization stage. They will start to downplay the things that you do, and there will be criticism of things about you that they once found attractive. This will happen gradually over time and may take months or years. They will also use triangulation on a regular basis to try and elicit jealousy. 
whether it be a family member or a friend. Right. But triangulation is when a toxic or manipulative person, often a person with strong narcissistic traits, brings a third person into their relationship in order to remain in control. Right. So it may be their mother. It may be their brother. It may be their friend. It may be they'll just brain that person and that person will be literally all in your business and you have to literally be dealing with them and the other person at the same time. So now you have this triangulation and usually the person that is in the triangulation is usually an enabler of the narcissist. So they're literally on the side of the narcissist, but they're trying to come as if they're actually trying to view both sides, though they're already on one side. Uh, continue if you don't mind, Brother Costa, please. Sure. They may also decide to devalue you if for some reason cannot provide them with the same level of narcissistic supply that you did in the past. When they start to distance themselves, this could be due to not being given an adequate amount of supply, attention, or they have started to become bored with you. If they perceive a weakness in you, they may regard you as no longer being perfect. Narcissistic rage will also become very apparent. This can be very confusing for the target as it appears as a total personality change from the person that they initially met. All right. So the devaluation stage usually is when y'all are out and about, they're a completely different person. Every, they're charming. Everybody loves them. They're nice. They're treating you nice. They're treating you well. And then as soon as you go back home, they go back right into the person that they really are and how they feel about you. So it gets very confusing. You're like, hold on. Like, you're not the person that you were when I first met you. We just went out. You were that person that I remember from when I first met. And then when we got home, you're, you're treating me terrible. Right. So that's the devaluation stage. It creates that confusion because you're like, I don't really know what's going on. You're not very happy with being with me. And it's because they're not happy with being with themselves. And they can't put on the facade all the time because they have to recharge because they're not being genuine when they go out and when they're around people. So you're literally interrupting their recharge by being with them and being with them in the area or the seclusion where they actually would recharge and be alone. So now you're in that space. So you're getting the real person while being with them in their personal space. The, from the scriptures, this is evidence that it's the evil spirits at work in this thing because Solomon was told how the evil spirits they have for a certain time they can stay up in the firmament but then they get tired and they fall down just as when these evil spirits are at work in us there's a time when we can put on the show and be the actor and put on the facade for everyone but after we get burnt out the spirit is just showing itself straightly that this is what it is mm -hmm. and whoever's in that relationship is going to be getting the, the brunt of that at home or in private environments as the person is trying to recharge and they don't have anywhere to go. So they can only be there. The real, the spirit can only really show itself to the person. There's no hiding. It knows. So it just does it. All right. It comes out. You can't hide it. Because right, you can't sustain something that is not true for a long time. Just like the evil spirits can't sustain being in the firmament. They fall down. The demons fall down. So it's the exact same thing. 
They can't sustain being someone who they're not or to cover or put on the facade to everyone else. But when they are in private, then in that moment that they need to recharge, that's me and Brother Kothafor stating, the true spirits that they're actually operating in come out and they start attacking the person who is there because they don't actually want that person to be there. They would rather that person not be there so that they actually can be alone and no one can uncover who they truly are or what they're actually truly dealing with. So, yeah, that's where we're at. So let's get to the next stage. The next stage is the discarding stage, right? Brother Casa, whenever you're ready, please. All right. The discarding stage. Because the target is feeling overwhelmed with this abuse, they may start to pull away. Rather than try and figure out what the problem is and fix the problem, the overt narcissist may promptly end the relationship. They will be quite blunt in how they do this, and it will result in further distress to the target. During the devaluation stage, the overt narcissist may have found another source of supply, so you are no longer any use to them. They may choose to cease contact with you or start to triangulate you with their new source of supply. This will either cause you to either cling more or totally withdraw. The clinging could be the beginning of trauma bonding. You will be in a state of shock and confusion and wonder how your mate could be so cruel to you. You may also be longing for the loving person that you had initially met. What many people fail to understand is that this was only a persona that they used to get you hooked and give them a new supply. The target may have not seen the end of the overt narcissist who may try a number of hoovering techniques to try and get them back into the relationship. If they are successful, the cycle of abuse will continue and usually increase. The actions are usually very ingrained and all that they are able to do is idealize, devalue, and discard anybody that tries to form a relationship with them. All right, so you can see how we can tie that right back to Sorak if they maintain, all right? If they maintain them, it only gets worse, all right? So you can see that if the target, if the over-narcissist actually maintains the person by doing all these things to them, then what you're saying is that you actually are okay with what they're doing and they're not going to stop. If I can treat you however I want to treat you and you have no boundaries and you don't hold fast to your boundaries and if for us the boundaries is the law if you're not going to hold fast to the law and you're not going to you're not going to hold me accountable for the things that I'm doing wrong, then in, in essence, you're the problem. You like what I'm doing to you and you have the problem. And, and speaking from the narcissist's perspective, I'm only going to continue doing it and I'm going to get more bold and worse because I'm not being withheld. So I'm going to continue to devalue you and discard you. You got anything, Katha? If if you need, definitely go back into the um the anger lesson on this, on this specific part because it explains it very very uh, detailed. Uh, because this is all anger 
And yes, it's all anger. They're literally doing things just to show their dominance and to afflict you and just to tear you down where they can just have complete power and dominion over you. You got anything, Brother Cuthbert? This stuff is accurate. Huh? Is it possible to be overt and covert? You can um, definitely, you can have traits of both. Okay, because I'm reading this stuff. I'm like, yeah, this is what I did. Yeah, you can have traits of both. It's um, the, it's just trying to differentiate the two, but a lot of times they get, a lot of things get intermingled because spirits, spirits are spirits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, spirits are spirits. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I'm just really trying to differentiate the two so that people can understand when they're dealing with things that so they can actually know, OK, I know what I'm dealing with. I know that these are signs or traits of an over narcissist or these are signs traits of a covert narcissist. And now I can understand what I need to do. Gotcha. I didn't have anything else what you explained as well. Now, these are the different things that are used or that you may hear um, when dealing with the narcissist. Um, and these are in different places of the relationship. I just wanted to put these in there so that we can actually understand. Um, one is the becoming one effect. Cause of your mind, please. At the beginning of the relationship, a narcissist will love bomb you and will find out your hobbies and interests. By chance, they will also be interested in what kind of person you are and use the similarities to create a bond between you. You will be told that you are unlike anybody that they have ever met in the past and you are their other half. The similarities and the ability to communicate and interact well with them are proof of this. Right. But you know that's the mirroring. So they're literally mirroring you at the beginning. So that's why it seems like everything is like, yeah, like it's, we just have so much in common. We're doing so great. Yeah. All right. Now the next part, playing the victim. Another strategy used by a narcissist to get their target hooked is portraying themselves as a victim. This ploy is effective in gaining sympathy and support, especially if the person is an empath. They will play on the empath's kind and caring nature, and they are aware that these people are nurturers, so they will take advantage of this. When questioning the relationship after the discard, the target will come to understand that the opposite of the narcissist is true. And this is the cycle that they put all those that they have been in relationships with through. All right. So the idealization that the narcissists have of themselves, eventually you get to the point that it's opposite, that they're actually operating opposite of what they're actually saying they are or who they're actually saying they are and that's when a lot of times when you're like hold on now i'm I'm backing away all right uh, the next one is lies all these things go hand in hand so we have to touch on them just so you understand that these things you're going to come across these things gotcha the overt narcissist is skilled at lying, but not as clever as the covert narcissist in concealing their lies. At some point, they will be found out. Once this happens, trust will be lost and there will be the perception that if they lied once, there will be other lies that would have been covered up. All right. So then you're like, okay, 
everything eventually everything's going to come out because you can only lie so much before the truth comes out especially if we have alahayim with us alahayim is going to start revealing things all right how they test you testing will start early in the relationship the overt narcissist will create scenarios to see how you respond to them because they want to know what they can get away with. Testing could be comprised of an increase in their lying, getting angry for no reason, discrediting something that they previously liked about you, lacking empathy, or putting you down. All right, so all these things, they may create scenarios or something just to test you and see how you're going to respond to it so that they can actually learn you. Becoming friends with your friends is another part. The purpose behind this is so that they can portray a false sense of being a good person to your friends and build up a friendship so, if needed, they can discredit you to them in the future. When they are successful at turning your friends against you, they can also use your friends for information gatherers who pass things on to the narcissist. Mm -hmm. Right? And also, this is another big part, um, discarding you at the worst possible time. The discard can be done so quickly and can be a shock to the covert narcissist victim it could be done at a low point in time when they require support from their partner. This can add additional stress to the situation. All right. So this could be done either when the covert narcissist seems like they're struggling really bad and they'll bail on you and that kind of leaves you like, hey, like I'm trying to help you. Or you can be struggling and having a moment and they'll discard you and, and leave. All right, hoovering. We just want to touch on these things so that we can get some more edification on them so that we can understand what we're actually dealing with. Once you have withdrawn from them, and especially if you have had no contact, the overt or covert narcissist will often try and draw you back into the relationship. There is a tendency for them to project their bad traits and behavior onto you. They will rationalize that the problem is not them, and if you ended the relationship, it was due to some flaw in your personality or something you're struggling with. This is more likely to happen if they have lost their current source of supply or they are looking to triangulate. Anything to get them back on top. Um, uh, we're going to go over projection, abuse, triangulation, and trauma bonding. And then we're going we're gonna to go into how a narcissist chooses their mate. <laughs> Projection. Projecting a flaw or flaws of oneself to another person allows an overt narcissist to displace their bad traits and behaviors into a significant other who does not possess these characteristics. Right. So they're going to displace their bad traits or behaviors onto the, the other person who does not possess those characteristics. But that's projection. You have to become the person that I truly am while I continue to be the idealized version of myself. Some real self-hatred. Yeah. All right. Abuse. Abuse is, in most cases, not apparent to others as it is done discreetly and subtlety within the context of the relationship. Like the covert narcissist, any abuse inflicted onto the target 
is done behind closed doors. If angered, the overt narcissist will speak with your friends and colleagues about how you have wronged them so that any blame is reverted from them back onto you. Right. So you see how they make sure that there's no witnesses. Everything has to be done in privacy so that no one can attest for how you're being treated or what actually happened. All right, triangulation. The comparing of two or more people and playing each other off. And playing each other off. So you're literally, you have other people in the dynamic and you're literally, you have one on your side and you're using that one to go and deal with the person that you're actually trying to deal with. And trauma bonding. This cycle comprises of positive and negative reinforcement, reward punishments. It tends to confuse the victim, but creates an emotional bond to the narcissist. An example of this can be seen in the phenomenon known as the Stockholm Syndrome. Right. So if I'm going to treat you good sometimes, and I'm going to treat you bad sometimes. And you're not going to be able to decipher if you're in a good relationship or a bad one. So why a narcissist chooses you? A narcissist would choose an easy target. Prime targets would be an empath, right? That's one of them. An empath, which is a person with the ability to perceive and understand the mental or emotional state of another individual. Also an easygoing person or a highly sensitive person or a codependent person. Uh, codependent is a type of dysfunctional helping relationship where one person supports or enables another person's maybe drug addiction, alcoholism, gambling addiction, poor mental health, immaturity, irresponsibility, or underachievement. All right. Now, ultimately, this is the narcissist thing is that they want to possess the traits of others that they don't have. So the greater the number of positive traits you have, the higher the value you are to them. Narcissists may also be attracted to you if they perceive you have qualities such as being rich, successful, or physically attractive, or you're knowledgeable, or for us, spiritual. Having a partner with these qualities will boost their fragile ego. The level of self-esteem of the target at the time of initial contact would also be a consideration. Having a lower self-esteem will make them an easier target. If you have had a recent significant life event such as a death, divorce, or a traumatic situation, this would also factor into the equation and make you more vulnerable and so they're prying on you they're actually looking to see if you're suitable for manipulation All right let's touch on romantic relationships and then we're going to get into parental relationships all right brother Costafo Romantic relationships with a narcissist will typically feel one-sided, particularly with emotional soothing, support, and reassurance. Most energy and attention will be directed toward the narcissistic partner, which is unlikely to change throughout the relationship. Continue, Brother Castle, please. No problem. Signs of a covert narcissist partner include being inattentive and distracted, the covert narcissist is self-absorbed and will give little time and attention to a partner. Jealousy and paranoia. Covert narcissists will constantly struggle with coveting, whether it's material things or being like their partner. Inability to understand a partner's point of view. With a lack of empathy, a narcissist will be unwilling and unable to consider a partner's different opinions. Unexpected angry outbursts. Narcissists are fragile and overly sensitive. 
so they could quickly become angry and violent and break down in tears. Hmm. Issues bonding with children. Again, without a strong sense of empathy, narcissists struggle to bond and connect with children at any age. Legal issues. A narcissist thinks that rules and laws do not apply to them, so they often engage in illegal activities and or struggle to keep or downplay the laws of Allah when it's against their desires. Right. We can't tempt Allah with the mindset, I can do whatever I want, and Allah is going to love me regardless. And he knows my heart and are finding places to play within the law to fulfill your desires. Even after the devil tempted Yache to throw himself off the temple and using the scriptures to justify it according to its own understanding. Can we read Luke 4 and 9 through 12, please? Sure. Luke chapter 4, verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the son of Allah, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Yache answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy Allah. Right. So you see how even the enemy was actually using the scriptures in its own way to justify what he was asking for. So we have to be extremely cautious of this, not to justify our works, our actions, our thoughts based off our desires and not to look at the scriptures in the same way because it will lead us astray. You got anything on that, Casa? Amen. Right, right. That's spirits of pride in the work of it. It's pretty straight what you said. Okay. All right. Let's get into parental relationships. All right, Casa. Have at it, man. Having a narcissistic father or mother is a trying experience. Seeing as the covert narcissist is sneaky, the usual signs of narcissism may not be present in a narcissistic family dynamic. Within a narcissistic family, there is usually a specific structure that keeps the homostasis of the family, thus continuing the enabling of the narcissist. The narcissistic individual can be anyone in the family, but is generally an adult, such as a parent or grandparent. This person often has traits of or has been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. Because the dysfunctional family dynamics center around fulfilling the person's needs, the needs of everyone else are generally overlooked. If the parent or grandparent is an overt narcissist, the child usually becomes a covert narcissist, seeing that the overt narcissist requires so much space, control, and attention. The child usually has to live in a small space or has to seem invisible when living with the overt narcissist. Additionally, manipulation tactics such as blaming, disrespect, and gaslighting are commonly utilized in these families and are used to further the control of the narcissistic individual. So innately, the child learns the tactics and considers them normal. A narcissist view their family as a status symbol that can be used for their own benefit. Within a narcissistic family structure, the narcissistic individual dominates over other members, reigning control and influencing the role that each family member is given. They are the person who sets the rules for the family, whether implicit or explicit. 
these rules establish the status of each member and the narcissist's mood determines the feelings within the entire household. Yep. All right. The family dynamic. Because a king wouldn't have any power without his servants, a narcissist would not have as much reign without their enablers. In a narcissistic family, the narcissist enabler is the person who enforces the power of the narcissist. They do so by engaging in manipulation of others in the family, assisting with the gaslighting, not correcting or standing against the behavior, and pursue other avenues for psychological abuse. They tend to the needs of the narcissist, keeping them happy. In turn, they receive positive reinforcement through the form of praise and other commendations. Depending on the family dynamics, this person might engage directly in the narcissistic abuse, stand by while it unfolds and say nothing, or pretend not to notice it at all. But the main consistency is their reinforcement of the narcissist's actions by refusing to stop them. This role is filled by anyone in the family who the narcissist feels comfortable with, usually a spouse, child, or their parent. The golden child is frequently one that can be easily molded into the narcissist's image or easy to manipulate to become like the narcissist. Whether chosen for their looks, intelligence, or other qualities, this child is usually given the impression that they are somehow better than their siblings. They may believe they are the chosen one and can do no wrong. This child is typically the one who represents the family to the public to further maintain their good public image. As in most dysfunctional families, the scapegoat is the one who everyone blames for the problems and misfortunes within the family. This person is easy to blame, perhaps due to their personality or other circumstances. They are frequently the most outspoken child or person in the family union as they may choose to speak back to or question the narcissist. Thus, they are often subjected to family mobbing. In these cases, the whole family comes together to dump their problems on the scapegoat in order to deflect from the larger dysfunction of the family union. All right, so we have three right now. We have the enabler, we have the golden child, and we have the scapegoat. And those three are usually around the narcissist in a family atmosphere. The golden child is usually the one that ends up being the covert narcissist. If the family has a, a overt narcissist as a parent, the golden child usually becomes the covert narcissist. What's this next one we're going into? The family structure. Okay. A narcissistic family structure will often be full of deceit, emotional abuse, and multiple forms of narcissistic manipulation. These dynamics are extremely dysfunctional and harmful for any family member involved, no matter their position or role in the family system. Unhealthy communication, poor boundaries, and a need for control are some clear signs that a family is being governed by these maladaptive behaviors. The kind of childhood trauma that causes narcissistic personality disorder is anything that dis disrupts the normal psychosocial development progress of the child. Of prime importance is the caregiver's lack of empathy during critical developmental stages or highly overindulged, meaning they cocker the child and made them feel like they could do no wrong. 
This results in an adult who facilitates between grandiosity and shame. So either they're in pride or in sorrow, not being able to process, accept, and take accountability for their mistakes. So you can see how being in that environment where the caregiver is lacking empathy. So innately, the child starts to lack empathy, thinking that it's normal. So either they're lacking empathy and the child lacks empathy or they're overindulged, meaning they're being cockered and the child becomes self-willed and the child becomes an overt narcissist. So you get you actually get to see the dichotomy of the two. So that actually plays into childhood trauma, where a child could witness violence, physical neglect, emotional neglect, emotional abuse, physical abuse, or even um, bodily abuse. All right. So here are the, these are the 10 signs of a narcissistic family. Okay, let's jump into this. So this is going to give us a lot of understanding as far as family structure. Number one, image is everything. A narcissistic family is often obsessed with creating and keeping the perfect family image. A narcissist, a logical false self needs the perfect image in order to present themselves appropriately to the world. Any imperfections are usually blamed on the scapegoat, who is an easy and ready target for the family's shortcomings. When every member of the family sticks to their role without making any waves, this keeps the narcissistic individual happy and decreases the risk of any narcissistic rage. If someone were to speak up, and let the world know that they are not perfect, then this person would be punished by the narcissist or their enabler. So a lot of times with a narcissistic family, it's very secretive. Like, it's don't talk to people outside the house or what's going on inside the house because they want to keep everything under wraps so that the narcissist can continue that control of everyone inside the house to manipulate them to think that it's normal where it's not actually normal. Um, the second one, please, Brother Kafka. Number two, lack of communication. One of the major elements of a dysfunctional family is poor communication, and a narcissistic family takes this to the extreme. Not only is there a lack of communication, but the communication that does take place is often filled with triangulation and gaslighting. These tactics are used to maintain power and control, put family members against each other, and keep confusion and chaos within the family system. This creates anger, mistrust, confusion, and chaos, thus further maintaining the narcissist's control. It is common for punishment tactics such as the silent treatment and other passive aggressive behaviors to be used as well. These are implemented if someone acts out of line, such as speaking up against a narcissistic individual or behaving in a way that angers them. All right, the next one, Brother Kasafo, please. Yeah, number three, no clear boundaries. In a healthy social system, families included, boundaries are respected and encouraged. Boundaries are what separate one person from another, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. For example, not touching someone without their consent or not invading their personal space without their consent, for example. However, in a narcissistic family, there are very few boundaries. Any and all boundaries are often ignored, and there is a lack of privacy for everyone but the narcissist. This is damaging to a family system because it can create enmeshment trauma. 
Investment trauma is a type of childhood emotional trauma that involves a disregard for personal boundaries and loss of autonomy between individuals. The purpose of enmeshment is to create emotional power and control within the family. Children who experience this may feel like their emotional needs weren't met due to the lack of individuality or proper roles within enmeshed families. This type of over-intimacy can become traumatic when children are exposed to inappropriate situations that adults should protect them from. Additionally, enmeshment trauma can happen when a child is expected to take on adult emotions and responses. It teaches children that their boundaries are, will not be respected and shows them that the world is an unsafe place. This can also cause childhood trauma and additional mental health concerns. Furthermore, it can set children up to be taken advantage of in other interpersonal relationships outside of the family. Right. So you see what it does. It actually, by not allowing or respecting the boundaries of the children, but your boundaries are supposed to be upheld to the utmost, it actually teaches the children that when they go out into the world that they don't have any security. They don't have any boundaries. No one's going to respect them. And eventually that's how their relationships are. That's what was taught in the household. And that if I'm in a relationship, I don't have any boundaries. I can't establish boundaries. And what happens, they get in very toxic relationships where people mistreat them and do whatever they want to them. And then they wonder why because it started in the household. All right, Brother Kassafo, we're ready for the next one. Number four, the surrogate spouse. One of the less known family roles in narcissistic families is the role of the surrogate spouse. This role, usually given to one of the children, exists to support the narcissistic individual's emotional needs. Because of this, the child, who is a surrogate spouse, is often relied on for emotional support and comforting. This places an unfair burden on a child, who is not yet mature enough to handle adult feelings and responsibilities. Children who are surrogate spouses frequently struggle with unresolved anxiety, depression, and self-esteem issues. All right. So this one right here is actually, this one actually formulates a covert narcissist as well. Mm -hmm. By the parent or the, the narcissist parent putting an, a burden upon one of the children where they can't handle it at a young age. This is actually, it goes straight into no clear boundaries and the enmeshment because you're putting adult emotions and, res and responses or responsibilities onto a child that's not ready for them. And usually it's to fulfill what's going on with the adult. So say the adult is struggling with something. They'll say, yes, I just had a, a baby. My baby is my comforter. Now that baby has to fulfill that role of comforting you though that baby is not ready to be a comforter for anyone because the baby has to grow and learn for itself. But that's what you do to the child. And now the child is going to have all these issues, not being able to live up to what you placed upon them. But the Number five, control issues. Narcissists often exhibit control issues within the family unit. All families have different rules and expectations for those within the family. For example, some cultures and older generations expect that children do not question adults, as this is seen as disrespectful. However, 
Respect for elders is much different than the expectations within the narcissistic family systems. In these families, no one can question anything, no matter how dysfunctional, bizarre, or uncomfortable something may be. To question is to undermine the authority of the narcissist, which they take as a threat. Right. So you can't ask any questions. Even if you ask a question, it becomes um, problematic. You're you're the one that's, and they will use anything to show forth why you are wrong. So even if they don't follow the Bible or they don't follow the scriptures, they will use honor your father and your mother. You're not honoring your father and your mother, not actually understanding what honor actually means. Because I'm not supposed to follow you and put you above Elohim to do something that's against the law because you're my father or you're my mother. He that loveth his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So you can actually see how that actually creates a bad system for growth for whoever it is that's growing up in these environments. What do you think about this gossip? What you just said? Just the family dynamic so far. Oh, I understand. <laughs> I understand it is given insight as of the how I ended up being a narcissist. And it's given me understanding of I'm looking forward to watching this lesson again because it's gonna help me correct anything that I was I'm aware of it. Yeah. Like and understand why and how it came to be. Like, yeah. And knowing things that some may be in here that I've been building my children and not realizing. Right. I'm looking for understanding, hey, making sure that not giving them responsibility beyond their age, you know, not putting them in a position to implement the same spirits on them. You know, that part where it said, well, we're supposed to just do what we're told and not say anything. We don't have a voice, like seeing that, seeing how they're taught to being taught to basically cater to one person, you go into the world, you become a doormat. Okay. Right? And you think that's a norm because that's how you've been treated. You don't know how to establish boundaries to even, and you don't know how to establish in the right way because growing up in an environment where all you know is rage, anger, arguing, yelling, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know how to have a conversation with somebody about, hey, this actually hurts my feelings, you know, to... I don't like when you do this, you know, and actually removing yourself when somebody continues to persist in doing something that you don't like after you spoke about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As you grew up being taught now, this, you're being done wrong, you stay there and take it. All right. Yes. And this is for, I don't want people just to think, oh, okay, I'm not a narcissist, so I'm going to discard all this information listen to this information because you don't have to be a narcissist to pick up some of these things there's many people that are not narcissists that are doing some of these things in this lesson and it's actually hurting so take the information that you can and apply it to where you can apply it for your own family structure and your own and yourself so that you can be a better person and actually serve Elohim more fervently. Right. Casa, next one. Not good enough messages. Number six. When a developing child isn't provided with unconditional love and value, the child learns that love from their parent only comes if they are good enough. Narcissistic families continually send the message that the children are not adequate, which contributes to poor self-esteem, self-image, self-respect, and self-compassion. 
They may also be taught that they need the narcissist in order to make decisions or to survive because they are taught that they always mess up when they don't listen to the narcissist and follow their guidance. Right, so there goes the manipulation and the effects of the manipulation. Go ahead, Brother Costa. And see how that makes makes a person incompetent in life. All right. Struggle to handle any responsibility because they've been crippled before they even got out into the world. All right. Number seven, unhealthy competition. In these families, siblings and other family members are often pitted against each other through unhealthy competition. This competition is reinforced through the unhealthy communication, dysfunctional dynamics within the family, and the family roles that are reinforced through the family system. Due to this, many children from these families struggle to develop healthy relationships and attachments with others. So everything is a competition and Unfortunately, you learn to go out in life as everything is a competition and not being able to work or bond with anyone because you look at everyone like you have to be better than them. interesting the further we go into the family dynamic it actually explains the narcissist mindset <laughs> the things develop right the vainglory jealousy envy comparing ourselves amongst ourselves mm -hmm. the lion that's what we're about to go into right now <laughs> number eight Secret keeping. Secrets are one of the major elements of a narcissistic family system. Each member is expected to keep secrets in order to maintain the ideal public image that is protected. The biggest secret is the fact that the family is dysfunctional, which is hidden at every cost. Deception is reinforced through the family roles, manipulation, and denial that is reinforced by all of the family members. So they have to make sure they deny anything. Even if you're asked, like, hey, how was your family growing up? What was going on? Everything was great. Everything was fine. It was lovely. It was perfect. They have to deny and they have to keep it a secret. They can't actually disclose the information because that's what they've been taught their whole life. Hence, keeping them right where they are and keeping the narcissist control over everyone. Alahayim knew what would happen. Why he said we have to confess our iniquities and the iniquities of our fathers. Yep. He knew we would need this to come out of this. He he knew why. He was speaking of the end times. He knew right. what condition we would be in. Wow. Where is Alahayim for this? Number nine, adults are emotionally reactive. Survivors of narcissistic families understand all too well that the adults frequently behave worse than the children. While it is understandable for children to be emotionally reactive, Narcissistic parents often behave this way with limited insight into their behavior and little remorse for how their behaviors affect others. And that is so true. Because the narcissistic parent has the free will to do everything without being corrected, without anyone speaking of it. They have the right and a lot of times they use, this is my house, and you live in my house, and they use that to justify the wrongs that they're doing, 
though that doesn't justify the wrongs that they're doing. And they have little remorse for things that they do and how it affects others. It's very hard for them to get them to apologize. It's very hard to get them to, to change or to take accountability. Though it's something that may have hurt you very bad. anything? The wrath and anger. It's a tough environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the anger blinds the mind with the net of deceit to be justified in whatever's done. And can't see a family member, can't see a friend, can't see a child, can't see anybody with love. It's just want to stay in that position. The effects, because this it ain't something that started from just that parent. They came up in some rough environment or had some rough experience that they did not forgive somebody for or forgive themselves for. And they're carrying these emotions. It's affecting everybody. Yeah. All right, Kath, I'm ready for you. Okay. Number 10. Blackmail is common. Not surprising. Your feelings and things you do can and will be used against you. Vulnerabilities will be exploited to further the narcissist's control. If a child shares that they are scared or embarrassed, this can be used against them as a way to establish dominance and remind the child who is in control. A child may have shared information with a parent in confidence, only for it to be used publicly to ridicule them as punishment for a recent mishap. Children are then humiliated and realize that even their parents were cruel and unsafe, creating either a trauma or building up a covert narcissist. Because you don't feel safe anywhere. So what happens is that's when the covert narcissist actually starts forming more because they actually feel unsafe everywhere. Everyone else is the problem. Let's go more into inside internalize everything right or the world within right the world is a problem the world is cruel the world is mean and even my family that i'm right here with is cruel and mean i have no one except myself and then that stops from letting anybody in Right. Nobody gets close. As they talked about, uh, uh, the narcissist can't have any real relationships. Mm -hmm. I understand it. All right. Now let's get the signs of a narcissistic parent. Uh, signs of a narcissistic parent may include constant disappointment. If the parent expresses consistent disappointment, no matter the child's achievements. Physical absence. A covert narcissist may not be interested in being physically present with their child. For example, events and graduations may appear entirely unimportant to them. Emotional absence. If a covert narcissist parent is physically present, they may not be emotionally present. They may often ignore their child by limiting communication. Comparing a child to others. A covert narcissist parent may routinely state that a child lacks worth if they are not as successful, smart, strong, athletic, or wealthy as others. Anger when children need attention. Because of enduring self-centeredness, 
A narcissist will become annoyed or irritated when their child needs time or attention, even for serious medical matters. Exploiting children for personal gain. A narcissist will find ways to benefit from their child, whether financially, at work, or in relationships. Their child essentially becomes a bargaining tool or a trophy to brag about their accomplishments. All right. And we're going to go into that in Sirach later on in the lesson. So you can actually see these are the things that Alahine was telling us not to do. So what parents should be doing? Listening and caring to show forth their love. We're here to raise our kids to serve Elohim, not ourselves. Not to control them, but we teach them by being examples to listen to them and actually care what they have to say and how they feel. While relationships with others and a parent differs in regards to obedience, giving your kids the same love being without partiality Though tending to their individuality, we have to give them understanding and encourage them to go in the right way. But we also have to humble ourselves being parents to know the right way to go ourselves. And that's where being an example of a believer comes in so that they don't follow our hypocrisy and pick up our works of error. Brother Kothoff, can we read Acts of Thomas chapter 12, please? Sure. One moment. <clears throat> Acts of Thomas chapter 12. It says, Yache speaking. Remember, my children, what my brother said to you and to whom he commended you. And know that if you refrain from this filthy intercourse, you become temples holy and pure, being released from afflictions and troubles, known and unknown. And you will not be involved in the cares of life and of children, whose end is destruction. But if you get many children, for their sakes you will become grasping and avaricious plundering orphans and deceiving widows. And by doing this, you subject yourselves to most grievous punishments. For most children become unprofitable being possessed by demons, some openly and some secretly. For they become either lunatics or half withered or crippled or deaf or dumb or paralytics or idiots. And though they be healthy, they will be again good for nothing, doing unprofitable and abominable works. For they will be detected either in adultery, or in murder, or in theft, or in unchastity. And by all these you will be afflicted. But if you obey and preserve your souls pure to Allah, there will be born to you living children untouched by these harmful things and you will be without care spending an untroubled life free from grief and care looking forward to receive that incorruptible and true marriage and you will enter as groomsmen into the bridal chamber full of immortality and light All right. so we get to see why it's so important for the parents to actually see themselves and actually change and implement the changes so that they can help their children. If the parents don't see the change or don't see the things that needful for change and don't accept and take accountability for what they're doing and what they have going on in their life, then it makes it harder for the, the children. And it also puts the parent in a predicament where they are struggling for their own soul and struggling for their own salvation. So it's very important for the parents 
to actually get a hold of this and understand this and actually put forth the strength and the encouragement to actually change and take accountability. Amen. The angel of repentance, seeing as though this is essential for us because we see in whether we are narcissists or not, we may be seeing traits that we've been doing or things that we've been affecting our family with and repentance. The angel of repentance told Hermas that if you be prospered, then your family will prosper. But if you're afflicted, your family will also be afflicted. So it is essential as parents to get a grip get a hold of life and get understanding and come out of these things not for our sakes only but for everyone involved <clears throat> and for any parent that's in the gospel you have to be very careful for breaking the law to cater to your children that will put you in a very bad place so be on guard for that, to keep the commandments no matter what. All right. We got two more parts, and then we're going into the scriptures. Um, platonic relationships. Platonic relationships with a covert narcissist would look similar to romantic relationships with one in that these feel entirely one-sided. The narcissist will maneuver most of the attention and energy toward themselves to fill their narcissistic supply. The signs of covert narcissists in a platonic relationship include emotionally draining others. Spending time with a covert narcissist is draining because they often share deep emotions of anxiety and depression to get further attention through sympathy. Lack of generosity. Narcissists only focus on meeting their own needs and wants, making them appear restrictive with their energy, resources, and attention. Being overly critical. Covert narcissists are frequently quick to point out flaws and imperfection in others to distract from their own flaws. And these are things that a covert narcissist or narcissist may say all together, um, or either a covert or overt narcissist. When their behavior does not help when identifying a covert narcissist, what they say can. At times, the things covert narcissists say will make their status and narcissistic qualities quite clear. Right. So these are things that both an over and covert narcissist may say, but these things will definitely give you an identifier when dealing with the covert narcissist. Below are common things a narcissist might say. I don't know what you're talking about. You're being too sensitive and dramatic. You're lucky I'm so kind and patient with you. Can't you bother someone else with this? I'm doing important things and can't be bothered with your thoughts and feelings. You probably forgot. You always misunderstand what I say. Why aren't you paying more attention to me? All right. So these are things you probably may hear a lot when dealing with one. All right. So let's get into this. Let's get into business. So if narcissism is a new ailment, and it's in the scriptures, the first thing we got to remember is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. The things that have been... It is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So we're going to find in the scriptures where there were narcissists, and let's see how they operated. Let's see what they were doing. 
so that we can actually understand and get more understanding through the scriptures. Can we read First Kings chapter 21, verse 4, please? Sure. First Kings chapter 21, verse 4. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased. Did you want to give the backstory of what this was, or are you going to give it after I read it? Yes. Okay. So Ahab desired a vineyard that Naboth owned. And Ahab went to Naboth to speak to him about getting the vineyard that Naboth owned, but Naboth was unwilling to sell his vineyard. So this is Ahab's reaction to Naboth telling him no. Okay. Okay. First Kings 21 verse 4. When Ahab came into his house, heavy and displeased because the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would not eat bread. Right. So we get to see an example of proud wrath from the pride lesson. Right, so now we're about to start putting all these different things together to formulate the whole understanding so we can understand these things truly, spiritually. So we're seeing an example of pride wrath from the pride lesson getting vexed when not getting what he wanted and envy taking control to languish in sorrow. Hence, he was not eating. Just as Cain's self-will to fulfill a desire against the law, then wrath and sorrow to go to work when desire is unfulfilled and hatred for the good doers stirs up as Cain hated Abel for speaking truth. So Ahab hated the man for speaking truth by the law in regards to the land because he said he wasn't going to give the inheritance of his fathers because that's what the inheritance of his fathers was the land and the boss desired it. A scorner or a proud person loveth not one that reproveth him. So you see, he got a no. He was told no. And as we see, as a narcissist, they can't accept no. They can't accept not getting their way. All right. So let's see what Ahab is actually going to do. All right. Can we continue, Brother Kassel? Hmm. Verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Well, you can see in anger, he had his peculiar vision and made the story to fit his narrative to justify his actions to be correct. He felt he suffered loss because he didn't get what he wanted, though he had no right to it. So he was vexed unto wrath with lying, using the deception or the manipulation to attempt to get his way as anger used anything it can to fulfill its desires. And you can actually see his entitlement, right? And we're going to go on to see who he was surrounded with, what type of people he had around him that actually was going to either correct or solidify him with his own desires. All right. Continue, Brother Cosmos. Verse... Seven. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. All right. So you see, this is this is interesting because this is, we're actually going to go into the story, but you can actually see when Jezebel said, do it thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread and let thy heart be merry. Doesn't that sound familiar to something else we heard before? 
Remember when Eve was told that Allah am envied her and that the enemy said that he was going to protect her from Allah am? It's the same enemy talking. Let thy heart be merry. Like, you have nothing to be upset about. I would get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So we see Jezebel strengthening Ahab's desires and not correcting him, being his enabler. So we actually get to see the enabler. The same spirit that was working in Ahab kindled in her. Wrath is provoked by a word to justify itself. She heard something that didn't please him. So lifted herself up in proud wrath to take matters into her own hands to please Ahab as wrath aids in lawlessness and anger gives the body power to work iniquity. Next comes the lie as lying always goes with wrath at the right hand of Satan that with cruelty and lying his deeds may be wrought. The hateful pride is at work too because hatred constantly mates with lying, and the lying tongue hates those that are afflicted by it. And that's what Kasafo explained earlier, is that when you lie to someone, it's encompassed with hatred. You actually hate the person that you're lying to. Huh? Brother Kasafo? That touches back to the unable to have real friendships or real relationships. Kind of, you can't truly love somebody when you can't be honest with them, to be right. vulnerable with them, to keep it real. Right. You can't truly love them and you can't really form that relationship. Everything is very surface level mm -hmm. because you're literally feeding their ego. And that's the basis of the relationship. I'm going to feed your ego. I'm going to enable you and say that everything you're doing is right and that you're not doing anything wrong. And innately, we never formed a true relationship that was healthy. Everything had a motive. No simplicity, no guilelessness. Right. <clears throat> Verse 8. So... She wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. So we actually see before she even got started, that wrath mating with lion had already started. She wrote letters in Ahab's name right out the gate. And she wrote in the letter, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him, to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme Elohim and the king, and then carry him out and stone him, that he may die. All right, so we get to see narcissistic rage. We get to see narcissistic rage at work. All right, Brother Kasafo, continue. Yeah, and no empathy, as you no said. Empathy. Ahab, that he he knowing full well the man didn't do no wrong to him, but he's with it. He's not saying no anything. Too. Yeah. No empathy. Verse 11. And the men of his city... Even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants of his city did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. You mentioned how people want to stay in the good graces of the overt narcissist, so they'll do whatever. They want to make sure to please the king. And well, Jezebel, in this respect, I do. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, 
in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme Elohim and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. You got to remember, too. Remember, they were going to rituals. Yeah, they, they did. She wants to get what they want. She went to the children of Belial to go get what she wanted. Children of the devil. Wow. Went to idolaters. It's going to make sense in a moment. Right, keep going, Brother Costco, please. Bro. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, and to take possession of it. So you also see the lack of empathy right there as well. He didn't even think twice that the man died unrighteously. Yeah. He was just happy to get what he wanted. And he felt he was done wrong. Anger gave him his own peculiar vision. Right. And he's willing to do anything to get what he wants. Yeah. No matter who has to hurt, get hurt or die for it. Which, of course, these people, these people were in, in high levels of narcissism. Um, so you get to really see how far it can go. Yeah. You know? On a lower level, remember a person that withholds the wages, they are shed of blood. Right. So they would like have money for you. Say you did work for them. They know they owe you, but they have things they want to buy for themselves. They're not going to pay you. They're going to go do, take care of what they need to take care of and tell you, you know, whatever they need to tell you to keep you from asking about it or you just have to wait to get paid or if you get paid by the person. So there's high level and there's lower level in everyday, you know, business where people are shed as a blood. They are killing people by not paying them what they do, you know? <clears throat> you can continue on. You're ready, Brother Cosmo, on 25. All right. But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of Ahiah, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. All right. So you see, he's working wickedness, just like we talked about earlier. And now you have two narcissists, and one is enabling the other. So it is possible to have two narcissistic parents. All right. Now, let's understand what's leading them. You don't mind continuing, Brother Kasapa, please. So, oh, verse 26, and he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom Ahiah cast out before the children of Israel. So, we get to see the spiritual, that following idols is the cause of narcissism. Yes, sir. All right. So we get to see it's, it's a whole bunch of idols that they're actually following. And that's what's actually leading them that they can't see. And we're going to continue to go in. We're going to get a full understanding today so that we can understand these things and come out of them. Let's see if that's another example. Let's jump over to 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 6. And let's see if we can get another example in Ahab. We want to continue to see, because Ahab is continuing to live his life here. So we get to see another example of where he may have another experience. First Kings chapter 22, verse 6. 
Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of Ahiah besides, that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of Ahiah, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Right. So even Jehoshaphat corrected him. He said, Let not the king say so. So you actually get to see Jehoshaphat actually trying to do what's right. And actually, he actually did look for a prophet of Elohim. So Jehoshaphat just so happened to be lukewarm, but he was trying to do something that's right. But we also see the king of Israel, Ahab, not wanting to be corrected or able to take criticism from Micaiah. So you see how he's like, I hate him. So you already see the hatred working because he corrects him. Let's continue, Brother Kassafu, please. First Kings chapter 22, verse 13. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. All right, so we got to remember that the overt narcissist desire for control and admiration according to their pleasure and struggle to receive correction gives place for vainglory and self-pleasing. Arrogant to be superior, controlling others to fulfill what pleases the person. And also, we have to remember the overt narcissist will even instruct you in ways they prefer to be praised or what to be praised for. So we see it with Ahab when he said, let thy word be like one of them. So you can see he's actually instructing Micaiah how to actually do well in his sight, actually give him what he wants. Let's continue with verse 15, please. Yeah. You had something, Castle? I said he was trying to make him an enabler. Right. Mm -hmm. Verse 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for Ahiah shall deliver it into the hand of the king. So we get to see here that Micaiah stonewalling Elohim Michael of the stonewall and he was being very vague with Ahab he said go and prosper he didn't say what was going to happen he said the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king he didn't say them he was very specific with his answer and he was he was stonewalling okay Go ahead, Brother Cosmo. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of Ahiah? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills, as sheep that have no shepherd. And Ahiah said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? So you get to see the evil perverseness is an act of fornication which causes one to make void the law, as we see in the Testament of Levi, chapter 16. It says, And ye shall make void the law, and set it not the words of the prophets by evil perverseness. And ye shall persecute righteous men and hate the holy 
and the words of the faithful shall ye abhor. So we actually get to see that when it's against what a narcissist wants or desires, it's hard for them to receive it. All right, so we're just learning here in the scriptures so that we can get examples in the scriptures of how this is portrayed, how this is exercised. All right, can we jump to uh, verse 19, Brother Kasifo, please? Oh. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of Ahiah. I saw Ahiah sitting upon his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by him, on his right hand and on his left. And Ahiah said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit, and stood before Ahiah and said, I will persuade him. And Ahiah said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth. And I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. Now therefore, behold, Ahiah had put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and Ahiah has spoken evil concerning thee. All right. So remember, Elohim deals with us the way we operate towards others. Remember Psalms 18 and 26, with the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. So you see, Elohim is actually dealing with Ahab the way that Ahab deals with other people. All right, let's continue, Brother Kalta Fo, in verse 24, please. 22, verse 24 of 1 Kings. But Zedekiah, the son of Canaanah, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the spirit of Ahiah from me to speak unto thee? So we see Ahab, we see the people he's surrounding himself with. We see he's surrounding himself with enablers and other narcissists. So we get to see the narcissistic rage, even in uh, Zedekiah, or you went and smote him. Like, you can see the narcissistic rage coming out of the people that's surrounding Ahab. And you can see the enablers around him. So he's surrounding himself with people like himself. Yeah. Continue, Brother Kasifu, please. And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in peace. Right. So we see he's punishing Micaiah according to what was sufficient punishment according to himself. Remember when the narcissist's shortcomings are pointed out by someone or they're corrected, they feel an overwhelming sense of shame. The rage is executed to seek revenge upon the accuser. The need for revenge results in explosive rage and does not die down until the narcissist feels the person would dealt appropriate punishment. Right. Verse 28, and Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, I have not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. So you, we can see, we can see that that deceit by outward appearance, the same deceit that he operates within. And he actually was trying to get Jehoshaphat killed so that Jehoshaphat would fall and he would live. 
So you can see that lack of empathy still again. Like you put on your robes. So if they come for you, then you're going to die. But I'm going to live. I'm going to look like this. So I'm going to disguise myself. So it's, it's the same thing. Go ahead, Brother Kasifo, please. But the king of Syria commanded his 30 and two captains that had rule over his chariot, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. Unfortunately, Narcissus don't have a perception that it's Elohim viewing their inclinations, but instead seek to be seen in the sight of men. But yet, you can't hide from Elohim. When Elohim cast his judgment that's it no matter how much deception or how much you can deceive men you can't deceive Elohim let's continue in First uh, Kings 22 and 32 please and it came to pass when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat they said surely it is the king of Israel and they turned aside to fight against him and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when the captain of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. So you see how a lion works? A certain man drew the bow, bow, and he wasn't even trying to hit the king. It ended up hitting the king because it was a lion's will. So we have to be very mindful that it's a lion. For, for anyone dealing with narcissism, that it's a lion looking on your inclination. It's Elohim looking on your thoughts, looking on your intentions to actually have that reasoning to then stand aloof from what you're doing. Because only through Elohim can a person overcome narcissism. You can't overcome narcissism from the world. It's only through Elohim's law, Elohim's fruits of the spirit, Elohim's spirit that actually will allow a person to come out of narcissism. So was it prophesied that we would be in this condition and battling with such spirits in the end times, such as narcissism? All right. Can we jump into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, please? Sure. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Know this also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Right? So we have the first one. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Right? So that's self-pleasing. Conceited. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. So that's where it's about me. Everything is about me and getting what I want, getting my own desires met. What's the word? Um, Self-conceit. It's self-centered. I love myself. It's all about me. All right. What's the next one? Covetous. Covetous. We see that's a major thing for a narcissist. Being covetous. Not being okay or content with what Allah has given unto you, but always looking for what the next man has or what you don't have. What do we have next? Boasters. Boasters. Now, this is more pertaining to an overt narcissist, but covert narcissists can also be boasters. It's the same. The next one is proud. Now, <clears throat> everything about a narcissist is proud. Everything is about pride. Vainglory. 
hateful uh, pride, proud right. man, prideful sorrow, the yep. deception, the guile, the dis the manipulation, the ability to seduce. Manipulate. Yeah. Having power over people. Um, um this what was the word? Um listing themselves up in in diminishing others. All pride. Right, some next blasphemers. Blasphemers. Now this one's interesting because they become blasphemers of the law when it doesn't align with their own desires. So they actually will blaspheme the law if they are attempting to look good in the sight of men to keep the law. They will blaspheme it when it's convenient. Disobedient to parents, right? And you see why that one is, because if you can't tell me anything, I'm not going to respect my parent either. They can't tell me anything either, because I want what I want, no matter who it is. And that's that anger and hatred, because they can't see a parent. They can't see a son. They can't see a daughter. They can't see a friend. So they're going to be disobedient to parents, too. Unthankful. Unthankful. Everything is gimme, gimme, gimme. So they're not thankful for the things that they receive. If I'm constantly coveting other things, I'm not thankful for the things that I have. So I am unthankful. Because if I was thankful for what Elohim had given unto me, I wouldn't be looking for what he had given unto others or trying to compare myself. I would be thankful for what I have and where I am in my life so that I continue to grow from where I am so that I can become a better person. So I'm not thankful. A, a narcissist is not thankful for who they are. They're not thankful for what they have. So unfortunately, they become unthankful in all things and covetous. Unholy. Unholy. They're unholy because they're not keeping the law. They're literally breaking the law when it's convenient or or casting away the law altogether because it doesn't fit any of their desires. Without natural affection? Without natural affection, they don't have empathy. But empathy is a natural affection. Not being able to see how something is affecting someone and see how they feel and how it, it impacts them. I don't have, that's not natural affection. If I do something and I can't process how someone feels by what I'm doing, then my natural affection is gone. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Truce breakers. Truce breakers. So they'll agree to something and break it when it's not convenient. Or they agree to something, and once they see what it really entails, they'll break off and say, no, I'm not doing that. All right? So they they break truces. Their word is, is not. Um, it's not something you can trust. And remember, it said, as so much as they're trusting idols, they lightly forswear themselves and look not to be hurt. So, All right. One can say whatever, agree to whatever, and with the manipulation, say what you want to hear at the time or change their mind. And it's nothing that can happen. They feel nothing can happen from that idolatry. 
Have we went over that in another lesson? That scripture? Well, yeah, we did in the pride lesson. About... Okay. All right. So we'll we'll give that. The pride lesson, if you want to go into that, that truth, truth breakers. Yeah. Um, false accusers. Right. So remember what we learned about narcissists? They will create their own um, accusations and they will create their own reality uh, based off of how they feel or how they would go about something. And then they are projected onto you. False accusing, false accusation. Incontinent. So incontinent means no self-restraint. So they literally can't restrain themselves from wanting what they want or trying to get what they want to get. There's no restraint. They're not able to be content because the covetousness makes them incontinent because they don't have any restraint, nor are they thankful to be appreciative for what they have, to be able to exercise self-restraint. Fierce. Narcissistic rage. Fierce. Despise of those that are good. All right. So see, first and foremost, they target those that are good. Because that's who they want to be. So first and foremost, they're targeting a good person because that's what they want to be. So they feel like they deserve to be with a good person. And then they mimic you, they mirror you, and then lift themselves up against you as if they're better than you. So they're despising those that are good. Go ahead, Kasa. But you talked about um, the Proverbs verse said, a lying tongue hated those afflicted by it, and he that dissembleth with his lips worketh ruin. It says despisers of those that are good. So they hate that good person. And the narcissist lesson here, it talked about how they see good qualities in a person and a narcissist wants those good qualities or desires to have them. So they, they come in deceit. They're lying. They're going to mimic it. The mirroring stage, we're going to put on the qualities to reel you in and it's dissembling with his lips. So it's work and ruin. It's all a plot to actually lock you in and then take you down. Right. So it's um, eventually it was the process we talked about earlier. They want to get you out of that goodness. Whatever good quality you had, they want to, the spirit at work wants to take it down. He hates to see good works, any righteousness, so any good fruits. So they're going to work to get you out of that thing and get you into sorrow and depression because it's the devil in the, in the root of it, the idols, you know. They're working against the servants of Elohim. Yeah. So, pride wants to be superior like you're you're being good you're witnessing against the works of pride so the spirits gather together to take you down hmm. you ready for the next one I am traitors All right so Traitor or betrayer. So they literally, just like Kasifo was just expressing, they come one way and then they're actually secretly coming to tear you down, which is actually a traitor. Which Kasifo actually explained that one. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> to go into it, all of it, but he went into the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely that's a traitor someone that comes to betray they come to betray they come acting one way but they have another um 
what's the word? Um, agenda. Agenda. Thank you. You can go ahead, brother Carson. Hetty. Hetty. Hetty is rash. That goes into narcissistic rage. So they're very rash. They can't take criticism. So they end up getting into fits of anger. And they get heady. They get very rash. Just like when they're sitting there listening to you. When you may be um, speaking of something. Waiting for what you're going to say. Seeing what you're going to say. Because they're already heading into a, a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. They're being rash. Instead of just sitting there with self-restraint and actually listening to you to get an understanding of what you're saying, they're looking for what you're going to say that's going to trigger them. High-minded. High-minded. Another form of pride. Um, right? To inflate with self-conceit. So we can see how high-minded is one of the main focuses for narcissists is to self-conceit or to be high-minded of themselves, to feel like they're better than everyone else. You got anything on high-minded, Casa? No, you'd be remembering stuff. Yeah, so the, the high mind is because, like, for the covert, there's the inward feeling of being better than everyone else. So, and in the wickedness of it, being smarter than everyone else to get over on them, using right. the different tactics, or thinking smarter than everyone else to get over on them, using the different tactics to get an advantage, different manipulation tactics. All right, I think that they they feel like they're smarter and they they're getting over, and that people are. And they usually go for people that are not aware of their manipulation. Yeah. Empath, not familiar. They spoke on that. They're empaths, so they're not familiar with um manipulation. So right. looking for gullible people, basically. Not, see, in both that, you have the covert uses seduction through feelings, whereas the overt uses seduction through the outward show and material or whatever worldly gain or persona. So both aspects. It's a really high sense of being so, wise. Yeah, being wise in our own conceits. And using it for gain, using it to fulfill desires or to get an advantage. And I think that was in the Psalms. Um, the proud persecuted the poor. And let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Mm -hmm. Experience of pride in the narcissism. Then you have lovers of pleasures more than lovers of Allah. Right. So you see, they put themselves first. You see, their desires are before Allah. No matter what they want, it's more important. And they'll forsake the law when it comes to getting what they want, if they are intending to keep the law. And many of them are not. They can't conform to the law because their pleasures, they love their pleasures more than Allah. So you can see the true struggle of a narcissist. Really, and it really becomes a true struggle when they actually try to actually keep the law and actually do right. Because they have to battle with their love of their pleasures, that it's greater than Allah I am. And they have to battle that and try to overcome that. Amen. That's the truth. That division really comes, you really see the fight when we're going to get out of it. Right. Because lust pulls, lust, we talked about in the prior lesson, how lust entices, deludes. Controls you. Yeah. And that's another process for, you see, the narcissism is built in pride, fornication, 
anger, hatred, lust, covetousness, essentially, and envy. You work into come out of this thing, the next step, okay, I decide, okay, I don't want to be this person. I go to step forward. As we talked about in the briars, I'm going to have to get cut. I'm coming out of iniquity. Pride doesn't like to get cut. The narcissist doesn't like any faults to be revealed. So that's a process in itself to have to acknowledge because lust pulls. Oh, lust just got me there. Am I going to go into the stay in the narcissism and try to make it somebody else's fault mm -hmm. or get in my feelings and get down so that I can just turn it and not have to deal with it? Or I'm going to choose the humility because I really want to get to this love of Allah. I am confess my fault and keep pressing to overcome, reach out to the counselor to find out, Hey, what do I need to do in this situation? I have to, the narcissist doesn't like the fake persona to be exposed. I have to be willing to say, Hey, I know that's a fake persona. I don't want that persona. Hey, I'm calling to talk to you about who I really am and what I really have going on. I need help with this man that I am. That is for a narcissist, that really takes cleaving and it takes work. God, the humility it takes is when narcissism and humility don't mix. So the spirit of pride, anger that we've been talking about is praise Allah for the buildup to see what it's going to take to come out of these things. And as you're saying, that love of pleasure, the love of whatever it is that, you know, I grew up having pleasure and giving my reins onto being quick to do it too, being heady to do it, being quick to react. It takes work, humility to keep pressing, to keep calling it out, to keep working, to keep believing. And that's, it's, it's, it's work. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What's the next one? Having a form of holiness, but denying the power thereof mm -hmm. from such turn away. That's the facade. It is. That's the fake person that everybody was. That's that's the one I was showing to everybody there. Right. That's the one. I, that's the person I want you to see. The idealization. Yeah. But denying the power thereof within, like Levi said, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Mm -hmm within and fruits of the spirit right there and that's a truth a person has to come to that's been been seeing growth and being honest in that respect like hey jacob said what he said instruments of cruelty are in my habitation so me internalizing things that's not wise i have to stay out from getting into myself rather casting cares on allah i am Seeking his law, seeking his judgments, asking him to change my thoughts, give me the right thoughts, as you talked with me about before. Control my heart, control my mind, control my body to really come out of it and examine it by the law. That's yeah. why I'm telling you, our law, the law is literally the, the word I'm looking for, it's the foundation, it is the it's the it's the boundary. Our law, the law of Alahim is the boundary. So if you're not going according to that boundary, then you're going according to another law. So you're denying the power thereof if you're not actually submitting yourself to the law. If you can walk according to your own holiness or your own desires that are contrary to the law, then you have a form of holiness because that self-righteousness is a form of holiness. But you're denying the power of Allah by not actually bestowing yourself to Allah law and the fruits of the spirit.
The next verse goes into the idealization phase you talked about. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, 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 it's in here. Of such turn away. It's interesting. Allah is actually warning us of a narcissist. He said, from such turn away. Because if it's not ordained for Allah to deliver them, they're going to destroy you. If it's not ordained for Allah to deliver them, they're going to destroy you. So turn away. If you run into someone that's operating like this and Allah didn't show you some dream or he didn't give you some understanding of who that person was and that he was going to deliver them, do not take it upon yourself to go and try to deliver a person that is struggling with narcissism. That's why we discuss the necessary situations for separation. Right. There comes a time, right? It is what it is. Because even a lion resists the proud, like he understands. You want to continue, Brother Kostafo? Sure. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. All right, so you can see how the narcissist picks their people, picks who they're looking for. They creep into houses and lead away silly women laden with sins. So they can see, they can see your issues. And they know their own issues. They can see, a lot of times, they can see their own issues. They're just not coming out of it. They have too much pleasure in it. So they'll see the lust. They'll see the sins that you may be walking in. And as soon as they see that you're silly, which means that you're susceptible to their manipulation and their tactics, then they got you. They're coming. What do you have, Brother Gospel? I saw, along with what you're saying, that was the um, the idea. The, what is it? The idealization phase? Stage? The ideology stage? That's yeah, it. Before that, I think that's when they're picking the candidate. Well, I I thought they were picking America. They, they creep in. They come in with the form of holiness. So I, I they slipped in having a persona looking good, looking like what you would think holiness is, mirroring what you would think it is. And they see it's a silly person. So they're playing them. And they're leading them captive. Like, I'm, I'm about to get you. Eventually, you're seduced. Now, they're going to keep you from getting to the knowledge of the truth. As you mentioned, they're going to destroy the person. All right. I didn't know you were going to go back a verse. I thought I was just talking about six, but I got you. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. And unfortunately, a, a person like this is ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because they're seeing everyone's hypocrisy. And because they're seeing everyone's hypocrisy, they're not going to change from what they're doing. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because they're they're learning, they're, they're learning of the things that's right and good. But you have to understand that, that a narcissist is comparing themselves to everyone. They're a respecter of persons. They want to be seen good in the sight of men and not good in the sight of Allah Hayyam. So... They have that form of holiness, and that form of holiness is enough. Because that's how people are perceiving them. But to Allah, they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
to see that they actually have to sincerely be doing things. They actually have to have the fruits of the Spirit in their heart and have to hold on to them always and have to practice self-restraint not to come out of the law and the fruits of the Spirit. Not to give in to their own desires. Not to put themselves first. See the contradiction. And we're actually going to get into why they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We're actually going to go into the scriptures and show what Allah is doing against them to cause them not to be able to, to see or understand. Can we read um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, please, Brother Cosimo? Sure. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Hold on. There's some, some stuff right there. Yes, go ahead, please. So it looks like we got another example. Because Alahayim doesn't just do things unintentionally. Looks like we have Janus and Jambres who are actually dealing with narcissism. After he said all those things about a narcissist, he said Janus and Jambres, how they withstood Moses. All the things that Moses did in the sight of the people, and they still didn't believe. They still wanted what they wanted. Having a form of holiness, but denying the power thereof. Love is a pleasure. It's more than Allah Hayyam. And he says, so do these also resist the truth. So we get to see that narcissists actually resist the truth. That's why they create an idealization of themselves. And then they also create another idealization unto their spouse. And then they project, they project idealizations, accusations, they mirror. Everything is a lie. Yeah. They literally resist the truth. Anything that's the truth, it's hard for them to bear. Or hard for them to receive. Criticism, which is the truth. Correction, which is the truth. All these different things, it's hard for them to, to comprehend. It's hard for them to accept. So now we understand that they resist the truth and they love a lie. And Yache is the truth. That's the part that really hits it home, is that they actually resist Yache. Because Yache is knocking at the door, as Revelation states, trying to get in. But the narcissist is actually resisting him. Because there's more pleasure in the lies than actually taking accountability and actually putting on the truth of Allah Hayyam. Speaking the truth in their own heart as something 15 states. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Reprobate concerning the faith. And we're gonna get into these things because we're gonna we're gonna actually dig into those things very, very clearly to understand exactly what is being said here. 
Katha, if you don't mind, continue reading in verse 3 and 9, please. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Right. So you see how Allah is going to deal with the narcissist. Because they want everything to be in secret, Allah is going to bring everything out. And that's what's going to save them. Which is interesting. Allah said, they shall proceed no further, and their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, even as theirs was also Janus and John Briss. So because they, everything is secrecy and everything is private and, and they try to do everything where nobody can see them, nobody can see their faults, nobody can see what's going on, and then they want to manipulate so that everyone else is the problem, so they can continue being who they are and doing what they're doing. Allah is watching the whole thing. And Allah is going to bring everything to the light. And it's not to embarrass them. It's to save them. It's to save them to come out of the darkness and into the light of Allah that they may no more walk in secrecy but they shall truly conform their works unto good and not just have a form of holiness but actually bow themselves down to the powers thereof to bow down themselves to one greater than themselves. To actually see that Allah is greater. And to truly learn humility and lowliness of mind and heart and soul that they can serve Allah and not serve themselves. So you can understand why their sins have to come before everyone because they spent their whole life trying to hide it and also trying to deceive Allah. For us as believers, we have to understand the people we came in contact with being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Paying attention to the changes in facial appearance and countenance. So we have to be mindful and understand the people that we're coming in contact with so that we can understand how to operate and be at peace with everyone. Can we read Sirach chapter 25, verse 16 and 17, please, Brother Kassel? Sure. Sirach 25, verse 16. I had rather dwell with a lion and a dragon than to keep house with a wicked woman. The wickedness of a woman changeth her face and darkeneth her countenance like sackcloth. Right. Now, the reason we're touching on this is because when usually when you when a narcissist goes into a, a narcissistic rage or when they're actually going through a narcissistic collapse, you actually can pay attention to their face and their countenance because they get darkened because the spirits, more spirits are coming. And it's actually, they're actually getting overtaken right before your face. Can we look at the Testament of Simeon, chapter 5, verse 1, so we can get more understanding on this? Sure. Testament of Simeon, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore was Joseph comely in appearance and goodly to look upon, because no wickedness dwelt in him. For some... Of the trouble of the spirit, the face manifested. Right. So we can see when the, the spirit is troubled, it manifests in the face, just as Sirach 25 spoke of. And now, my children, make your hearts good before the Lord and your way straight before men. And ye shall find grace before the Lord and men. 
Beware, therefore, of fornication, for fornication is mother of all evils, separating from Allahayim and bringing near to Belier. Right. And that's very, very, very key. So now we get to see all of this ties with fornication. Narcissism ties with fornication. Fornication is the mother of all evil, separating from Elohim. So we see that narcissist or narcissism is actually you being separated from Elohim. And these spirits are actually overtaking, these idols are overtaking you and leading you unto Belier. So you see how someone suffering from these things can seem to only care about themselves or some gain has to be had for them, whether praise or admiration or just having their way in situations, not considering the reasoning to put and keep Elohim first. Got anything on that, Kasi? I thought you said it well. The it all ties it ties back with the fornication, looking at it from the spiritual part, the idolatry. We've seen with Ahab that he was he sold himself. There was one part at that time we were reading them verses. It says he followed idols and he also sold himself. And I remember from the pride lesson, uh the covetous man, he setteth his soul to sale. And casteth out, casteth away his bowels. So he'll sell his soul to the devil and he won't have any mercy. Ahab was of the same thing from being in that pride through the covetousness. It's real deal given over to the devil. Like this narcissism, whether covert, overt, it's the devil at work in it mm -hmm. for real, separating from Allahim through the works of what fornication teaches separating from the law, not having compassion on a neighbor, the lack of empathy, you know, um, robbeth the soul of all goodness. Like there's no pleasing a narcissist. It's no matter what you do, you're not going to make them happy because the covetousness is there. Real deal. And we have to make our hearts good. And our way straight. We have to make our heart. It's interesting that he, Simeon, understanding fornication, was teaching us to correct ourselves before Allah first, who's looking within us, start looking at the inclination, knowing that he's watching us, because he said, make your hearts good before the Lord and your way straight before men. So in heart, be focused on him, doing good to him, and straighten your paths, come out of the hypocrisy before men. Be real. Come on, the facades. And that will bring us away from Belier and fornication through truth and faith and fear towards Allah from the heart. But yes, uh, <laughs> uh, let's look at the scriptures of a narcissistic woman. Let's jump over to Sirach 25 and 18. Sirach 25 and 18. Her husband shall sit among his neighbors, and when he heareth it, shall sigh bitterly. All wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Let the portion of a sinner fall upon her. As the climbing up a sandy way is to the feet of the aged, so is a wife full of words to a quiet man. All right. So you have an aged man trying to climb up sand. Once the sand is moving down, he's going up. So he's not moving anywhere. Right? He's just stuck in a place, technically. So is a wife full of words to a quiet man. The man is quiet. He's peaceful. And the woman is coming and she's not of peace. And she's not she's not um 
thankful. She's not content. She's not um, able to have self-control or temperance. Or natural affection. Uh, right, with our natural affection. She's not empathetic. All right, so we get to see where this is going to take her and how a man should deal with this. Continue, Brother Cos. Stumble not at the beauty of a woman and desire her not for pleasure. A woman, if she maintain her husband, is full of anger, impudence, and much reproach. And all those are things of a narcissist. Anger, narcissistic rage, much reproach. That's part of narcissism. Um, you remember what impudent is? I gotta look at I gotta look at the word. No. Impudent. Not showing due respect for another person. Well, she doesn't have respect for the person. That's arrogance, ain't it? Yeah. That's that definitely arrogance. Right. So you can see the anger, you can see the arrogance, and then you can see the reproach because they have to tear you down or make accusations. Rude is another. To a, a, a narcissistic rage or a um, a narcissistic collapse. Remember, the reproach was part of it to pull themselves back up. Yeah, you got to go at the other person. All right. Yeah. It's one of the things a person like the overt narcissist uses outward things, whether it be their wealth, their status, and also their beauty. Wasn't that one of it too? Their appearance. Mm -hmm. So Allah, I am understanding. He also said, stumble not at the beauty of a woman. All right. Because... An attractive woman. Unfortunately, sometimes they get raised in an environment that makes them into narcissists. Well, and it also says, and the desire her not for pleasure because the narcissist uses intercourse for as a weapon. Yeah. To gain yeah. control. Yeah. Uh -uh. Uh, 23. A wicked woman abateth the courage. All right, so that's to reduce the amount, lessen or diminish. So she lessens your courage, right? Because she tears you down or he tears you down. We can use this in either or because they both operate the same. A wicked woman abateth the courage. She lessens your courage. Like, you don't want to say anything because you're in fear of how they're going to respond or how they're going to react. You feel like you're walking on eggshells. Make it a heavy countenance and a wounded heart because of the way they're treating you. It's like, why are you treating me this way? Like, you're emotionally abusive. You're um, mentally abusive, maybe physically abusive, verbally abusive. Why are you treating me this way? And it says, a woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. Remember it said that they will leave at the worst time? Yeah. So we're really getting to understand exactly what Alayim is actually talking about here. It says, of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through her we all die. Why did he say of the woman came the beginning of sin right after he talked about narcissism? We're going to figure this out. Let's read the rest of this. <laughs> Give the water no passage, neither a wicked woman liberty to gad abroad. Because if you give the woman liberty, 
the gad abroad. She's going to reproach you. And she's going to try to manipulate the people around you. Yeah. Or she is going to the same thing. They're both going to do the same thing. But of course, if that's your wife, you have more, which you can't stop a person from doing anything. But an entry trying to contain it yeah. don't, don't let her get abroad because yeah. it's not going to be in your favor and that's why the scripture in Surah 25 and 26 says if she go not as thou wouldest have her cut her off from thy flesh and give her a bill of divorce and let her go right because if there's no peace to be made you got to separate yeah let us understand what Sirach was talking about and why it said of the woman came the beginning of sin. Let's jump into the Apocalypse of Moses, chapter 15, please. Chapter 15. Then saith he to them, Hear all my children and children's children, and I will relate to you how the enemy deceived us. It befell that we were guarding paradise, each of us the portion allotted to us from Elohim. Now I guarded in my lot the west and the south, but the devil went to Adam's lot, where the male creatures were. For Elohim divided the creatures, all males he gave to your father, and all the females he gave to me. Chapter 16 And the devil spake to the serpent, saying, Rise up, come to me, and I will tell thee a word whereby thou mayest have profit. And he rose and came to him. And the devil said to him, I hear that thou art wiser than all the beasts, and I have come to counsel thee. Why dost thou eat of Adam's tears and not of paradise? Rise up, and we will cause him to be cast out of paradise, even as we were cast out through him. The serpent saith to him, I fear lest the Lord be wroth with me. The devil saith to him, Fear not, only be my vessel, and I will speak through thy mouth words to deceive him. Right, so we get to see right here, even before he gets to Eve, we get to see the devil is actually who's speaking to deceive. And that's what we have to remember right now. We have to remember that it's the devil speaking that's deceiving. All right, let's continue. Chapter 17, and instantly he hung himself from the wall of paradise. And when the angels ascended to worship Allah Hayyam, then Satan appeared in the form of an angel and sung hymns like the angels. And I bent over the wall and saw him like an angel. And he said to me, Art thou Eve? And I said to him, I am. What art thou doing in paradise? And I said to him, Allah set us to guard and to eat of it. And the devil answered through the mouth of the serpent, You do well, but you do not eat of every plant. And I said, Yea, we eat of all, save one only, which is in the midst of paradise, concerning which Allah charges not to eat of it. For, he said to us, On the day on which you eat of it, you shall die the death. Chapter 18, and then the serpent said to me, May Allah I am live, but I am grieved on your account, for I would not have you ignorant. But arise, come hither, walk into me, and eat and mind the value of that tree. But I said to him, I fear, lest Allah I am be wroth with me, as he told us. And he said to me, Fear not, for as soon as thou eatest of it, ye too shall be as Allah I am in that ye shall know good and evil. But Allah perceived this, that you would be like him, so he envied you and said, Ye shall not eat of it. Nay, do thou give heed to the plant, and thou wilt see his great glory. Yet I fear to take of the fruit. And he said to me, Come hither, I will give it thee. Follow me. Right. So we actually get to see the devil projecting. He said, but Allah perceived this, that you would be like him. 
And so he envied you and said, the devil's projecting. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So let's see. He just he he's been manipulating from the beginning. He's speaking through the serpent to deceive. All right. He's projecting. Let's see what he's going to do next. There's a 19. And I opened to him, and he walked a little way, then turned and said to me, I have changed my mind, and I will not give thee to eat until thou swear to me to give also to thy husband. And I said, What sort of oath shall I swear to thee? Yet what I know I say to thee, by the throne of the master and by the cherubim and the tree of life, I will give also to my husband to eat. And when he had received the oath from me, he went and poured upon the fruit the poison of his wickedness, which is lust, the root and beginning of every sin. And he bent the branch on the earth, and I took of the fruit and I ate. All right. So now we actually get to see his true intention. So he did the manipulation. He's speaking through the serpent. He deceived the serpent. And now he's projected. And now he's actually showing his true intention. Right. So let's see why of the woman came to the beginning of sin. Chapter 20. And in that very hour, my eyes were opened. And forthwith, I knew that I was bare of the righteousness with which I had been clothed upon. And I wept and said to him, Why hast thou done this to me in that thou hast deprived me of the glory with which I was clothed? But I wept also about the oath which I had sworn. But he descended from the tree and vanished. And I began to seek in my nakedness in my part, for leaves to hide my shame. But I found none. For as soon as I had eaten, the leaves showered down from all the trees in my part, except the fig tree only. But I took leaves from it and made myself a girdle, and it was from the very same plant of which I had eaten. Chapter 21 and I cried out in that very hour, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Rise up, come to me, and I will show thee a great secret. Now, hold on. Let's remember that this, the devil is speaking, right? Just as he spoke in the serpent, he actually said. It's actually going to say that the devil was speaking at some point. It's somewhere in there. <laughs> Yeah, when he came, I opened my mouth and the devil was speaking. There you go. I, you can keep reading, Pastor. But when your father came, I spake to him words of transgression, which have brought us down from our great glory. For when he came, I opened my mouth and the devil was speaking. And I began to exhort him and said, Come hither, my Lord Adam, hearken to me and eat of the fruit of the tree of which Alahayim told us not to eat of it, and thou shalt be as a Alahayim. And your father answered and said, I fear lest Alahayim be wroth with me. And I said to him, Fear not, for as soon as thou hast eaten, thou shalt know good and evil. And speedily I persuaded him, and he ate. And straightway his eyes were opened, and he too knew his nakedness. And to me he saith, O oh, wicked woman, what have I done to thee that thou hast deprived me of the glory of Allah? Hayim? Right. So we get to see Satan speaking through her. And we also get to see that Satan was also the first narcissist. Hmm. So through the woman came the beginning of sin. The narcissism entered into the earth. Mm. that's why it's prophesied that we would be a lot of people would be narcissists here at the end times because they're taking on Satan's spirit 
this is how Satan operates. It's reprobate and void of the truth. He doesn't want to take accountability. He has this heightened sense of self. He can't be corrected. Who does this sound like we're talking about? <laughs> the narcissist and the envy. I'm looking at everyone else. Jealousy. Fornication. Lust. Loving the pleasures above loving Alahayim. Despises of them that are good. <laughs> he literally said he envied Adam when he saw him in prosperity. He's jealous. Manipulating. Gaslighting. Projecting. Yeah. All of these things literally makes you become the daughter or the, the, the son of Satan. Just as the scripture said, it says, separating from Alahim and bringing near to Belier. A lot of these things bring you near to Belier because you start operating like him. Ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. What would that sound like? It was full of wisdom. Satan understands the scriptures. We just read how he quoted scriptures to Yache sitting on the temple. Yeah. Though he didn't understand them, he knew them. Ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Let's get it on. Let's go to Isaiah 29 and 9. And let's understand why they're ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. All right. Isaiah 29 and 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For Ahiah hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. So we get to see it's actually Elohim that blinds you because you were given over to your pleasures and your lust. And he actually blinded you from not being able to see anything. Not being able to see prophets, rulers, or seers. Everything is darkened. Go ahead, Brother Kassel. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. All right. So you see the response that is sealed is pride at work, not being able to just admit that one doesn't understand, but has to make themselves above others to say, Allah, I am sealed it. So that's why they cannot read it and also exalting themselves to subliminally say it's sealed so no one else can understand it either since they can't understand it. Their stubbornness and vain confidence and pride of heart has them learning, but has no understanding themselves, not being willing to humble themselves. You can see their response because they have to grandiose it and make it where it's unobtainable for anyone because they don't have it. All right. Now, let's continue reading. Let's see what Elohim says. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Right. 
And because of that humility, Allah I am going to give understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. 1 Corinthians 1 and 25, because the foolishness of Allah I am is wiser than men. And the weakness of Allah I am is stronger than men. Keeping the commandments and examining ourselves when we feel indifferent to his law is our strength to keep us on the right track. That's what guides us. If we feel indifferent to his law, or we feel like we want to go a different direction, or we have a different desire, the law is what actually is our boundary or our, our guidance to see if we're actually in the right spirit or not. And if we feel indifferent, we need to examine ourselves so that we can actually get ourselves together to be able to be in the right spirit. That's why the law helps us. It's our schoolmaster teaching us the way of righteousness. Continue, Brother Kosovo, please. Isaiah 29 and 13. Wherefore, the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Right. So, they'd rather be seen in the sight of men as righteous than in the sight of Allah I am. So that's why they draw near to him with their mouth, because they want to have that form of holiness. And with their lips, they do honor him. Because they're not going to speak reproachfully to Allah I am. But their heart is far from him because they're not actually doing it sincerely. And they're not actually doing it in some cases at all. Being driven by their own lust and their own understanding and their own desires. For their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. They'll rather be looking good in the sight of men and doing what's right. And that's the same thing that befell the Pharisees. Their mouth proclaimed Allah Hayyam, but their heart was far from him to do what he actually was asking for them to do. You got anything, Pastor? The narcissist, everybody's a, everybody's a, a, a means to an end. Like, they try to get over on everybody. So they the worshiping him with the mouth, but not doing what he says. That's what a narcissist does. They're putting on a show for Allah I am too, aren't they? Right. Definitely. They think they can deceive him too. Yeah. As much as their trust is in idols. So they don't think they're going to be hurt for it. Like they can live unjustly, prophesy falsely, and lightly forswear themselves and they don't look to be hurt for it. Like Allah is going to accept it. All right. I'm going to get away with it. All I got to do is manipulate. Oh, yeah. They think they can manipulate Allah Hayam, which is a lot of pride. Yeah. Very high minded. The dead said that when we were discussing that in the portion of the prior lesson about how the dead feel about what happened in life. He said, if we would have plainly known the punishments, we would have done no business. We would have done no iniquity. So in the narcissism, like, there's no real conviction that there's really punishments there. Like, man, I can, the same way I can swindle my way in this life, talk my way out of anything, I can do it there too. Right. Remember the man that died? Allah said, confess your sin. He said, I didn't sin. And Allah told him, do you think you're on earth? The apocalypse of Paul? Yeah. You you think you're on earth where you could like say it and get away with it? But this is the heavens. Like all, every deed is before. Right. There's nothing hidden here. So 
going, you can see going through a life of a false perception with every person and not being real with anybody, keeping everything superficial. It's the same thing. Try and keep it superficial with Allah Hayyam. All right. Praise, worship, praise your name, you Allah Hayyam. But once I leave whatever environment that is, or once I'm done with that portion of my day, I might do that in the morning. The rest of the day, I'm going to go fulfill my desire. All right. so, Whether in body or mind. Yeah. Or in secrecy. Yeah. So that... The application is towards all. Yeah. Because it's sad with the men we're going into what's happening here in these times. He said, but their heart is removed far from me and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men. Mm -hmm. We thought you mentioned how the law is what is like the truth is what binds us to make sure we're with Allah and we're doing what he says. The precept of men not being taught by the law of Allah, not by his precepts, is giving everybody the, we've all been given the doctrine of the devil. Mm -hmm. We can sin, don't worry. The devil's going to keep us secure. Right. Allah isn't going, we're not going to get in trouble for what we do. So it's okay. We can lightly forswear ourselves. We can be fake. We can say it with our mouth as long as we said it. You know, we do some good, we're good. And these are the precepts of men. Like, Allah loves us no matter what. The unconditional love doctrine and things like that. The, the pampering of people. These doctrines have set us up. Yes, they have. Well, that was the point from the beginning. The point from the beginning was to set us up. We're dealing with a narcissist who has dominion over the world. Yeah. Everything was to set it up, was to set us up to eventually get us to where he wanted us to be. Yeah, to lead us captive. Right. To take us down. The same spirit. Same yeah. spirits. Yeah. Want us to be cast out too. Right. Because he's in hostility, he's in depression, he's in sorrow. You don't want to come out of it. And you want to bring everybody else into it. And he comes as an angel of light, the ideology phase or whatever. When you come seeming good, being everything the person the wants. Holiness, but denying the power thereof. Yeah. He really does it. False prophets. Remember, Yachi said, beware of false prophets. They come as sheep, but inwardly they're raving in wolves. Right. They come making it seem good. Form of holiness, but within, it ain't what you think it is. Right. And then by the time you're captured, now if, interesting, this may be understanding of what's about to, what's, what's been going on and what's to come. He leads captives, those laden with sins. And Allah him said in the end, the false prophet, what is he saying? He said in Second Thessalonians 2 and 9, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, Allah Hayyam shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the devil, he comes with the initial appearance of holiness, reels us in by our lust. We're laden with sins. And if we actually have pleasure in them, he gets a grip. And if we're unable, if we don't come to that repentance of wanting to come out of it, to see it for what it is, we're going to be got here in these times. We're going to get over to the delusion because there's a certain time where for the children of Israel, there's a certain time where that's it. There's a cutoff point. So... 
Yeah. All they gotta do is hold us to a time. Yeah. And it's facts, because the apocalypse of Peter told how when the false prophet comes, some of the children of Israel are going to remember our iniquity and turn after it. It says in Apocalypse of Peter chapter 2, And verily I say unto thee, when the twigs thereof have sprouted forth in the last days, then shall feign Christ come and awake expectation, saying, I am the Christ that am now come into the world. And when they, Israel, shall perceive the wickedness of their deeds, they shall turn away after them and deny him who our fathers did praise, even the first Christ whom they crucified and therein sinned a great sin. So people don't know like, well, Centuries and now the, the narcissist plays on getting people into depression to keep a grip on them. Mm -hmm. That guilty conscience is what going to help people stay there and turn after it, like, going to see it for what it is and the guilt instead of having to take it. I can't get out of it. There's yeah. too much going on. It's too much for me. Just like people stay in bad relationships to this day. Like they, they judge themselves. They think that's what they deserve sometimes. Right. And you see how we've been getting prepped from this from a childhood. You're coming up in a bad environment. So I am be with us to come out of our desires so that these spirits don't have a hold on us, that the devil can't seduce us being silly laden with sins. Allah has been gracious to give us this chance now to get aware of our sins, to get aware of what we have going on, to get aware of our lusts, so that we can come out of them, that they don't have place in us, that we're not going to be gullible or seductible for any narcissist to get an advantage, specifically the devil, to get an advantage over us or take advantage of us. Yeah, that's one aspect, but also for anyone struggling with narcissism, to be aware that the devil is trying to get advantage of you and trying to get you to operate in these fashions to get you to, to lose your salvation and to go down in a sinking ship with him. So it should be great admonition to stand aloof from these things, especially if you find yourself doing them to stop and pause and to actually examine yourself by the law to actually then come out of whatever it is that you're doing that's causing you to to trespass or transgress the commandments or to manipulate a person not operating in truth. So if you find yourself operating in any of these fashions, projection, stonewalling, manipulation, gaslighting, when you see that you just want what you want, you just want your own desire, because how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if, you, if you're if you always constantly seeking after your own pleasure and your own desire, you're going to do that in all aspects, even when it comes to Allah Hayyam. And if you're constantly being self-centered and you're constantly seeking your own desires above the desires of everyone else, then there's going to be no peace. There's going to be no love. There's going to be no concord. You're not going to be able to, to grow good, deep connections with people where people actually feel comfortable being with you or they feel that you have their best interests at heart. Because a person may stay with you, but by all means, they don't feel like you have their best interests at heart. They know that at any given turn, they're learning you. That any given turn, you're going to choose yourself over everyone. And if a person knows that, then Allah feels the same way. Because you're going to do the same thing to everyone. That's why 
when as we continue going, um, it's going to talk about how we treat our brother. How can we say we treat Elohim different than our brother that's right before us? We can't. Because we're going to treat Elohim the same way we treat everyone else. And you're going to put yourself before Elohim too. You're going to manipulate Elohim. You're going to try to deceive Elohim. So these are things that we truly have to come out of before we get too deep into them and can't come out. Where Elohim truly blinds us and allow and gives us over to our pleasures where we become reprobate. So we truly have to fight. It's not a light thing. It's not a light thing to fall into these spirits because it's easier to fall into them than to get out of them. It's easy to sin and to lust, but it's hard <laughs> to be sinless and to be holy and righteous truly. It's hard to come out of spirits, but it's not impossible. And it's easy if you truly want to do it. It's hard if you're dragging your feet and you're being lukewarm and on the fence. It is hard, but it's easy when you truly want to do it and you would do anything necessary to come out of it and to overcome it. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and get into Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 30. All right. Ascension of Isaiah, chapter 3, verse 30. But there will be great jealousy in the last days. All right. So jealousy dwells in all fornication, as Reuben said. Continue, Brother Casa, please. For everyone will speak whatever pleases him in his own eyes. All right. So we see the same narcissism. Everyone's going to speak whatever pleases them in their own eyes. Right, go ahead. And they will make ineffective the prophecy of the prophets who were before me. All right. So they're going to blaspheme Allah. Right. They're going to make ineffective the prophecies and the prophets. They're going to say that those are lies and it's not true. You don't give their private interpretation of them. All right. And my visions also. The two witnesses after me, they will make ineffective in order that they may speak what bursts out of their own heart. Right. So they have to tear down the two witnesses so that they can be in honor because they don't like to be corrected. Right. Nor do they want to be criticized. So you can see how they have to make ineffective the two witnesses in order that they may speak whatever burst out of their own heart so that they can be right so and that's the same thing that one would do inside the house the person that can see clearly is the problem so if that person any person that is a threat is a person that is able to criticize or correct them. So that's the person that becomes the enemy. Anyone that speaks the truth is the enemy because the truth is something that they struggle with. They love a lie, as the scripture says. What scripture is that? So you can see in Revelations 22 and 14, it said, Blessed are they that do with commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers 
and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Those are the spirits of the devil. Yes, sir. This is serious. This is something that we can't really play with. If you find that these things are in you and you're listening to this lesson and you're able to identify, then this is serious for you to actually come out of and to actually accept so that you can then start working your way out of these things. Do not, do not try to cast it away from you and say that, no, that's not me. If you are identifying with these things so that these spirits can stay and have place in you, please, please confess it and take accountability and put forth the effort to change and to use this as a tool, not to get down about yourself, but use this as a tool to then know the tactics of the enemy and how it is working against you so that you can come out of it. Because a lot of times you're not very aware. That's why you continue to do these things because you have pleasure in them. You're getting what you want, but you're not aware of why you're doing it. And Allah and willing, we're bringing the awareness so that you can actually come out of it and not stay in it for the salvation of your soul. What is the cause of desiring to speak precepts of men based on what comes out of our own heart? Can we continue, Brother Kasim? Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 25. And many will exchange the glory of the rose of the saints for the rose of those who love money. Right. So you can see that love of money, especially for an overt narcissist, to have those riches, to have that stature in the sight of men. It's going to cause you to, to go away from the faith, go away from striving after the faith. Go ahead, Brother Kasim. And there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of the glory of this world. Right. So they're going to love what they're gaining, what the people, what the, the feeling that they get from people. Because at that point in time, people are going to be in a bad shape. And no one's going to be looking to correct anyone. Because... We already see society right now where everyone is right and no one can speak up against anyone else. No matter what they're doing, they have the right to do what they're doing or feel or think the way that they feel. And you can't speak. You just have to coexist. So there's going to be much respect to persons in the end times. No one's going to correct one another. So if you are given over to iniquity, you're going to be given over to iniquity because no one's going to stop you. Lovers of the glory of this world, you're going to cleave on to all the riches that it gives you and all the desires and all the lusts you're going to fulfill yourself in. But at what cost? What cost is it worth? To go through torments for eternity? To go down in a sinking ship? Just to fulfill your lust, fulfill your desires? Think about it. Continue, Brother Cossack, please. 
And there will be many slanderers and much vainglory at the approach of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit will withdraw from many. And in those days there will not be many prophets, nor those who speak reliable words, except one here and there in different places. Right, because everybody will be given over to lying, be void of the truth. Everyone will be living a lie. Yeah. Blissful. Not knowing right from left and up from down. And the spirits that play with narcissism dwell in lies. Right. The, anger, the hatred, the wrath, they all make the lie and the pride. All right. You see the setup. Yeah. And why is that? Why in the other day there would not be many prophets, nor those that speak reliable words? Why is that? Because of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of the love of money, which there shall be among those who are said to be the service of that one and among those who receive that one. And among the shepherds and elders, there will be great hatred towards one another. So we see the spirit of error, which Allah am, give men over to. Fornication, which led them to error. Vainglory, which led them to error, which is pride. And the love of money, love of riches, and what comes with it. The vainglory, the power, the control, all the things that a narcissist craves, they're going to put it right before your face. And if you don't come out of it, you're going to take it and you're going to be given over to it. It's that serious because it's set up for you. Everything that the world has to offer, especially at the end of the world, it's going to be catered to a narcissist. Because that's where they're trying to get society to go. You're falling right into the trap of the enemy. So now it's your time to wake up. Especially after we go into these last couple of scriptures, we're going to start going into the, the remedies of coming out of these things. And it'll be in your best interest to take good heed so that you're able to come out of them and implement these things for the sake of your salvation. When working on yourself to come out of these spirits of error, let's be mindful to abstain from hatred to do any of the following. But instead of walking in true love and mercy, as Allah walks in, not comparing ourselves to others, but to Allah righteousness. Brother Katha, can we start in Sirach 28, verse 1? And we're going to go down to about 26. I'll stop you in between, though. All right. Sirach 28 and 1. He that revengeth shall find vengeance from the Lord, and he will surely keep his sins in remembrance. Right. So taking that revenge into your own hands, instead of allowing vengeance to be of Elohim and being a judge, it's one of the things that stem from pride. So when dealing with pride, it's good to remember that we're supposed to be humble servants doing the will of him that sent us. So don't lift yourselves up against your brothers and sisters or if they do wrong to you forgive the wrong and don't allow that anger that's what we're going to get into we're going to get into anger we're going to get into wrath vexation again and to really understand what's really at work against us um continue brother casa please forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he hath done unto thee so shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest Right. So forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he done unto you. 
if he done something wrong to you, forgive it. Forgive what they done. And so shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Because that's the whole point, is to do all things unto Allah. And that's where a narcissist struggles with. It's one of the main struggles, is looking unto Allah for everything that you do. What's in your heart? What's in your mind? Looking and seeing that Allah is viewing those things instead of seeing that men are trying to be seen in the sight of men a certain way. Because that's the, the big focus for a narcissist. Because they want to be seen or portrayed to men in men's sight a certain way. Instead of looking and knowing that Allah is looking on the inclination. That Allah is weighing us according to what we do and what we think. So we have to really be mindful that we're doing this for Allah. We're doing this for them. And not just to be seen a certain type of way. Um, Brother Casa, please. One man beareth hatred against another. And does he seek pardon from the Lord? Right. So you're going to hold that hatred against your own brother or your own sister. But then you expect the Lord to operate differently toward you. We can't have our own standard of how we're to operate toward one another and that the Lord is supposed to be different than us. That he's supposed to be held to a higher standard because of who he is and we can be held to a lower standard when he never gave us that commandment. He never said that we could do something where he can't. No, he had told us to be holy as he is holy. So we're supposed to be held to that same high standard that we're upholding him to. We're supposed to uphold ourselves to that same standard and not be hypocrites. Continue, Brother Costa, please. He showeth no mercy to a man which is like himself, and doth he ask forgiveness of his own sins? Right. So you don't show no mercy to someone who is going through the same struggle as you, who's fighting the same temptations, the same battles, having to ward off the same spirits that are afflicting you and fighting against you. You don't have no mercy to that person. Right. And this all, again, these are things that stem from pride because you can't see another person. You can't have compassion on your neighbor to see that that person is going through a struggle and you may be even going through the same struggle, but it just gives you the opportunity to say, hey, you don't know I'm going through that struggle. So I can portray it to you like I'm not fighting that same entity. But instead, it gives you the moment to lift yourself up. So we really, like, once we go further down into this, humility plays a great part of for narcissists to actually come out of it. And do if he has forgiveness for his own sins, so you will have no mercy or compassion towards your neighbor, and you will take the opportunity to lift yourself up. But then when you make a mistake, you're quick to ask for forgiveness and hold Allah to that standard that he's supposed to forgive you. Sounds a little hypocritical. Let's continue so, so we can actually understand what's happening. What, what are we doing? What are these mechanisms that's in place that it's leading us to actually find or, or, or vindicate or, or validate what we're doing? so that we can understand and stand away from it. Uh, go ahead, Brother Casa, please. If he that is but flesh nourish hatred, who will entreat for pardon of his sins? Right. So this is a great question. If he that is but flesh nourisheth hatred, so you're a fleshly man or woman, and you're nourishing that hatred, how can you operate in the spirit of hatred or hatred be operating in your vessel and then you go and entreat for we know that Yahche Christ is the one that actually uh, in, it, it's the mediator between man and Allah so 
you're going to go and entreat to Yache. And then, but you're coming in the spirit of hatred, which is not of his spirit. Right? We got to think about these things. Uh, go ahead, Brother Katha, please. Remember thy end and let enmity cease. Remember thy end. Because the reason he says remember thy end is because you have to remember what is the end of this life. The end of this life is salvation. And that's what we're all seeking for. No matter how we're all striving to get there, going through our different journeys, going through our different temptations, going through our different paths, we all have the same end goal, those that are following after Christ. We all have the same end goal. So let that enmity cease, seeing that we're all striving to get to the same place. Let that enmity cease between us to feel like one of us has to get there first or one of us has to be greater. Let us all work together in the body of Christ and push forward together, helping one another. Seeing you may know something that another person doesn't share the information to help them. Be also open and willing for someone to share information with you to help you in something that you're struggling with, not to get lifted up as if you don't need the help. That's where the humility comes in. So that we all can actually run this race together. Brother Casa. Remember corruption and death and abide in the commandments. Right. So remember that we all can go off of the path, any one of us. Remember corruption and death, because the corruption, if we are found in corruption, if we are found that we are going off of the path and not focused on what we're supposed to be doing, which is keeping the commandments, which is the whole duty of man, if we find that we're veering off of that path, we, got, we need to remember that with corruption comes death. So we're supposed to abide in the commandments because that's our safekeeping. That's our duty. If we abide in the commandments and we're abiding them until the end, we're going to reach salvation. Brother Kasafu, please. Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Hmm. Remember the covenant of the highest and wink at ignorance. Right. So remember the commandments. Always remember them because that's supposed to be on the forefront of our minds. That's our standard. That's our boundaries. And bear no malice to thy neighbor. So if your neighbor do something wrong to you, forgive them. And we're going to go into malice too so that we can actually understand how malice actually works. Um, if you we did go into malice um, in the, the spirit of anger lesson, if you want to revert back to that in great detail, but we are going to cover it here in this lesson too. Uh, remember the covenant of the highest. Remember the covenant that he sworn unto us so that we all can make it. Because one, the Gentiles are grafted in that believe on Christ. So they fall under the seed of Abraham. Love them. They're your brothers and sisters. Remember the covenant and wink at ignorance. So if someone's doing something wrong, don't take it to heart and have this enmity against them. Just help them. That's what humility is. It's okay. I see that you're doing something wrong. I see that you're struggling. Let me help you. And we're going to get into inclinations in a moment as well to do things in sincerity because a lot of times the, the spirit of narcissist, it, it struggles with doing things in sincerity. And it either does things through pride where it will uh, do something nice, but inwardly it's to lift themselves up or to be greater than you, to say that I need to help you because you're struggling. Or it's to make themselves look better in the sight of men. So real sincerity, like just doing it for the sake of helping your brother or helping your sister. That's a good inclination 
and it's not crippled with evil. Continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Abstain from strife, and thou shalt diminish thy sins, for a furious man will kindle strife. All right. So abstain from strife. We're going to go into this in a moment where we're going to actually go into the vexation. We're going to go into anger. We're going to go into malice. And also what comes with malice, which is lying. So that we can actually understand what kindles strife and how we can abstain from it to diminish our sins and not to be given over to anger. Right. And that's why it says a furious man will kindle strife, because if a man can't control his anger or a man doesn't know how to actually deal with it, then all it does is like a fire. It continues to fester and it continues to grow. So about time that fire is kindled and grown, you're kindling strife because nothing can appease you. You're angry. And we're going to get into it because it, it, there's things that happen when kindle is strife like that. Um, when the spirit, because it's the spirit that actually comes and takes over. Uh, continue, Brother Costa. We'll get back to that in a moment. A sinful man disquieteth friends and maketh debate among them that be at peace. A sinful man disquieteth friends and maketh debate. So a sinful man, he is usually overbearing. You're overbearing and you disquiet friends because you won't allow anyone to speak or to express themselves. And if they do speak or express themselves, they're usually met with being discarded. So a sinful man disquieted friends because he actually doesn't take the time to actually consider what they're saying. And this is one of the, the traits of narcissism because it is not beneficial to me. When, you, when you're saying these things to me, or you're saying maybe your concerns, or you're saying something that affected you, or something that you may be going through, it doesn't benefit me. So instead of hearing you out, listening to you, and understanding, it's okay, I'm gonna disquiet you. And then I'm gonna make debate among them. And then you make debate among people that are at peace. Like you have to come in and kindle and, and get some type of reaction or get some type of attention when people may be at peace and you come and you make an uproar. It's interesting. Um, a good example of that, let's say you, you're going to dinner with your friends, right? It's four of you guys. You, you're, let's say that your spouse is a narcissist and your other two friends, they're they're not. Right. So you may be having a great time with your two friends. Y'all laughing, y'all are joking, everything is fun, and you're just having the greatest time. Now, unfortunately, you're having a good time, and the narcissist is not the center of attention. What will happen is that the narcissist will say something, maybe make a comment, maybe say something that then changes the energy of everyone that's sitting at the table. So everyone's at peace, but yet you make debate amongst them because you weren't the center of attention when you could have actually just joined in and enjoyed the happiness that everyone was entertaining or involved in. So you see how these things actually transpire so we can see that when the attention isn't focused or centered around the narcissist, that's when the narcissist starts to create that debate amongst them that are at peace. So you have to really be mindful for a narcissist. Join with everyone. Be at peace with everyone. Like join in if they are having a good time and they're laughing and Alahim is 
is with them. Join in not to have to be the center of attention, but to be able to partake in the peace with them. So this is what we're trying to get to is for you to actually be at peace with yourself so that you can be at peace with others. And that's the goal here to get to for a narcissist. And that's Lord willing, that's where we're going today. Um, Brother Kasa Fali, am I reading Surah 28 and 10, please? As the matter of the fire is, so it burneth. And as a man's strength is, so is his wrath. Mm -hmm. And according to his riches, his anger riseth. And the stronger they are which contend, the more they will be inflamed. All right. So for this, um, this is more so pertaining to an overt narcissist than a uh, covert narcissist, but it can go for both. Um, the matter of the fire is, so we're talking about uh, anger. We're talking about vexation. We're talking about wrath. And as a man's strength is, so is his wrath. And according to his riches, his anger rises. So if a man is strong or a woman's strong person, the wrath goes with who they are as a person. And according to his riches, his anger rises. So if he has more money or he's doing or he's more successful, it gets taken more personally. Like, how can you say this to me, seeing who I am in this world, seeing what I have? Those things are part of their, quote unquote, personality or persona. So you're attacking their whole existence in their eyes. The stronger they are, which contend, the more they'll be inflamed. So if somebody's contending with that narcissist and not just giving in and giving them their way, the more the narcissist gets inflamed. So you have to be very, very mindful for one that is dealing with the narcissist and one that is a narcissist to actually understand what's going on, what is actually kindling that wrath for you to be inflamed, for you to take things personally. What's going on? What are you holding that is so significant in your life to take personally. Continue, Brother Kato, please. And hasty contention kindleth a fire, and an hasty fighting sheddeth blood. All right. So being hasty, all right, that goes into anger, that goes into vexation, that goes into wrath. So all these things we're talking about is is the vexation from the beginning, the anger. Then there's a, a, a vexation that cometh with wrath. Then it goes into lying. So that's the pattern of anger. So that's what we're actually talking about today. And with that vexation cometh hastiness. So because the, the anger wants to hurry up and get you Kindled. It wants to hurry up and get you in the wrath so that you can't actually think about it or you can't think about another solution or another option. So the hasty contention. So when you're going quickly and you're just you're quick to react, you're quick to, to do something that can lift the fire. And hasty fighting sheds blood. So if you're quick to, to fight or to debate or to argue or to put your hands on someone, that sheds blood because you're not actually thinking. You're not actually fighting against the vexation. You're not fighting against the anger. You're not fighting against the vexation of wrath. You're not fighting against wrath. You're not fighting against lying. So when you're giving in to those things, it sheds blood. And that's what we want to change today. We want to change from being given in to a spirit to actually understanding the spirit and resisting it. And that's, that is our goal today. Uh, continue, Brother Kasi, if you don't mind. If thou blow the spark, it shall burn. 
If thou spit upon it, it shall be quenched. And both these come out of thy mouth. Right. So now we're getting understanding. If you blow that spark, it's going to ignite. Right? It's going to burn. But if thou spit on it, if you put water on it, it's going to quench it. It's going to stop it. Lord willing, that's what we're going to higher willing, that's what we're going to learn today is how to quench that spark or how to quench that fire so that we can actually come out of the anger and not be led by the spirit of anger and wrath and all the other spirits that come with it and lying. And both these come of thy mouth. So it's going to be things that we're going to say one to ourselves which is speaking truth in our heart, that's going to actually allow us to come out of anger. And we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this because we have, we have a good bit to cover. Um, continue, Brother Casa, please. Curse the whisper and double-tongued, for such have destroyed many that were at peace. So you have the whisper, the one that goes in and tells people business, or talks a lot, but they go and talk to one person, to the next person, to the next person. They're not just saying things out in public. They're speaking to everyone privately. That's the whisperer. And the double tongue is the one that goes and, and acts one way in front of one person, but then goes and speaks against that person when not around them. All right? So we have both of those. For such have destroyed many that were at peace. All right? So for a narcissist, you have to really stay away from these things. Though you may get into your emotions, you may get into vexation, you may get into anger, you have to actually have to deal with those things um, before you actually operate in one of those spirits where they can actually have dominion to, to control you, to operate in it. As we've seen with um, Eve at the beginning, how the, the devil actually was able to speak through her once she agreed to walk in the spirit. So with whispering and being double-tongued, we have to be very, very mindful and stand aloof from it to not give in to the vexation, to not give in to the lying, right? Because we went into vexation. We talked about the anger. We talked about the vexation of wrath, the wrath itself. And that with wrath cometh lying. So that's where you fall into the, the whispering and the double-tongued. Because that's wrath with lying. And it destroys many that are at peace because you literally, you're slandering. Because you're agreeing with the lies that you may have thought of, that you may think that you have thought of, that may not be true because you may have not even went and spoke to the person about whatever the case is, but you formed your own opinion and you're going according to your opinion as if it's factual. And that's one of the things you have to be very mindful of doing is making that assumption and then making that assumption a fact. Okay. Brother Gossip, please. A backbiting tongue hath disquieted many and driven them from nation to nation. Strong cities hath it pulled down and overthrown the house of great men. Hmm. A backbiting tongue hath cast out virtuous women and deprived them of their labors. All right. Now this is huge for our sisters. A backbiting tongue hath cast out virtuous women. It didn't just say women. It said women that were actually walking according to the faith, that actually had gifts that Elohim was given unto them. By not controlling that, that vexation, that anger, that vexation or wrath, that wrath and that lying, that backbiting tongue cast out a lot of virtuous women. So let's be mindful that even if you're doing well in your walk, it's good to learn, not only just for narcissists, but anyone dealing with the spirit of anger, 
so that you can actually stand aloof from these things that will get you to be cast out and deprive them of their labors. We don't want anything to deprive us of our good labors, our labors of good inclination and good intent. We don't want anything to deprive us from those things. So to speak bad about one, it's not well, nor to, to make an assumption, nor to walk according to how you feel about that person and, and speak out of your feelings or emotions about that person. We have to be able to be temperate in all things and be able to hold our tongue and not allow that poison to fester in us, but to pray unto Allah and cast all our cares upon him so that we may be delivered from how we may feel or how we may see things, asking Allah for him to guide us and show us so that we may not walk according to our own mind and our own imagination. All right, let's continue, Brother Kafa, please. Verse 16. Whoso hearkeneth unto it shall never find rest and never dwell quietly. All right, so who hearkens unto a backbiting tongue shall never find rest and never dwell quietly. Right, because if you hearken to a backbiting tongue and you're given over to that anger and that hatred, and you're given over to that wrath, you're never going to dwell quietly because you're having a hard time being at peace with men and being at peace with yourself. Because that those spirits don't bring peace. They bring discourse, even within yourself. So you have to stand aloof from a backbiting tongue and the spirits that are attributed with a backbiting tongue, like anger, wrath, hatred, variance, strife. All of those things are akin to anger being the core. So we have to really find that peace in Allah Really not speaking ill of another man or not giving into the vexation that the angel of wickedness may bring forth unto us to cause us to have these thoughts, not cleaving unto them, not cleaving unto a lie, not believing a lie, but holding fast to the truth, which the truth is the law, the truth is Yache, holding fast unto him that we are not supposed to be of a backbinding tongue, but we're supposed to do well and love our brother as ourselves. Truly having that heart unto them, having that compassion toward them. Not to want to do anything or say anything bad about any person. Because we know that Allah looketh upon our inclination. Uh, continue, Brother Kafa, please. The stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. Many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen by the tongue. All right. So the tongue, the tongue is a greater weapon than the sword. So we got to be mindful of our own tongue and what we speak, whether we're speaking life or whether we're speaking death. All right. We want to speak life. We want to speak good things, positive things. All right. And even in correcting someone, we want to correct them and bring forth a solution to help them, not just to, to, to bring forth what they got going on to lift ourselves up, but to actually truly want to help them, to see them do well. Continue, Brother Casa, please. Well is he that is defended through the venom thereof. Who hath not drawn the yoke thereof, nor hath been bound in her bands? Right. So well is it for the person that has not been given into a double tongue or being double minded or given into wrath or strife or anger. Well is it unto them. Right. Who they defended from the venom of it and who have not drawn the yoke. 
you know, have been bound by her bands, right? That's what we want to be, what we all want to be, not to be bound by her bands, to be able to stand from anger so that we may be able to stay in the fruits of the spirit. For well, the yoke thereof is a yoke of iron, and the bands thereof are bands of brass. It's hard to get out of their yoke. It's hard to get out of their bands because they're strong and they're heavy. Bands of brass and a yoke of iron. A yoke is heavy. Bands of brass is strong. So it's hard to come out of them. But it's not impossible. Go ahead, Brother Costa. The death thereof is an evil death. The grave were better than it. Right. Because the torments that come forth from a person that operates in these spirits is tough. It's very hard. Continue, Brother Costa. It shall not have rule over them that fear Allah Neither shall they be burned with the flame thereof. Right. So it's not going to have rule over them that fear Allah because those that fear Allah know that Allah looketh upon their inclination and looketh upon their thoughts and looketh upon their mind. Right. It's not going to have rule over them because we fear Allah At least we may offend. We don't want to do wrong to any man. At least we offend Allah Now that fear is what actually pulls you out of a lot of these things that are causing us to fall. And that fear is the same thing that makes a narcissist struggle because the narcissist doesn't have that fear because of the pride. They don't fear Allah because they have the mindset that they can do no wrong. And with that mindset, it takes away fear. So we have to really grow in that fear to really put that on, put that yoke of that fear upon us and that bondage unto the law where we actually are circumspect to the law, circumspect to doing what's right in the sight of Allah and not what's right in our own sight. So that fear is needed not wanting to offend Allah the same fear that a narcissist has to not do wrong in the sight of men it's the same fear that they need to have toward Allah it just needs to be redirected and they shall not be burned with the flame of fire thereof so if we do that and we redirect that fear unto Allah you're not going to be burned Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. You got something? All right. Well, you know, with the narcissist, we talked about how the upbringing, the experiences from whatever happened in childhood led to what a narcissist becomes. And one of the things was the lack of trust, like not trusting the world, thinking the world is dangerous, everything's um, dangerous, so it turns into where I can only trust myself and that lack of trust ends up going towards Allah I am too so in order to get to that fear of Allah I am, we have to actually let go and trust Allah I am. you know forgive whatever happened in the world forgive ourselves whatever we have done and actually okay let me bow down to this and trust that you're going to actually take care of me. And I don't have to be afraid to try and protect myself or fight for myself or be afraid of the vulnerability of giving myself unto you. You know, I think anybody wanting to come out as narcissism, it's important to understand that. Amen. 100% agree. Verse 23, such as forsake the Lord shall fall into it, and it shall burn in them and not be quenched. It shall be sent upon them as a lion and devour them as a leopard. All right. But just as Brother Kathaphil said, not having that trust, right? That not having that trust in Allah is forsaking him. 
And you're going to fall into it not having that trust, not having that vulnerability toward Elohim, knowing that he's going to take care of you, knowing that he's going to do what's needful for you and give what's needful for you. Because if you take it into your own hands and you take your life into your own hands and you operate according to your own desires and your self-will, you're going to end up burning in them and not be quenched. So be mindful of what you're doing. You have to pay attention and see. Because a lot of times when you get in the habit of things, you you are quick to do things without thinking. And for a lot of narcissists, they have a lot of mechanisms. It's a lot of habits. It's a lot of, of defense mechanisms that are set in place to protect themselves and it goes unnoticed. It just gets done without actually noticing or being aware of what you're doing or what's going on. And for that, you really need to truly slow down, get away from the hastiness of spirit and actually focus on what is happening, what is going on, what is transpiring within you for you then to operate on the exterior by your actions. So for us, really paying attention to what's going on within so that we can be strengthened within and without. So we won't forsake Allah Hayyam, but we'll actually cleave unto him because we trust him with our soul. Verse 24, look that thou has thy possession about with thorns and bind up thy silver and gold mm -hmm. Continue. and weigh thy words in a balance and make a door and a bar for thy mouth. All right. So guard your mouth. And this is what you have to do at first. It's a process because you have to come out of the habits. You have to come out of the habitual things that you've acquired all the way from a young age. You have to make a door and a bar for thy mouth. So if you are struggling with backbiting or being double-tongued, you have to make sure that you're guarding yourself from those things, knowing that that's a struggle for you. Now, if you're not guarding yourself from it and you're not taking accountability that that's a struggle for you, then that makes it hard for you to guard yourself from it. So you see why it's very important to actually confess your fault. You see how it's very important to take accountability for something that you may be doing or struggling with so that you can actually create the parameters to keep yourself from falling into it. And that's going to help us because we have to speak the truth in our heart. And that truth allows us to come out of iniquity. It allows us to overcome strongholds and battles that we may be facing because we're being honest with ourselves. And then by being honest with ourselves, we're putting parameters, we're putting doors and we're putting bars in place to then keep ourselves in check to keep ourselves in line where we're not just giving over to anything or putting ourselves in a bad situation or an environment to cause us to fall. Right. Let's continue, Brother Casa, please. Beware thou slide not by it, lest thou fall before him that lieth in wait. All right. So just like I was just speaking about a moment ago, you got to make sure that you're guarding yourself. Beware at least I slide, not by it. Right? So don't just let it slide on by. Don't just let things just happen and you know exactly what's happening, but you allow it just to slide by and not, and not stop it or deal with it. At least I'll fall before him that lieth in wait. But whatever spirit it is that's, that you let slide by, it's the same one that's lying and waiting for you. Because you're eventually going to fall. 
eventually going to get you because it, it was operating and it was continuing to operate. So we are going to see that there's a deliverance from narcissism and a person can overcome it through faith in Yahshua to deliver the soul. Let's read the prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 29 and 14 through 18, please. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Right. So the wisdom of the wise men is going to perish eventually. So it's good to get the understanding now so that you can actually start working to come out of these things. Right. Because there's only a time period for a narcissist to come out according to prophecy. And the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. So the men that have understanding and the men that are prudent, that are doing good works, they're going to be hid. So it's good to focus now to get the information and to get the things that are needful for your deliverance and not wait until the last moment. Go ahead, Brother Cotham. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from Ahaya. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from Ahaya. So you're trying to hide it far deep down. Your true inclination or your true thoughts or your inner workings. You're trying to hide those things. You're trying to hide your counsel from Alahayim, the way that you think. That's your counsel. The way that you think or what you're saying to yourself or what your true desire is. That's your counsel. Continue, Brother Castle. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Right. So don't, don't think for one moment that Allah can't see your inner workings and your inner thoughts and your works in the dark and the things you do that are not in front of all men but maybe in front of a few or maybe by yourself. Allah sees it all. And don't think for one moment that it's not seen. Don't be blinded to think that you're getting away with something because no man is seeing you. Or no man knows what's going on in your heart or in your mind. Or what you do when no one is around. Like you have to truly have that true fear of Alahayim, knowing that Alahayim does weigh the spirit. Alahayim does see everything that's going on. He has angels everywhere reporting unto him. You can't forget that you have the angel of righteousness and the angel of wickedness with you everywhere that you go. So someone's always giving a report of you. So let's be mindful that nothing that we do is unseen. You got anything, Brother Cuss? I saw this was the covert narcissism. Mm -hmm. This is within me. I'm hiding, as I spoke about how through learning not to trust anything, not to trust the world, the world is dangerous, and even Allah is dangerous. This is even hiding from him, hiding from everyone. Like, my works are in the dark. Like, saying, who sees me? Who sees the real me? Who knows the real me? Because I've set up the false sense of self. But Allah can see. All right. It's going to get more evident as we continue to go. Because like, it's only hurting yourself by yeah. still trying to hold on to who you are or what you want instead of actually 
changing and conforming to how I am. Because one, it's easier. Staying who you are is easier. It doesn't require any work. Creating a fake persona or a fake self is easy. Though it's hard, it's not as hard as actually changing. It gets tiring because it, you're putting on and you're constantly having to be aware of what you're doing and what you're saying because it's not authentic, it's not genuine. So you have to really guard yourself. It's interesting, you're putting in the work to guard yourself to stay in, in iniquity or stay in to be a person that is not what Allah wants you to be. You're putting in the work to stay in iniquity but won't put in the work to actually change and do Alheim ass. That's the real dichotomy of a narcissist where they're complacent with working. It's not that they're lazy. They're complacent with working. They're just not complacent with working to do good. So it's like shifting. You have to shift everything to actually come out of it. You had spoke on that earlier that for the narcissist, things really get hard when you actually start to put the work into change. That's when the battle really gets hard. Like right. to be able to stay there and just stay in that work of staying hid, that work is easier because that's the spirits that I've been dwelling in, the pride, right. anger, these spirits. They're like, yeah, we'll help you with this. This is what we've been doing this whole time. And you got to make a change. All right. And then when you walking to come out of it that's when it's real work because now you're getting away from everything i'm getting away from everything i've been comfortable in what i've been riding in my whole life right. now it's a new journey learn a new ally i am learning a new spirit because <laughs> this is not what i've been walking in my life you know everything is different it's uncomfortable it's vulnerable you yeah. Coming out of your comfort zone to then make the necessary changes for the better, but you're out of your comfort zone, you're vulnerable. And that's one of the fights or struggles that actually creates a narcissist from a youth is being vulnerable and uncomfortable and not having that reassurance of the people around them to actually grow them in that area. Mm. shows why the brotherhood is so important in being vulnerable you have the brotherhood people to encourage and help you just as you should have had it as a child to encourage and help you go towards the right direction but now we have the, the family and the faith to encourage and be honest and get guidance to press forward amen now, here goes the direct message, all right? So this is from Alahayim, direct message to help come out of narcissism. Go ahead, Brother Kassim. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. Mm -hmm. So surely the turn of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Because narcissists, they turn everything upside down. They, they're walking in the evil and then they're trying to be quote unquote as Satan to come as an angel of light. Though they're walking in evil. So Alahayim says it's going to be esteemed as the potter's clay because what happens to a potter's clay? Potter's clay can be remolded. When a potter is potting, is potting clay, he can shape it however he feels, however he wishes. So that's what Alahayim is saying, saying, okay, you're turning everything upside down and it's going to be esteemed as the potter's clay because you think that you're doing something, but I can remold you. I can reshape you. 
For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. He like, I have dominion. I created you. I can reshape you. Or shall the thing framed of him that framed it, he had no understanding. So Allah knows exactly what you're doing. That's why he's able to reshape you whenever he sees fit. And this is why this prophecy is here, to show that though you think you're getting away, or though you think that you may not be touched, or though you think that that you can continue in these fashions and no one's going to know, you are going to be mistaken. Because if Allah has called you, you're not, you can't get away. You're going to go through the process of coming out of it and you're going to be reshaped. And you're going to be reformed and renewed, becoming a new creation in Allah. Because he's spoken it. Let's continue, Brother Kasi, please. Is it not yet a very little while when Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? Right. So now he's proving his point. Like, is it not for a little while? So in a little time, shall Lebanon not be turned into a fruitful field? So he's showing you that everything is possible. So don't get discouraged and think that, oh, okay, I'm a narcissist. I'm struggling with these narcissistic traits and I can't come out of them. Like you can in Allah but only in Allah because he's the one that created you. You can't go any other place and come out of it. It's impossible. That's why he's allowed it to be for his glory to show that nothing else can help you but him. It's all for his name's sake. Go ahead, Brother Kapsiko. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. So now we understand. Narcissists, they're going to come out, and they're going to be able to see, and they're going to be able to hear. And it's going to be all for Allah's glory. So let's go ahead and, and we're going to start getting into these different things. We're going to get into um, jealousy and vainglory, um, vexation, wrath, vexational wrath, and lying. So let's go ahead and jump into the Testament of Dan, um, chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to, let's jump into this thing and get going. Testament of Dan, chapter 1, verse 1. The copy of the words of Dan, which he spake to his sons in his last days, in the hundred and twenty-fifth year of his life. For he called together his family and said, Hearken to my words, ye sons of Dan, and give heed to the words of your father. I have proved in my heart and in my whole life that truth with just dealings is good and well-pleasing to Allah Hayyam. Yes, it is. Truth with just dealings is good and well-pleasing to Allah Hayyam. So that's the first thing that we're going to touch on. First is truth, right? So that's one of the things we're going to go into. We see that truth is what's going to combat that wrath with lying once we get down into it. And we know that that is well pleasing to Allah. So we're going we're gonna to touch on these things in great detail so that we can understand them. Continue, Brother Casa, please. And that lying and anger are evil because they teach man all wickedness. Yes, they do. Continue, Brother Casa. I confess, therefore, this day to you, my children, that in my heart I resolved on the death of Joseph, my brother, the true and good man. And I rejoiced that he was sold, 
because his father loved him more than us. For the spirit of jealousy and vainglory said to me, Thou thyself also art his son. And one of the spirits of Belier stirred me up, saying, Take this sword and with it slay Joseph. So shall thy father love thee when he is dead. So look at that. Remember Ahab? Remember Ahab? The thing for Ahab was following idols. And that's what drove him away. And it said that idols were in all of his works. When you read 1 Kings 21 and 26, it says, And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites. So he followed idols according to all things. It was in all his works, all his life. So we have to break free from the law of the enemy and cleave unto the light and the law of Elohim. And you see, even as Dan is speaking, you see the idols that were speaking to him. And he understood that it was idols speaking unto him. And this is the place that we have to get to, especially for a narcissist, is knowing when an idol was actually speaking to you. It said, For the spirit of jealousy and vainglory said to me, Thou thyself also art his son. Right, So you see that vexation that was being wrought by the spirit of jealousy and vainglory. Thou thyself art also his son. Like, yo, like, why he don't love me the same? And you can see now he's speaking back to a spirit. It's not just his thoughts. He's actually speaking and replying to a spirit. And that's what we do. It's the same thing. These spirits have not left the earth. And we're dealing with the exact same thing. So when you find yourself getting into that vexation and whatever thought that may have came to you and you're sitting there talking it out with that thought, you're actually giving into vexation of whatever spirit it is that's coming forth to you and speaking unto you. Then he says, and one of the spirits of Belier stirred me up. So another one actually got to him. And got him into his emotions. He didn't withstand it. He wasn't on guard. Saying take this sword. And with this slay Joseph. So these are just not thoughts. That we have. These are actually spirits. That are coming and speaking to us. And trying to insinuate. Their will upon our lives. For us to then be in agreement To then follow after them. So we have to be very mindful not to give ourselves into our thoughts, but instead give ourselves place to the law of Elohim, give ourselves place to the fruits of the spirit, give ourselves place to prayer so that we can actually come out of these things, come out of, of hearkening to an idol, come out of being angry and giving over to anger. Come out of the vexation by sitting upon our bed and breathing and gathering ourselves, then praying for direction and not going according to what thought you may be having. We have to be on guard. We have to be circumspect. For we don't know the enemy as well as the enemy knows us. So we have to learn our enemies. We have to learn how they work. We have to learn what's against us so that we can actually be successful and we can actually strive in righteousness. Um, continue in verse 8, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Verse 8. Now this is the spirit of anger that persuaded me to crush Joseph as a leopard crusheth a kid. So now we see that he actually understands that it's the spirit of anger. See, this is where we need to be is that we actually understand what spirits are against us at given moments so that we can actually stand away from them. We have to understand that these are spirits that are coming against us, right? So now we see that Dan is like, okay, this is the spirit of anger that persuaded me. The spirit of anger that persuaded me. And that touches back to that we have to actually be persuaded to be enticed. 
Right. Because Ahab was persuaded by the lying spirit to go die or get killed. So, you know, that accountability, like, we actually have to be attentive. And Naphtali said, be not eager through covetousness or with vain words, but guys our souls. So you mentioned not being hasty, taking our time or really help. Pay attention and understand where the thought's coming from. Where is it going? Who is it coming from? Before acting on it in thought or being persuaded by it to respond to the thought. Because mm -hmm. then those vain words are going to beguile our souls. Right, because you don't want to give heed to it. You give heed to the spirit and listen to it and give it place for you to actually think upon it. It's only giving it place in you. You're right. Isaac didn't respond to the devil when he spoke to him. He went straight to his father. Right. Cast it away from you. Yeah. Cast him forth the poison. Yeah. Cast it away from you. Because if you allow it to linger... It's only going to spread. Yeah. Yeah, and get it out quick. Makes sense, right? Simeon, flee to the Lord and the evil spirit will flee from you. You have peace. Your mind will rest. Right. So you can see how this is another hard topic for a narcissist. Right. Uh, that anxiety what is it the narcissistic rage stress then anger seeps in then comes aggression or frustration and anxiety or frustration and anger and then the rage not taking the right steps from the beginning this is how the day goes into a downward spiral and a narcissistic collapse yes it does And we're going to get further into that, too. So let's continue, Brother Kasa, please. Sure. But the Allahim of my fathers did not suffer him to fall into my hands so that I should find him alone and slay him and cause a second tribe to be destroyed in Israel. And now, my children, behold, I am dying, and I tell you of a truth that unless ye keep yourselves from the spirit of lying and of anger and love truth and long suffering, ye shall perish. Right. So we have to be intentional in these things. For narcissists, the things that come easy are the narcissistic traits. So we have to be intentional, standing against them. Being aware of those tactics and spirits that cause us to error in the ways of Allah Not looking for the easy way out, but resisting unto blood, as Hebrews 12 and 4 speaks. And doing what's hard for the sake of Allah Walking in love, truth, and long-suffering. That's hard, but it's easy. It's easy if you say it's easy. It's hard if you say it's hard. See, but the spirit of lying and anger, it's easy for a narcissist because that's what you're used to. But if you actually, like the potter's clay, if you actually flip things and have a different perspective, it makes it easy to walk in love, truth, and long-suffering. And those are the things that are going to deliver you. Let's continue, Brother Casa. So let's figure out what's going on with anger. Chapter 2, verse 2. For anger is blindness and does not suffer one to see the face of any man with truth. Right. So first off, we have to deal with that blindness of anger. Right. It would be great not to give in to anger in the first place because that's the goal. Where when you feel the vexation and you feel... You're trying to, the anger is trying to come upon you to then sit upon your bed, to breathe, 
to re-examine, to focus, to pray, to gather yourself, not to continue in the anger, to be blinded, right? Because once you're angry, you're blinded. So it defeats the purpose. So the main focus is to nip the vexation in the bud before it actually leads to you actually being angry, to being blinded, right? Because why does it not suffer one to see the faith of any man with truth, right? And that's what we're going to understand. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Sure. For though it be a father or a mother, he behaveth towards them as enemies. Though it be a brother, he knoweth him not. Though it be a prophet of the Lord, he disobeyeth him. Though a righteous man, he regardeth him not. Though a friend, he doth not acknowledge him. For the spirit of anger encompasseth him with the net of deceit, and blindeth his eyes, and through lying darkeneth his mind, and giveth him his own peculiar vision. Right. So we see what happens with anger. The spirit of anger encompasses him with the net of deceit. And what we're going to learn is that the spirit of anger, after the spirit of anger has taken root, then comes another spirit. Then comes another spirit. And that's why you end up being encompassed with the anger. You get the net of deceit because the spirit has to lie to you first so that you will be justified in your anger. So the spirit of anger justifies the sin, and through the spirit of anger, wrath enters into the body. If we don't sit down and breathe until we're calm and inquire for understanding, then we're given over to that anger. We're given over to that wrath. We're given over to the lying. So this is the vexation of wrath. The vexation of wrath is when the spirit of lion enters in. Because you have to be deceived first. You have to be justified in your anger to then be given over to wrath. So you get to see the difference of just anger and wrath. So you can be angry and not take action. You can be angry and not say anything. But it's actually wrath that actually causes you to say something or to do something. And that only comes with lying. Let's continue reading, Brother Costa, please. And wherewith encompasseth his eyes, with hatred of heart, so as to be envious of his brother. For anger is an evil thing, my children, for it troubleth even the soul itself. And the body of the angry man it maketh its own, and over his soul it getteth the mastery. And it bestoweth upon the body power that it may work all iniquity. Right. So when you have these, these different things going on at one time, you have the anger, you have the wrath, you have the lying. When you have those three come together and the hatred of heart, which comes with those, then it bestows power upon you to work all iniquity. And that's why you end up doing something and you justify it by saying, that's what I felt I needed to do. I felt I, I did what I needed to do. And that's the justification. Though you're lying to yourself because you didn't have to do that. That was another option. There's always another option. But not understanding that you're being given over to the spirits to work the works of iniquity. There is no other way. Not for them. 
So you have to understand what's working against you. Where is it trying to lead you? For we know that anger only is going to lead you in one direction. It's going to lead you to wrath. It's going to lead to lying. Because they go together. Right? So definitely have to be mindful of the spirit of anger and definitely dealing with things. If something happens, don't just ride over it and act like it didn't bother you when you know it did affect you because then you're giving over to lying and that gives place to wrath. But instead, love truth. Love truth and long suffering. Love that truth and say, hey, that did bother me. Let me deal with that. Let me make sure that I'm on the up and up. Make, let me make sure that I'm calm and that I work through that before I allow the spirit to just dwell in me and continue to build up things within me where I then get angry and now I'm given into wrath, feeling justified where I can be lied to and persuaded. Because at the end of the day, there's no justification for going into anger and wrath and operating in them. That's why it's a lie. But the lie is needed for you to do it. Uh, continue, Brother Casas, if you don't mind. Oh, that what you just touched on there was very important because that's if you catch it, that lie at the beginning and deal with it and get out of it, it's essential to stay out of narcissistic rage because right. that's stress. That's the vexation, too. Right. So definitely staying out of the vexation. That's yeah. the whole, that's for anybody, for anyone, whether dealing with narcissism or just dealing with anger in general. Catching that lie and catching the vexations is what really keeps you away from it. Yeah. I would add even dealing with anxiety and depression for mm -hmm. covering all. You catch it from the jump, then the stuff doesn't get to seep in. Because if we don't, was like you said, if you let that one ride by, it's going to seep in. Something else is going to happen, and it's right. going to just weigh you down. As they explained in the narcissist rage, where you go from stress to anxiety, and the agitation and frustration gonna come, and anger's got me. And it's gonna turn into a problem. It's already a problem. It's gonna manifest in the earth. I'm gonna do something that's gonna get me in trouble. It's just building upon itself to get you to wrath with lying. Amen. Thanks. Chapter three, verse one. And when the body does all these things. The soul justifieth what is done, since it seeth not aright. Therefore, he that is wrathful, if he be a mighty man, hath a threefold power in his anger, one by the help of his servants, and the second by his wealth, whereby he persuadeth and overcometh wrongfully, and thirdly, having his own natural power, he worketh thereby the evil. All right, so this specific behavior, when it comes to wrath with lying, when you get to that point, this specific behavior is more um, provident when it comes to an overt narcissist, but it's not limited only to an overt narcissist. Um, covert narcissists can also do the same thing, but it's more provident when it comes to an overt narcissist, where in their anger and in their wrath, They'll get other people to help them. And then they'll use their wealth to aid themselves in whatever it is, whether to persuade others or to use it to manipulate others to do things for them. And also, they'll use their own natural power to then work the evil. So, 
definitely be mindful. Be mindful of what you're giving yourself into. You know, not giving yourself over to the way to the world, not giving yourself over to wealth and money. For the love of money. So. Mm -hmm. Lust. Lust works with fornication. To get us away from our lion. This is you to talk about. It says... First Timothy 6 and 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, the love of it. So you can see using it for your power or using it for power is the love of money, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So trusting in that money and, and thinking that that money gives you more power to then have dominion over others. You're only piercing yourself with many more sorrows. Because it's to your detriment. It's not helping you not to become a better person. Not to keep the law. Not to operate in the fruits of the spirit. Anything that's not helping you do those things is detrimental to you. Continue, Brother Costa, please. And though the wrathful man be weak, yet hath he a power twofold of that which is by nature. For wrath ever aided such in lawlessness. This spirit goeth always with lying at the right hand of Satan, that with cruelty and lying his works may be wrought. Right. So we see that wrath and lion go hand in hand together. And it said, though the wrathful man be weak. So though the wrathful man isn't like the first one who having his own power, he worketh the evil. So if the wrathful man is not as strong physically, he still has twofold power. Right? Because that wrath is going to aid him in lawlessness. It's going to give him another way to get the same job done. So we see that that spirit's going to go always with lying at the right hand of Satan. And with cruelty and lying, his works may be wrought. So it gets worse. You're given over. You're blinded. And this is not where we want to be, ladies and gentlemen. We don't want to be blinded by wrath and lying. We want to get the vexation and deal with the vexation from the beginning and not give ourselves place to operate in anger though something may have gotten us angry we still have that chance of dealing with the vexation and not giving place to wrath with lying So be mindful that these spirits attach to anger. Wrath of lying attaches to anger. Vexation usually comes before or after anger. It, it can either come before only or it can come before and after. Right? Because then you go into the, the wrathful vexation. For wrath cometh in if the anger isn't dealt with to aid in the sin about to be done and lying from the vexation causes not only the narcissist to be deceived because the spirit has to deceive you first to work the works of error then believe in those lies you operate in the spirits you're in agreement with to then take on their qualities so it's very important to stop the anger when the vexation comes and hold on to truth in yache because that truth and that long suffering is actually what's going to deliver us in that vexation period to be able to come out of it. 
All right, Casa, let's go ahead and jump into Testament of Dan, chapter 4, verse 1, please. Sure. Understand ye, therefore, the power of wrath, that it is vain. For it first of all giveth provocation by word. Right. So we see that wrath first provokes the narcissist or any man that wrath is trying to enter into. So first, it provokes you by word. So that is the vexation of wrath. And it comes with lying. So it has to provoke you. It has to persuade you and get you in your emotions or get you stirred up so that then wrath itself can actually enter into you. And what happens when wrath itself enters into you? Can you continue reading, please, Brother Costello? Then by deeds, it strengtheneth him who is angry. Right. So then when wrath actually enters in, it actually brings forth the deeds of wrath. So you actually operate in the actual spirit of wrath, which stems from that anger. Right. So you see that wrath is strengthening them. So you can see that wrath actually entered in and it's actually operating within the vessel now. And that's why it's being so strong or so strengthened. All right. OK. Continue, Brother Costa, please. And with sharp losses disturbeth his mind. Right. And that's the lying. You see the sharp losses to disturb the mind. So it's like, OK. This happened to me, and this is why I feel this way. Or I suffered a loss, or something that may have been my fault happened, and now I'm angry, and now it gave place for the lion and the wrath to come in to disturb my mind while I'm not thinking all right. And go ahead, Brother Costa. And so stirreth up with great wrath his soul. Right. So then wrath completely overtakes you. So we see the deeds of wrath makes the narcissist of any man or woman in wrath feel better. They feel like they're getting it out. This is a lot of times what you will hear. That I'm, I'm, I'm getting it out. I'm expressing it. But it's just wrath overtaking their body. But they're only lied to and given over to the spirit because there's no gain in wrath. You may feel like someone has done you wrong which the sharp losses disturb your mind, but it's just vexation to keep you or make you fall into wrath. Kasa, you got anything on that? Yep, James, that's a, you explaining what James said to keep us from wrath. Where he said, uh, James 1 and 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of Allah. Mm -hmm. You were explaining how it starts off by the word. Hence, James is saying, be swift to hear. Pay attention to what we're hearing. Right. What we're listening to. Who's speaking. What they're what, saying. Right. And yeah. what we're hearing right. ourselves. Because perception, how are we receiving it? Like, pay attention to everything going on. It all starts in the mind. Because if we're hearing it, hearing the wrong thing or listening the wrong way, our mind is going to get disturbed. Or fall in agreement to the thing that's being said, though it may not be right. And so, the lying. Right. So, and that's a lot of times what happens to a narcissist is that that wrath starts speaking with lying to them and then they go off and operate or react or respond based off of that wrath and not actual truth. Right. And that's where you're like, well, a lot of them may know that it's actually a lie that they're hearing because it doesn't add up with what actually happened, but yet they're used to giving in to the lie. Yeah. The pleasure. Right. So the, you can see how that actually hinders them from actually holding on to truth, which is one of the main things that a narcissist actually has to do, and all of us have to do. So yeah. it's not just only geared to a narcissist. These things that any believer has to do. Amen. And that's why James said, be slow to speak. Uh, tying that in with what Naphtali said about don't be eager through covetousness. 
the beguiling of learn. Right. Or don't let you mention earlier with the hastiness that works through Satan. Mm-hmm. Instead of being, we truly have experienced these things. We truly have to be slow. Mm-hmm. Right. The, from the mind, not just, yes, he says slow to speak. James did, but he did start in our mind. Be swift to hear, listen and pay attention and take your time to assess everything before speaking. Because if we don't, whether in haste or eager to the feeling like I just, the, how that made me feel, what the provocation by a word, right. the way that word made me feel now I'm gone. Right. I'm in agreement. Yeah. You know, I'm in agreement. I'm persuaded. Yeah. That this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Go off into wrath. And it was important as you touch it where you said he uses it by a word. Dan is a I'm a wait when you get to what Dan says. He helps right. understand what wrath. We got more things. So we got a lot to touch on. So it's yeah. all gonna come up. Uh, let's continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Therefore, when anyone speaketh against you, be not ye moved to anger. And if any man praiseth you as holy men, be not uplifted. Be not moved either to delight or to discuss. Right. And that's very important for any one of us because that's temperance. Let's see if we don't stay in temperance, what will happen to us when wrath enters in? Uh, can we continue reading, please, Brother Costas? Well, first it pleaseth the hearing. First it pleaseth the hearing. So you can see that a person actually has pleasure in the lie that's being told to them. And that's the very first thing is not to have pleasure in the lie to hold fast to truth, hold fast to what's actually going on that doesn't work in your favor because you may have done something wrong and what Raph is doing is justifying you. So you have to watch that Raph was lying because a narcissist don't want to be wrong. They don't want to be the one that done something wrong. And because of that, Wrath with lying actually works in that area, making sure that you're not wrong. Finding a way where you're right in the scenario and not wrong to confess your fault or to humble yourself. So you see, it first pleases the hearing. So you actually have pleasure in it because it's telling you, hey, you're not wrong. You should be upset because... They're saying this, uh, that you've done this or whatever the case is, or you suffered that loss. And now you're like, okay, well, I have to find a way where I am right. So let's hold on to truth. This is very important. Um, keep on going, Brother Kasafu. And so maketh the mind keen to perceive the grounds for provocation. So you see, by saying what is pleasing to you, which is to get you out of the accountability and maketh the mind keen to perceive the grounds of provocation. So now the wrath with lion actually takes root. And then, of course, the wrath gets to enter in. And what happens next, Brother Cossifor? And then being enraged, he thinketh that he is justly angry. And then being enraged, he thinketh he is justly angry because wrath had got a chance to actually enter into your soul. So you're being enraged. You feel justified that you feel justified in the anger because of that wrath was lying. And now you're giving over. Narcissistic rage. That's how that works. But what do we do? How do we combat this? Can you continue, Brother Casa, please? If ye fall into any loss or ruin, my children, be not afflicted. All right. 
So if if you've done something wrong, if you suffered a loss or something happened to you, don't be afflicted. The scripture just before it says, when one speaketh against you, or if you suffer a loss or ruin, be not moved to anger. And if any man praise you, or if you're doing well, be not uplifted. Be not moved either to delight or disgust. Stay temperate in all things. So if you fall into any loss or ruin, don't be afflicted. Right? Because what we know from what Barnabas 19 and 6, the accidents that befall us counteth good, knowing that nothing cometh but by Elohim. It happened for a purpose. It happened for a reason. You're being tested. So you have to make sure that you actually do what's right in the test. Not to give over to wrath, because then you fail the test. So we have to put forth the, that effort and that work to do what's hard for us. Giving over to anger, wrath, believing a lie, to be justly angry, that's easy. That's easy for a narcissist. You actually have to do what's hard and not move to disgust or delight, to stay temperate, to not get afflicted. This is the work. I'll continue, Brother Kosovo. For this very spirit maketh a man desire that which is perishable. Mm -hmm. In order that he may be enraged through the affliction. Right. So this very spirit makes the man desire that which is minute. Which is things of the world, whatever the case is, things that are perishable, being seen in the sight of men or the, a certain way. All these things are perishable. But the reason why you hold fast to those perishable things is so that you can give place to anger if something doesn't go your way or if something or if something breaks or if something doesn't work out well. Because you have pleasure in the wrath. And that's why we have to get away from actually having that pleasure in wrath and finding and looking for ways to get angry. You're looking for it. That's why you're so keen to hearing wrath speak to you. Just like a man that's fighting against the spirit of lust. He's looking for something to look at. He's looking for, or she's looking for a man or a woman to look at, to lust after. And it's the same thing with wrath and anger. You're looking for something to be upset about. Instead of looking for peace. You got anything on that, Casa, before we keep moving? Oh, that is true. Okay. I've experienced it. Um, let's keep on going, please. And if you suffer loss voluntarily or involuntarily, be not vexed. All right. So if you suffer a loss... Either it being your fault or being someone else's fault. Don't give in to vexation. Sit there, go sit on your bed, breathe, calm yourself down, gather yourself, and then come back to it. Don't be vexed when you suffer a loss. Remember, don't move to disgust nor delight. Don't be upset. Just stay temperate. Go ahead, Brother Casa. For from vexation ariseth wrath with lying. So there goes the wrathful vexation. Okay. This is not the initial vexation that gets you into anger. This is the vexation that gets you into wrath. Okay. So we have to be mindful of the vexation of wrath with lying. And what do they do? What's going on with wrath and lying? How do they operate? Moreover, a twofold mischief is wrath with lying, and they assist one another in order to disturb the heart. And when the soul is continually disturbed, 
the Lord departed from it, and Belier ruleth over it. So we see the end goal of wrath with lying. They assist one another in order to disturb the heart. That is the goal that it wants to do to you. It wants to disturb your heart. Because once it disturbs your heart, then you're no longer at peace. And who dwells in peace? Allah Hayyam. The Holy Spirit dwells in tranquility. And when the soul is continually disturbed, so that means that you're not coming out of it, but it's continuing to happen and you're not calming yourself down, you're not getting out of it, the Lord departeth and Satan enters in and hath dominion over you. So you can't hear anything. That's a narcissistic collapse. We have to be honest with ourselves when something affects us, whether big or small, to take the time and not be hasty, but slow. Being slow in thought, slow in deed. Putting duties aside, anything that you got going on at the time that you may feel like you need to get to, put it aside to gather your soul. It'll get done. Maybe not in the time that you want, but this is your soul. Which one is more important? Putting things off to the side only gets placed for the vexation of wrath. So if you suffer the loss, whether it being your own fault or the fault of another, take the time and be honest with yourselves. Not acting like it didn't bother you so you can take the time and get back to the place of peace and of a sound mind to continue forward with your day without anger, wrath, and lying. Okay? That's a work. That's something that we're going to work on. Okay? All these things to come out of this, it takes time. And we're going to get into that. But it definitely takes time. And don't get discouraged. Uh, can we continue to chapter 5, verse 1, please, Brother Kasapur? Observe, therefore, my children, the commandments of the Lord, and keep his law. This is the key. Warn against pride makes it hard to be subject to anything. So working on the humbling process to keep the law piece by piece and hold yourself accountable or have an accountability partner that you trust and know to keep the law to hold you accountable is great gain to your growth in coming out of these spirits. Because keeping that law, we're going to get into this. Keeping the law is actually the forming of a new man. This is where the law actually helps us. Is Instead of us walking according to our own understanding and our own standard, the law then comes forth and gives a standard for us. This is why it's so hard for a narcissist to keep the law. Because the law that they're walking in is opposite of the law of Elohim. So actually putting yourself and submitting yourself to the law and actually holding yourself accountable to keep the law and keep all the law eventually is what actually is going to pull you out of narcissism. But you actually have to keep the law. You can't operate in deceit. You can't operate in guile. You have to actually do it with your whole heart. And not just seem righteous on the outside, but actually working the good and true works and cleaving unto the good inclinations, in which we're going to get into, that the inward man is actually clean and not just the outside of the cup. Continue, Brother Koss, if you don't mind, please. Depart from wrath and hate lying, that the Lord may dwell among you and Belier may flee from you. These are key and fundamental because you can't have pleasure in these spirits and come out of them. It doesn't work that way. Allah can only dwell with you when you don't desire wrath and lying. And this is the key with any spirit, not just wrath and lying. If you truly hate it, 
and depart from doing its works, it draws you closer to Elohim because you're aware of it and standing against it so the fruits of the spirit have a place to dwell. So when you stand against the evil spirits, it gives place for the righteous spirits to then have a place in you. Right? But we have to stand strong against them so that Elohim may dwell with us if we're hating these things and not having pleasure in them. So what are things that we can do, right, that can actually help us? Go ahead, Brother Casa. Speak truth, each one with his neighbor. Speak truth, each one with his neighbor. So in the, the journey of hate and lying, it's good to implement speaking truth with everyone. And I'm not saying to go and tell them what they got going on, what you're doing, being that person that's operating in pride to lift yourself up against someone by telling them their faults and telling them everything they had going on. That's not speaking truth. What I'm saying is speaking truth, like what you have going on, how you actually really feel, how how something made you feel, how you um, confessing your fault when you did something wrong. That's speaking truth. You have to remember that uh, Yahweh said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me in John 14 and 6. So holding on to Yahweh and speaking truth and not believing the lies that come with anger and wrath will deliver from these spirits. But it's essential to hold on to truth, seeing the enemy's tactics are more convenient to a narcissist to lean toward the lies. So resisting unto blood and standing on the rock of Yache is essential. So we have to make sure that we're not reverting back to what's easy and what comes natural to us. Truly putting on the yoke of Yache and remembering that he is the truth and that we have to believe the truth and walk in the truth for him to dwell amongst us. You got anything on that, Brother Kassafi? Right. Come to the light so our deeds may be reproved and we get closer to him. We have to go through that. Yeah. We have to go through the um affliction of being honest with ourselves and overcoming ourselves. That's the trial we have in the end of this world. We have to walk his way. All right, let's continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Speak truth, each one to his neighbor, so shall you not fall into wrath and confusion. Right. So if you're constantly speaking the truth about what's going on or what your part is in it, and you're being honest, it doesn't give place for wrath and confusion, which is lying. Because the lion causes confusion. That's why anyone that's in a relationship with a narcissist, they feel very confused because of that wrath with lying. Lying brings confusion. That's why when it says that, um, what does it say about the devil? In James 3 and 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. That's why it seems very confusing because of that lying and that wrath. So if you've ever been in a relationship with a narcissist, I, I understand. And it may seem like you're like things are just being flipped upside down from the actual reality of what happened. But what's happening is, is the wrath was lying. And that's where they're turning the script, where they're in the right and you're in the wrong. Although they may have done something to you. So you have to be very mindful of that, about the wrath was lying, which brings forth that confusion. And holding fast unto the truth. For a person that's with the narcissist, you have to hold fast to the truth too. Because if you're a believer, 
these are the things that we have to walk in too. So everyone is held to the same standard and accountability. Continue, Brother Costa, please. But ye shall be in peace. So you speak truth, each one to his neighbor, you're going to be in peace because it's the truth. You're going to be in agreement with your partner because they're going to say, yeah, that's, that's true. Thank you. You're going to take accountability because it's true. What happened was true. So you are going to have peace. Go ahead, Brother Kassava. May I add something? Yes. With overcoming narcissism, this is the simple way of what needs to be done. We have to be mindful of the respect of persons and men pleasing. Because it takes being focused on Allah Hayyam only to do what's right in his sight, to be able to speak truth and be at peace. Because the vexation can also play in after the truth has been told, worrying about how somebody feels about it and how it makes us look. The vexation can play on that on the back end, or it can play right at the beginning where we'll know what the truth is, but be afraid to say something for fear of how it'll make us look. And then we'll give in to men pleasing or being an enabler or something, just not being honest, not telling the truth in order to save face or, yeah, save face to maintain a certain perception or avoid vulnerability. So, thank you. You're welcome. All right, whenever you're ready. But you shall be in peace, having the Allahim of peace so shall no war prevail over you. So you see that once you walk in that truth and you speak truth to your neighbor, getting away from men pleasing, getting away from not wanting to be vulnerable, getting away from not wanting to be seen in the sight of men a certain way because you made a mistake or you did something wrong, which everyone does something wrong. These are things that you have to get over. So shall no war prevail over you. So if you do these things, no war is going to prevail over you because you're speaking truth. You're not allowing wrath of lying to come in and to take you away from Elohim, but allowing Elohim to dwell there and not depart by you actually speaking truth and actually staying in it. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Love the Lord through all your life and one another with a true heart. Right. So you see, you shall be in peace, having the Elohim of peace. So you see, Elohim is aiding you once you actually walk in truth and actually, you actually hold fast to truth. Love the Lord through all your life and one another with a true heart. We have to grow in diligence when we do make changes. Not to change for a short while, then revert back to your original ways. But doing it for Allah Hayyam, not doing it for men. Because if you do it for men, you're going to revert back. If you do it for Allah Hayyam, you're going to keep it. Doing it for Allah Hayyam through all your life. And by doing that, we'll grow to love one another with a true heart. So that's how you actually end up getting to doing things with a true heart. It's by actually holding fast to Allah and holding fast to the law and speaking truth and holding fast to truth. That actually grows you over time to actually love one another with a true heart because you love Allah Okay. Let's skip down to chapter six, please. And then we're going to keep on going. Chapter six, verse one. And now fear the Lord, my children, and beware of Satan and his spirits. 
draw near unto Allah and unto the angel that intercedeth for you. For he is a mediator between Allah and man. All right, that's Yahweh Christ. And for the peace of Israel, he shall stand up against the kingdom of the enemy. Therefore is the enemy eager to destroy all that call upon the Lord. For he knoweth that upon the day on which Israel shall repent, the kingdom of the enemy shall be brought to an end. All right, and that's key, especially for Israel. Because we're the ones, if we repent, his kingdom shall be brought to an end. So let us repent and do it quickly. That's how we fight against the enemy, by no longer doing his works. We have power. If we all come together in one body in Yahweh Christ and stand away from the works of the enemy, his kingdom will cease. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And this is our weapons to actually cease from doing the works of the enemy, that his kingdom may actually be destroyed. So Israel, this is for us because his kingdom gets destroyed by us. And that's why it's so important for Israel to actually get it and to come out of it because that's the end of the enemy's kingdom. Let's continue, Brother Cost. Oh, you got something? That verse, actually, Paul was relaying exactly what Dan was referring to, if I may read it. Go ahead. He said... Second Corinthians 10 and 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Allah to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Allah and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Mm-hmm. So there goes the precept to actually confirm that this is true. So yeah, be mindful and be encouraged. For anyone that's a believer in Yache, that's of the 12 tribes, that we have to fulfill righteousness. We have to come out of the works of the enemy and the deeds of the enemy so that his kingdom will actually fall. Kasi, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Testament of Dan, chapter 6, verse 5. For the very angel of peace shall strengthen Israel, that it fall not into the extremity of evil. And it shall be in the time of the lawlessness of Israel that the Lord will not depart from them, but will transform them into a nation that doeth his will. For none of the angels will be equal unto him. And his name shall be in every place in Israel and among the Gentiles. Keep therefore yourselves, my children, from every evil work. And cast away wrath and all lying and love truth and long suffering. Hmm. So we have to love truth and long suffering. That actually gets us away from the wrath and all lying. Loving truth and long suffering. Continue, Brother Costa. We're going to go into those things. And the things which ye have heard from your father, do ye also impart to your children, that the Savior of the Gentiles may receive you. For he is true and long suffering, meek and lowly and teacheth by his works the law of Allah. Depart therefore from all unrighteousness and cleave unto the righteousness of Allah. Right. So we have the same responsibility to teach by our works the law of Allah. It says teach by our works the law of Allah. So we actually have to work it. We actually have to do it. And that's how we teach, by actually doing it ourselves. And by the things that you're teaching, by your works, you go and you teach those same things to your children that you're learning. That's our responsibility. 
to love truth with long suffering, to teach by our works the law of Elohim, and by learning these things, we teach them also to our children. Okay. We're going to jump over to the Testament of Asher. We're going to go to chapter 1, verse 3. And now we're going to go into the inclinations of the mind so we can actually touch on the proper thoughts and mindsets. Before we jump, I thought everything you just explained on wrath and lying from the clinical perspective of what was explained that causes narcissistic rage, you basically just gave us understanding on how to stay out of the stress understanding to cast away the wrath and lying and stay out of it to stay out of the confusion all that will help us keep from the first step that tumbles on down to narcissistic rage so we can not fall into it again praise our line for that amen testament of asha chapter 1 verse 3 two ways hath Allah am given to the sons of men and two inclinations, and two kinds of action, and two modes of action, and two issues. Therefore, all things are by twos, one over against the other, and there are two ways of good and evil, and with these are the two inclinations in our breasts discriminating them. Therefore, if the soul take pleasure in the good inclination, all its actions are in righteousness, and if it's sin, it straightway repenteth. So that's the good inclination. The good inclination is when you do something wrong, you confess it. You straightway repent of it. Not trying to hide it. Not trying to, to justify it. You repent. You confess it. All its actions are in righteousness. It's a key part because we can't just do some righteousness and then do some evil. We have to have all our actions in righteousness. For we see if all our actions are in righteousness, then we would repent quickly if we error. That's a good sign to let us know if we're doing things in sincerity or not. Let's really understand what he's referring to. Can we continue, Brother Casa, please? For well, having its thoughts set upon righteousness and casting away wickedness, it straightway overthroweth the evil and uprooteth the sin. Right. So we have to do things out of sincerity of heart and not for gain. When our own interest gets involved, it perverteth the good that we hope to do. For our covetousness leads us away from the needs of others or doing what's right and leads us to the needs of ourselves and selfishness. So even if you have a good inclination to do something good, you have to be very mindful not to find something for you to gain out of it as well. Because then that taints the inclination, the good inclination. So make sure that it's a good inclination in the first place so that all your actions are in righteousness. And also, don't allow a bad inclination or evil inclination to then taint the original good inclination by trying to get something out of it yourself or, or seeing something that you desire in the midst of doing the good. Be very mindful of that. All right, because that's the covetousness and the selfishness. Continue, Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. But if it incline to the evil inclination, all his actions are in wickedness, and it driveth away the good, and cleaveth to the evil, and is ruled by Belier. Even though it work what is good, he perverted it to evil. Right. 
So you see that you may have had a good inclination to do something very well, but then by finding your own gain out of it or finding something where you may benefit out of it, you actually turn it to evil and you pervert it to evil. So we can understand why it's perverted to evil now that we didn't stay in that selflessness and doing what was right in the sight of Allah but instead looking for our own gain, looking for what we can get out of it instead of doing it out of sincerity. So let's put on that sincerity and do all things in, in truth and in sincerity and goodness so that we may not taint that good inclination that we actually listen to from the angel of righteousness. Let's keep it pure so that we may not defile it and that we may complete a good work. You got anything, Kata, before we go? No, sir. All right, let's keep moving. For well, whenever it beginneth to do good, he forces the issue of the action into evil for him. Right. So you see, that initial thought was good. But whenever it begins to do good, so that's the initial inclination, the good inclination, he forces the issue of the action into evil for him or her. So you're actually, you're finding something where you can gain out of it. And that's what actually ruins the good inclination. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Seeing that the treasure of the inclination is filled with an evil spirit. Right. So we have to be mindful not to ruin the treasure of the good inclination that was given unto us and that we hearkened unto and that we were persuaded by to then fill it with an evil spirit through covetousness or fornication to beguile our souls. Let's continue, Brother Katafo. A person then may, with words, help the good for the sake of the evil. Right. So you see now he's going further into explaining different circumstances of how this may happen. A person then may, with words, help the good for the sake of evil. So you may say with words how you want to help, but there's an underlying thing that's going on. You have your own intention. You have your own gain in the midst of the words that are good that you're actually speaking. Instead of just allowing it to be the good and to let your words be your words, you're being double-minded. And that's where you fall because of that double-mindedness. Uh, continue, Brother Costa, please. Yet the issue of the action leadeth to mischief. Right. There is a man who showeth no compassion upon him who serveth his turn in evil. Right. So we see, yet the issue of the action leadeth to mischief, because we see just the double-mindedness that actually leads to the mischief, and it actually destroys the good inclination. Now, there's a man that shows no compassion upon him who serveth his turn in evil. So if a man makes a mistake and the Lord is afflicting him in chastisement, have compassion for him. Or if a man is still struggling in righteousness, have compassion. For we don't know the end of that man to be a judge ourselves but we are all called to be servants to help our brothers and sisters, seeing that we require Allah to have compassion on us. So we have to have compassion on those that may be struggling, on someone that may be getting chastised for what they've done wrong. So have compassion on them instead of lifting yourself up against them and feeling better than them. Seeing that we all make mistakes and Allah is chastening all of us to be perfect. We're all in this race together to get to the same place and we all have the same goal. 
So have compassion on others as you expect Elohim to have compassion on you for the wrongs that you do yourself. Speak truth. That's why it's very important to hold on to truth, remembering that you make mistakes too and not forgetting your mistakes when you see other people making mistakes so or someone else going through something and forgetting everything that you have going on so that you can feel better about yourself. Just hold fast to truth and you will feel better about yourself. Hold fast to the law of Elohim and you will feel better about yourself. Like, we have things to focus on. Right. Let's continue, please, but ethical. And this thing hath two aspects, but the whole is evil. There is a man that loveth him that worketh evil, because he would prefer even to die in evil for his sake. All right. So examine yourself if you take pleasure when others do wrong or you're provoking others to fall through envy or jealousy. For this is the spirit of the enemy. We have to come out of the crab in a bucket mentality trying to bring others down with us or enjoying just being better than others for our own lack of believing we can come out of it. And putting forth the effort to understand and resist so you actually have to understand what's working against you so that you're able to resist it. If you're here today, I know you desire to understand. And Elohim be gracious for you to learn that you may resist unto blood and stay away from the spirits that's leading to error. And that's what we're here for. And Elohim willing, we're going to get all these answers so that we can understand. Let's continue, Brother Casa, please. And concerning this, it is clear that it hath two aspects, but the whole is an evil work. Though indeed he have love, yet is he wicked, who concealeth what is evil for the sake of the good name. But the end of the action tendeth unto evil. Right. We have to remember Allah in way of the spirit. So concealing the evil that you do, just so you can be viewed a certain way to people, is your detriment. Because the true judge is watching and taking record of your inner workings, thoughts, and actions. So having that true fear of Elohim and knowing that he's weighing the spirit, he's actually seeing everything that you do and that you can't conceal your evil to keep a good name so that you're seen in the sight of men a certain way. You have to remember that Elohim is looking upon everything and keep that in your heart. That not wanting to do wrong for the fear of Elohim, at least he should see it. So let's hold fast to that. Remember, Elohim, he seeth the thoughts. He see if yeah, he see he know he knows the spirits that are dwelling in you that enter in and enter out of you. And he also knows your actions, right? Remember that so that we can actually have that in mind when the spirits are trying to come against us to lie to us or to get us to do something that's unjust. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Another stealeth and doeth unjustly, plundereth, defraudeth, and withal pitieth the poor. This too hath a twofold aspect, but the whole is evil. So let's not walk according to our own righteousness. This is what's being explained right here. This is your own righteousness. Another he steals, he doeth unjustly, he plundereth, he defraudeth, but he has pity on the poor. So that man is walking according to his own righteousness. But rather look upon the law of Elohim and the fruit of the Spirit and hold fast to his commandments, that we may be complete in following after him and not a hypocrite. Okay, we don't want to be a hypocrite walking according to our own righteousness and doing the things that seem right in our sight 
but instead being circumspect to the law. This is where that law is very important because it actually gets us away from our works that may be wrong. And it gives us a standard of how we're supposed to operate, how we're supposed to think, what we're supposed to think, what we're supposed to be persuaded to or convinced in so that then we can actually make changes and actually be held accountable to those changes until it becomes habitual. Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. He who defrauded his neighbor provoketh Allah and sweareth falsely against the Most High, and yet pitieth the poor. The Lord who commanded the law, he setteth at naught and provoketh, and yet he refresheth the poor. He defileth the soul and maketh gay the body. He killeth many and pitieth a few. This too hath a twofold aspect, but the whole is evil. So the pride of narcissism makes you want to be a judge. So true humility and compassion is needed. Striving to put the needs of others before yourselves and not seeking out a place for gain for yourself will enable that purity. So you see, he defrauded his neighbor, provoked by the high end, swears falsely against the most high, and yet pitieth the poor. Ahio who commanded the law said it that not and provoketh, yet he refreshes the poor. He defileth the soul and maketh gay the body. He killeth many and pitieth a few. He's a judge. He's making the decisions that this person deserves this, that person deserves that, this person deserves to die, that person deserves to live. Now, Philippians 2 and 3 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. So we see that this actually has to do with pride. That's why humility and compassion is needed. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So don't only look for how you can profit or look how you view things or, or what you want, but look also on the things of others. To see what other people need. To see what's going on with other people. To see how you can help them. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Yache. So let's be selfless in purity, not looking for our own gain, not looking upon the things of our own, but looking upon the things of others and making sure that we're being servants and not judges. Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. Another committeth adultery and fornication and abstaineth from meats. And when he fasteth, he doeth evil. And by the power of his wealth, he overwhelmeth many. And notwithstanding his excessive wickedness, he doeth the commandments. This too hath the twofold aspect, but the whole is evil. Such men are hares, clean like those that divide the hoof but in very deed are unclean for Allah I am in the tables of the commandments hath thus declared all right so this person that they're describing right here this is the Allah I am is always with me mindset no matter what I do the Lord knows my heart and that it is good but by your works you show that your heart is evil. Let's not be deceived through pride. You see, he commits adultery and fornication, abstains from meat, and when he fasteth, he doeth evil, and by the power of his wealth, he overwhelms many, and notwithstanding his excessive wickedness, he doeth the commandments. 
So he's doing all these things wrong, but he feels like he's doing the commandments. So you can see that's the, the Lord knows my heart. The Lord is always with me. If you fall into that mindset, you're going to error. Trust and believe me. Because in Jeremiah 17 and 9, Allah declares that he doesn't know your heart. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Allah doesn't even know your heart. So in truth, it's not true. And why is it not true? What does Allah actually view? What does he actually weigh? It says, Allah actually weighs the spirit and not the heart. Because he doesn't know the heart. Because it's deceitful. Proverbs 16 and 2 says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. So he looks and sees how many of his spirits are in you and how many of the enemy spirits are in you. And that's how he determines where you are and what you have going on. So let's rid of those evil spirits so Allah can only see the good, clean, wonderful spirits in us. All right? So let's stay away from that Allah knows my heart and that Allah is with me through it all no matter what I'm doing. Because yes, he loves you, but he doesn't love the works that you do all the time. And he is weighing those spirits that dwell in you. And we're going to go into that. We're definitely going to go into it. Uh, let's continue, Brother Kafa. You got anything? Yeah, he's not an enabler. No, he's not. Chapter 3 of Asher. But do not ye, my children, wear two faces like unto them, of goodness and of wickedness, but cleave unto goodness only. For Allah hath his habitation therein, and men desire it. But from wickedness flee away, destroying the evil inclination by your good works. Hmm. So destroying the evil inclination by your good works. So when that evil inclination, that evil thought comes to your head, you destroy it by doing what's right. We're getting some real good information here. I, I hope everyone is paying attention and I hope everyone going to apply these things and go back over this lesson over and over how many times you need to that you can actually have it concrete and understand it and remember it. Okay, let's continue, Brother Kasa, please. For they that are double-faced serve not Allah but their own lusts, so that they may please Belier and men like unto themselves. So destroying the evil inclination by our good works, we have to put in the work to truly want to do good and help people without our own profit being involved. Just doing it selflessly and staying in the good work without finding a way to gain for yourself. Let's do all things to please Allah. For they that are double faced serve not Allah. So when you have two contrary inclinations, you're not serving Allah, but your own lust. And you're actually pleasing the devil and men that are double-faced as well or double-minded. So let's stay away from that so that we can actually be pure as Allah wants us to be pure and holy as he desires for us to be holy. Having that good inclination and holding fast to the good inclination and allowing our actions to follow the good inclination without any double-mindedness of our own profit or our own gain. Let's continue, Brother Casa, please. For good men, even they that are of single face, though they be thought by them that are double face to sin, are just before Allah Hayyam. For many in killing the wicked do two works, of good and evil, but the whole is good because he hath uprooted and destroyed that which is evil. All right. So an example of killing the wicked 
is if a person is doing wrong and not helping them in their wrongdoing to be an enabler. That's actually killing the wicked. It's not only physical as the text describes. So just staying away from evil and not partaking in other people's evil, you're actually killing the wicked because you're not helping their works and even standing against it. Saying, hey, like that's not right. I don't want no parts of that. You're actually killing it. So let's be mindful and let's be encouraged to stand away from evil and to cleave unto the righteousness of Allah. Continue, Casa, please. One man hateth the merciful and unjust man, and the man who committed adultery and fasted. This too hath a twofold aspect, but the whole work is good because he followeth the Lord's example, in that he accepteth not the seeming good as the genuine good. All right. So being circumspect is a good thing. Not just giving people the benefit of the doubt by what they're saying or seeing a few actions, not giving them the benefit of the doubt, but being observant of their works and consistency. That's a good thing. And that actually will help a person that is dealing with the narcissist. It's being circumspect. And they're actually not just giving them the benefit of the doubt of what they're saying to you or just a few actions that they may have made trying to, to persuade you that they've changed or whatever the case is, that you're actually observing their behavior and seeing if they're consistent and for those that are struggling with the spirit of narcissism, make sure that you're being circumspect of yourself. Right? So it, it plays on both sides. Not just that you're seeming good, but that you're actually genuinely good. Okay? Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. Another desireth not to see a good day with them that riot, lest he defile his body and pollute his soul. This too is double-faced, but the whole is good. For such men are like to stags and to hinds, because in the manner of wild animals they seem to be unclean, but they are altogether clean, because they walk in the zeal of the Lord and abstain from what Allah also hateth and forbiddeth by his commandments, warding off the evil from the good. Right. So watching your friends and the things they do are good. Right? Making sure that you understand what they have going on. For many place stumbling blocks before you to cause you to fall, not respecting your boundaries. So you can see... You're like, hey, you know, I'm keeping the law. These are things that I don't do. These are things that I don't eat. These are things that I'm working on. And some friends will not respect those things. And they will actually cause you to fall, or place stumbling blocks, or put you in, in situations where you are tempted. Right? So you have to be circumspect about who you're hanging around. Because it says another desire is not to see a good day with them that riot. At least he defile his body and pollute his soul. So he's actually guarding himself. So you have to be mindful of why you're hanging around those people. Is it to fulfill your own lust? To fulfill your own desires? Or is it to feel like you're better than them? To be around people that don't have as much understanding as you or aren't as far mentally or spiritually as you, you have to examine yourself as to why you're doing what you're doing, right? Examining why you're hanging around them. Examining what, you, what you're getting out of it and being truthful. This is another example of speaking truth. 
so that we can actually understand. That's why Psalm 15 says, Who shall enter into my holy tabernacle? Those that speak the truth in their heart. We have to speak the truth to ourselves. And we have to guard ourselves so that we can actually do what's right and keep the commandments. Let's continue, Katha, please. You see, my children, how that there are two in all things, one against the other, and the one is hidden by the other. In wealth is hidden covetousness. In conviviality, drunkenness. All right. So there's two things to everything. In wealth, you can also fall into covetousness. In conviviality, which is the quality of being friendly and lively, it means like, um, like being joyful, technically. Drunkenness is the opposite. So being joyful, you can fall into drunkenness, right? Continue, Brother Cotton. In laughter, grief. All right. It's the opposite. In wedlock, profligacy. All right. So in marriage, one is wedlock is marriage, and profligacy is reckless extravagance or the wasteful in the use of resources. So that means that you're all over the place. You're reckless. You're just doing whatever you want to do which would more likely be fornication. Go ahead. Death succeeded to life, dishonor to glory, night to day, and darkness to light. And all things are under the day, just things under life, unjust things under death. Wherefore also eternal life awaited death. Nor may it be said that truth is a lie, nor right wrong. For all truth is under the light, even as all things are under Allah All these things, therefore, I proved in my life, and I wondered not from the truth of the Lord. And I searched out the commandments of the Most High, walking according to all my strength with singleness of face unto that which is good. Right. So we see that he walked according to all his strength with singleness of face. So he actually was working it. Like it wasn't just coming naturally. It wasn't just coming easy. He was putting in the work, putting in the effort, putting in the time to actually do these things. He said he searched out the commandments of the Most High. That means he, he was studying. He was reading. He was learning so that he could apply it in his life, so that he could walk according to all his strength to keep it with singleness of faith. And this is what we have to do for any person, whether narcissist or not. We all have to do the same thing so that we can actually keep the commandments and actually change from the habits or the things that we learned in our lives that were against the commandments. Continue, Brother Costa, please. He investigated the deity in truth. Yes, he did investigate the deity. Chapter 6. Take heed, therefore, ye also, my children, to the commandments of the Lord, following the truth with singleness of face. For they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin. For they both do the evil thing and they have pleasure in them that do it. Right. So we have to stay away from vainglory and jealousy and envy. Walking in doubt ourselves to then relish when others are in the place you're at. So we have to stay away from that. That's why I said, for they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin. For they both do the evil thing. So one, you have that doubt that you can't get it right or that you can't change. So you continue to do the evil thing. And they have pleasure in them that do it too. Which is where that jealousy and envy comes in. 
to see others at the same place that you are and have pleasure in that. Let's not be there. Let's stay away from that vainglory, that pride. Let's stay away from that jealousy and that envy that we want to see our brother do well, our sister do well, that we want to do well ourselves. Not being double-faced. Right? So we have to sincerely want to do what's right and strive to come out of it. Not allowing doubt to cause us to think that it's too hard. Because it's only hard if we put our mind to saying that it's too hard. If we say it's easy, it's easy and we're going to keep it and do it. Continue, Casa, please. For they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin. For they both do the evil thing and their pleasure in them that do it, following the example of the spirits of deceit and striving against mankind. Do ye therefore, my children, keep the law of the Lord, and give not heed unto evil as unto good, but look unto the thing that is really good, and keep it in all the commandments of the Lord, having your conversation therein, and resting therein. Right. So don't depart from the good for any occasion. No matter what's going on, don't depart from the good, and don't depart from the law. But stay in it, guarding it with your life having our conversation in it, keep it on your mind and resting therein. Think about it before you go to sleep. Think about the law. Think about good things that you can do. Hold fast to those good inclinations. And if you see that you're searching for something that you can get out of it, stop. Recorrect it. Say, hey, that's not right. Speak truth. Pray about it if you don't know. This is where truth comes in and it really helps us because we have to speak truth to our own selves so that we actually can combat the, the works of the enemy. Let's continue, Casa, please. For the latter ends of men do show their righteousness or unrighteousness. When they meet the angels of the Lord and of Satan. For when the soul departs troubled, it is tormented by the evil spirit, which also it served in lusts and evil works. But if he is peaceful, with joy he meeteth the angel of peace, and he leadeth him into eternal life. Right. So just as we spoke of before, that Alahayim doesn't know the heart but he weigheth the spirits we can see right here for this to be true yet again and we also com can confirm this right here also with the apocalypse of paul from chapter 13 to 18 because there it's, it's just it's true okay and the records confirm it so alahayim actually sees the spirits in us and that's how he actually judges us so let's be mindful of these things so that we can actually come out of them and actually see a right. Seeing that Alahayim knoweth the inner workings of us so that we can actually have that fear of him to not want to do wrong in his sight, nor allow any of these spirits to dwell amongst us or within us in our soul to cause Alahayim to see that evil in us Right, let's continue. Chapter 7, verse 1. Please. All right. Become not my children as Sodom, which sinned against the angels of the Lord and perished forever. Right. For the people of Sodom were given over to their lusts. So let's resist, so that we may overcome by resisting unto blood and not giving up in self-pity, which is sorrow, and allowing doubt to get the best of us. All right, so let's not give over to our lust, but let's fight. Like we have to fight, we have to have, uh, we have to have insight of what's going on and what we need to do, so that then we can put forth that effort, which is half the battle, 
to actually fight. So half of it is the insight to understand what's against us, to understand what we need to do to combat it. And the other half is the effort of truly putting forth the work in. Okay, so let's get out of that doubt. Let's get out of that sorrow. And let's go ahead and put our hands to the plow. Okay. Let us hear edification. If we feel wrong by someone to guard ourselves, at least we'd be overtaken in evil. Let's go into the Testament of Gad, chapter 1, verse 2, please. Testament of Gad, chapter 1, verse 2. Talk in my children. I was the ninth son born to Jacob, and I was valiant in keeping flocks. Accordingly, I guarded at night the flock, and whenever the lion came or the wolf or any wild beast against the fold, I pursued it and overtaken it, I seized its foot with my hand and hurled it about a stone's throw and so killed it. Now Joseph, my brother, was feeding the flock with us for upwards of thirty days, and being young, he fell sick by reason of the heat. And he returned to Hebron to our father, who made him lie down near him, because he loved him greatly. And Joseph told our father that the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah were slaying the best of the flock, and eating them against the judgment of Reuben and Judah. For he saw that I had delivered a lamb out of the mouth of a bear, and put the bear to death, but had slain the lamb, being grieved concerning it, that it could not live and that we had eaten it. And regarding this matter, I was wroth with Joseph until the day that he was sold, and the spirit of hatred was in me, and I wished not either to hear of Joseph with the ears or see him with the eyes, because he rebuked us to our faces, saying that we were eating of the flock without Judah. For whatsoever thing he told our father, he believed him. I confess now my sin, my children, that oftentimes I wish to kill him, because I hated him from my heart. Moreover, I hated him yet more for his dreams. All right. Well, let's remember, if a man prosper, wish for him to have perfect prosperity, and not allow a hatred to enter in. We don't want to be haters of Elohim, because he sends the dreams and enables one to do well. So be mindful of hatred and remember and believe that you too can overcome your struggles to get to the place to be utilized by Allah and work good works. We just have to focus to have pure inclinations without any wormwood. Now, we see in this story that Gad actually delivered the lamb out of the mouth of a bear, right? But what we don't see is Gad going and speaking to Joseph about what happened. Instead, Gad just gave in to anger. Did Gad keep the law of Matthew 18? And if his brother trespassed against him, go and speak to him and them alone. Now you see, so we can have a good example of anger and the vexation of wrath with lying. So that we can actually see, hey, if I actually sat down and took the time and actually thought about the law and what I should do. He would have been able to say, okay, let me go talk to Joseph and, and explain to him what happened and see if we can come to an accord that he can go and correct it to the father. Then it wouldn't have gave place for hatred. So you see how the law is our standard. The law is our rudiments that actually keeps us from going into evil spirits. Let's be mindful. There's always another way. Even though you feel like the way that you're doing things is the only way or the right way, there's always another way. And a better way or the real right way. Not that, you know, 
you have to be able to confess your faults and your errors that maybe your way isn't the right way so that you can actually be open to actually receiving the true right way or a better way, right? And in this, we're talking about the law, which is perfect. So if it's not according to the law, it's not the right way. Let's continue, Casa, please. And I wish to lick him out of the land of the living, even as an ox licketh up the grass of the field. Therefore I and Simeon sold him to the Ishmaelites for thirty pieces of gold, and ten of them we hid, and showed the twenty to our brethren. And thus through covetousness we were bent on slaying him. All right. So you see the covetousness. He formulated his own assumptions because of the lion wrath. So we actually get to see both sides. We get to see God not keep the law. And also give in to the anger, give in to the vexation, the anger, the vexation, wrath, and also the wrath of lying. We see him giving in to it. So he formulated his own assumptions. He actually was persuaded by the lying of wrath, right? Because of covetousness. So you see that there was actually something in it for him that allowed him to agree with the wrath with lying. Desiring to be like Joseph because of his dreams, instead of being thankful for who he is and working righteousness. It's easier just to give in to the wrath and anger than putting forth the effort and doing what's right in the sight of Elohim. And this is what narcissists fall into. And this is why that law holding fast to that law and being slow and not hasty when something happens, when you suffer loss or ruin, to actually go and say, okay, what does the law tell me to do? Let me breathe. Let me gather myself. Let me pray. Okay, what does the law tell me to do? What am I supposed to do in this scenario? These are the things that's actually going to help us come out of it and allow us to, to have a new mechanism in place than doing what's wrong and putting forth this new mechanism to help us do what's right. And In chapter 2, verse 5. All right. And the Elohim of my fathers delivered him from my hands that I should not work lawlessness in Israel. And now, my children, hearken to the words of truth to work righteousness and all the law of the Most High. So let's work all the law. Not some, but all. This puts our whole body in subjection, right? And that's what we need. We don't want to give any place room to then work evil. But we have to put the whole body in subjection. And that's by keeping the whole law and not some only. Okay, so this is how we actually work true righteousness is by keeping all the law of the Most High. And that's what actually saves us. Okay, so if you find yourself lacking in anything or for those that are just learning and growing, just remember that you have to get to the point where you keeping all the law, right? It's okay, you know, to learn and a righteous man falls several times, but he gets back up. You're going to make your mistakes. You're going to get your bumps and your bruises. But just be mindful that your goal is to keep all the law so that there's no place for the enemy to dwell or to enter in. Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. All right. And go not astray through the spirit of hatred. For it is evil in all the doings of men. Whatsoever a man doeth, the hater abominateth him. And though a man worketh the law of the Lord, he praiseth him not. Though a man feareth the Lord, and taketh pleasure in that which is righteous, he loveth him not. He dispraiseth the truth, he envieth him that prospereth, he welcometh evil speaking. 
he loveth arrogance, for hatred blindeth his soul, as I also then looked on Joseph. So if we find ourselves having pleasure in any of these and working these works, we need to examine ourselves, seeing that it still has place in us, to then put more vigilance in that specific area or areas. So we have to speak truth again if we see that we're doing any of these things. If a man worketh the law, we praise him not. We're not, we're like, uh uh. Like, he's doing well. He can't be doing that well. He's got to be doing something wrong. If you find yourself saying things like these, like, you need to examine yourself. Okay? If you find yourself envying people that are prospering or doing well, or you welcome evil speaking, you're saying something bad about someone, or if someone comes and starts talking or gossiping about somebody, you entertain it and you partake. It's good to examine yourself, okay? So that you can stand away from those things. Brother Costa, you ready? Yes. All right. Beware, therefore, my children of hatred, for it worketh lawlessness even against the Lord himself. For it will not hear the words of his commandments concerning the love of one's neighbor, and it sinneth against Allah. For if a brother stumble, it delighteth immediately to proclaim it to all men, and is urgent that he should be judged for it, and be punished, and be put to death. And if it be a servant, it stirreth him up against his master. And with every affliction it deviseth against him, if possibly he can be put to death. For hatred worketh with envy also against them that prosper. So long as it heareth of or seeth their success, it always languisheth. For as love would quicken even the dead, and would call back them that are condemned to die, so hatred would slay the living, and those that had sinned venially, it would not suffer to live. For the spirit of hatred worketh together with Satan, through hastiness of spirit, in all things to men's death. In all things to what? In all things to men's death. All right. We do go over this in great detail in the spirit of anger lesson, so definitely make sure you check out that lesson. But we get to see the end goal of hatred, right? The end goal of hatred is for you to die in hatred. Now, just like we've seen before, what happens to the spirit of man when he dies, the Elohim looking to see what spirits are in that man. So what hatred wants is it wants you to die in it because it's a hater. You have to understand that the spirit of hatred is operating in the spirit of hatred, and it's a hater of that which is good. So when you're doing good, hatred doesn't like it. The spirit itself, right? And the spirit of hatred works with Satan through hastiness of spirit. So just as Brother Costafo was speaking about being hasty, is actually hatred that actually is making a person hasty to quick to do that which is evil or to think that which is evil or to agree with that which is evil it's that same hastiness or to say something it's the same hastiness it's the same hatred working now what's the dichotomy brother Kasifo but the spirit of love working together with the law of Allah I am in long suffering unto the salvation of men. The spirit of love works with the law. Isn't that amazing? You can't have love without the law. You can't truly have the spirit of love without the law. That is amazing. The spirit of love worketh together with the law of Allah and long suffering unto the salvation of men. 
You can't have true love without the law. And that law is what delivers from hatred. That law is what delivers from pride. That law is what delivers from lying, from wrath, from anger. That law is what delivers from envy, jealousy, strife, vainglory, seditions. Be mindful, brothers and sisters. The power of the law of Allah, he didn't give it to us for no reason. So it's a great power. It's a great work. Let's work and let's cleave unto it. Because that's what the devil doesn't want. The devil doesn't want us to cleave unto the law. That's why there's so many doctrines. There's so many beliefs that say the law is done away with. Don't worry about it. It's done the, this and that, all the different excuses of why the law is done away with, because they know, the enemy knows that the law is powerful. And it gives us a standard of righteousness where we're not walking according to our own righteousness. Because without the law, everybody is walking according to their own righteousness. There's no standard. Let's be mindful. Let's walk in true love. And let's all put on the law. And apply the law to our lives. And walk in it. So that we can actually walk in true love toward one another. And toward Allah. Hayim. You got anything, Kats, before we keep going? Oh, that was good. All right, let's keep moving with chapter 5, verse 1. Hatred, therefore, is evil, for it constantly mateth with lying, speaking against the truth, and it maketh small things to be great, and it causeth the light to be darkness, and calleth the sweet bitter, and teacheth slander, and kindleth wrath, and stirreth up war, and violence, and all covetousness. It filleth the heart with evils and devilish poison. These things, therefore, I say to you from experience, my children, that ye may drive forth hatred, which is of the devil, and cleave to the love of Allah. Righteousness casteth out hatred. Humility destroyeth envy. For he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust, being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Lord looketh on his inclination. He speaketh not against the holy man, because the fear of Allah him overcometh hatred. For fear unless he should offend the Lord, he will not do wrong to any man, even in thought. So we get to see the works, works of the law, that they're true and powerful, and the fruits of the Spirit, that they're true and powerful. For the fruits of the spirit are the fruits of the law. So we get to see how powerful all of it is together. All right? So let's be mindful and let's be encouraged in these things. Having the understanding and seeing why it's so important to have the law, to keep the law. You see how that over and over they keep telling us to cleave unto the law. Cleave to love. Cleave to the love of Allah and now we know that the love of Allah is the law. So let's cleave to the love of Allah so that we can actually come out of these evil works and actually put on true righteousness so that our righteousness can cast away the hatred. Isn't that interesting? Righteousness casteth out hatred. By actually keeping the law, it's destroying hatred. Praise Allah for that. You got a precept? Yeah, because you said we now we know that love is the law. And that that righteousness casts out hatred. Basically, that love of the law, that love 
in keeping the law casts out the hatred. John had said, um, first John five and three, for this is the love of Allah Hayyam, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Mm -hmm. So is the love in the law, the love in doing the law and not being grieved in doing the law. That that's that wholeheartedness that we're truly like, this is what I want to do. I'm not doing it just because I don't want to get in trouble, but I want to do it as well. It's what I delight in. Yeah. You know, it's my meditation. It's what I, what I desire. So. Amen. That's how I am. Amen. Continuing in Testament of Gad, chapter five, verse six. These things I learned at last after I had repented concerning Joseph. For true repentance after a holy sort destroyeth ignorance and driveth away the darkness and enlighteneth the eyes and giveth knowledge to the soul and leadeth the mind to salvation. So once you learn the right way, repent in the truth of your heart and confess your wrongs so that the spirits may not have any place to linger, seeing you know their works and are no longer ignorant, but striving for salvation and good works and righteousness. Let's do this thing. Continue, Brother Costa, whenever you're ready. And those things which it hath not learned from man, it knoweth through repentance. For Allah I am brought upon me a disease of the liver, and had not the prayers of Jacob my father succored me, it had hardly failed, but my spirit had departed. For by what things a man transgresseth, by the same also is he punished. Since therefore my liver was set mercilessly against Joseph, in my liver too I suffered mercilessly and was judged for eleven months, for so long a time as I had been angry against Joseph. And now, my children, I exhort you, love ye each one his brother, and put away hatred from your hearts. Love one another in deed and in word, and in the inclination of the soul. For in the presence of my father I spake peaceably to Joseph, and when I had gone out, the spirit of hatred darkened my mind and stirred up my soul to slay him. Right. So we have to do what's right always. Not act in one way in front of everyone, in another way when we're private or away from someone you respect. So let's truly love one another in our actions, the words we speak, and in our heart and soul not being torn between the two, right? Let's be one person, that one true person, keeping the commandments, walking in the fruits of the spirit, being speaking truth, speaking truth to our neighbor so that we may cast forth that hatred and that poison from us. Whenever you're ready, Casa, please. Chapter 6, verse 3. Love ye therefore one another from the heart. And if a man sin against thee, cast forth the poison of hatred and speak peaceably to him. And in thy soul hold not guile. And if he confess and repent, forgive him. But if he deny it, do not get into passion with him. Lest catching the poison from thee, he take to swearing, and so thou sin doubly. Let not another man hear thy secrets when engaged in legal strife, lest he come to hate thee and become thy enemy, and commit a great sin against thee. For oft times he addresseth thee guilefully, and busieth himself about thee with wicked intent. And though he deny it, and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, give over reproving him. For he who denieth may repent, so as not again to wrong thee. Yea, he may also honor thee, and fare, and be at peace with thee. 
And if he be shameless and persists in his wrongdoing, even so, forgive him from the heart and leave to Allah Hayyam the avenging. Right. So let's not be judges, but allow one greater than us to judge his own creation. For we have not the power to create man to then judge one like ourselves. Right? And if someone wrongs you, give over reproving them if you're going to speak to them and they don't receive it. At least the hatred or anger enters into your heart. Okay? Say what you have to say. Speak your peace. And if they receive it, you gain a brother or a sister. If they don't, give it unto Allah Hayyam. Unless it's in the church. Right? Because Matthew 18, it's in the church. Right. 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 So this is without the church. So if it's a person that is just of the world, that's in the world, someone that you you're at work with or whatever the case is, if you speak to them about what it is and they deny it or they don't want to hear what you have to say, don't continue to force the issue. Just let it go and let Allah do what he does. Okay. I'm ready for you, Kass. 7 verse 1. If a man prospereth more than you, do not be vexed, but pray also for him, that he may have perfect prosperity. All right. For well, so it is expedient for you. And if you be further exalted, be not envious of him. Remember that all flesh shall die. And offer praise to Allah Hayyam, who giveth things good and profitable to all men. Seek, oh, that really helps overcome the envy instead of languishing, praising Allah, I am seeing a person prosper. Seek out the judgments of the Lord and thy mind will rest and be at peace. And though a man become rich by evil means, even as Esau, the brother of my father, be not jealous. But wait for the end of the Lord. For if he taketh away from a man wealth gotten by evil means, he forgiveth him if he repent. But the unrepentant is reserved for eternal punishment. For the poor man, if free from envy, he pleaseth the Lord in all things, is blessed beyond men, because he hath not the travail of vain men. Put away, therefore, jealousy from your souls, and love one another with a brightness of heart. Do ye also, therefore, tell these things to your children? Mm -hmm. So Joseph is a great example of Barnabas 19 and 6, the accidents that befall thee, thou shalt receive as good, knowing that nothing is done without Allah Hayyam. Right? Let's read his experiences so we can learn to hold fast to faith in Allah Hayyam. And for those that may come in contact with the narcissist to see how to rightly stand against them in chastity, and righteousness. All right. So we're going to go into the Testament of Joseph, chapter 2, verse 1, please. All right. Testament of Joseph, chapter 2, verse 1. And this chief captain of Pharaoh entrusted me to his house. And this chief captain of Pharaoh entrusted to me his house. And I struggled against a shameless woman, urging me to transgress with her. But the Elohim of Israel, my father, delivered me from the burning flame. I was cast into prison. I was beaten. I was mocked. But the Lord granted me to find mercy in the sight of the keeper of the prison. For the Lord doth not forsake them that fear him, neither in darkness, nor in bonds, nor in tribulation, nor in necessities. For Elohim is not put to shame as a man. Nor as a son of man is he afraid, nor as one that is earth-born is he weak or affrighted. But in all those things doth he give protection 
and in diverse ways doth he comfort, though for a little space he departeth to try the inclination of the soul. In ten temptations he showed me approved, and in all of them I endured. Right. So be encouraged that it's okay to be vulnerable to Allah because we're seeing, even from Joseph, how Allah operates with us. And by the way Allah operates, I would trust him. So he's a great one to trust in, seeing that all things are his, that he created everything, and that he knows what we have need of. We just have to do what's right for him to guard us and protect us. What's right in his sight, not in our own. So if we do what's right in his sight, he's going to protect us just as he protected Joseph. Brother Kassim, have you read it? For endurance is a mighty charm, and patience giveth many good things. How often did the Egyptian woman threaten me with death? How often did she give me over to punishment, and then call me back and threaten me? And when I was unwilling to company with her, she said to me, Thou shalt be master of me and all that is in my house if thou wilt give thyself unto me, and thou shalt be as our master. But I remember the words of my father, and going into my chamber, I wept and prayed unto the Lord. And I fasted in those seven years, and I appeared to the Egyptians as one living delicately, for they that fast for Allah I am sake receive beauty of face. And if my master were away from home, I drank no wine. Nor for three days did I take my food, but I gave it to the poor and sick. And I sought the Lord early, and I wept for the Egyptian woman of Memphis. For very unceasingly did she trouble me. For also at night she came to me under the pretense of visiting me. And because she had no male child, she pretended to regard me as a son. And so I prayed to the Lord, and she bare a male child. So we see Joseph's prayer and supplications, even for its enemy, seeing that the woman had no good intent for him, but was trying to get him to sin and fall away from Allah. He prayed for her. So for anyone that's dealing with a narcissist, praying for them, supplicating for them. Because if we see that the woman, she's not respecting any of his boundaries. And that's how a narcissist operates. They don't respect your boundaries. So we're getting to see a righteous example of one, someone dealing with a narcissist, and also two, getting to see how it feels to be on the receiving end of a narcissist for a narcissist to actually understand how it feels to the other person. Okay. All right, let's continue, Brother Costa, please. And for a time she embraced me as a son, and I knew it not. So we see the change for a time, right? Because a lot of times the narcissists will make changes, but the changes aren't for truth in the heart. They're making a change to get what they want. And that's why they'll do it for a short time, but it's not a true change because they're not doing it for Allah okay? So we see the change for a time, and because it wasn't with the whole heart, she's going to revert back or go back to how she was originally operating because it wasn't a true change. It was just to deceive, okay? It was guile. Go ahead, Brother Kassim. But later... She sought to draw me into fornication. And when I perceived it, I sorrowed unto death. And when she had gone out, I came to myself and lamented for her many days because I recognized her guile and her deceit. All right. So we see the double-mindedness. Not to stand in the pure inclination, which she did have, because she embraced him as a son for a moment. 
So we see the double-mindedness not just staying in the pure inclination, but because she still had her own desire, it destroyed the, the good inclination. Okay? But desiring some gain of her or some profit of her own, which poisons the good inclination, right? So we get to actually see it in the story. Go ahead, Brother Kasser. And I declared unto her the words of the Most High, if happily she would turn from her evil lust. Right. So we see that he's reproving her according to the law. Right. So that's one thing that we do to deal with the narcissist. Reprove them according to the law. Go ahead, Brother Coffin. Often, therefore, did she flatter me with words as a holy man, and guilefully in her talk praised my chastity before her husband, while desiring to ensnare me when we were alone. Right. So we see not to be moved to disdain or delight when one praises you or reproaches you. All right. So this is another part that we get to see. All right. Because oftentimes the narcissist will praise you or they may say things to provoke you. So you have to not be moved to disgust or delight. So you have to stay temperate in all things. Okay. For she lauded me openly as chaste, and in secret she said unto me, Fear not, my husband, for he is persuaded concerning thy chastity. For even should one tell him concerning us, he would not believe. Owing to all these things I lay upon the ground, and besought Allah him that the Lord would deliver me from her deceit. And when she had prevailed nothing thereby, she came again to me under the plea of instruction that she might learn the word of Allah. And she said unto me, If thou willest that I should leave my idols, lie with me, and I will persuade my husband to depart from his idols. And we will walk in the law of thy Lord. All right. So you have to be very mindful of them using your desire for them against you. We see that Joseph actually wanted her to change and actually wanted her to succumb to the law in Alahayim. And she tried to use his desire for her to then get what she want. Which actually, because of that lying or that guile and deceit, it doesn't make sense. Because she wanted him to reproach Alahayim for her to come to Alahayim. So you can see that the spirits, it's confusion. The lion creates that confusion and it doesn't make sense. All right. Go ahead, Brother Coffin, please. Sure. And I said unto her, the Lord willeth not that those who reverence him should be in uncleanness, nor doth he take pleasure in them that commit adultery but in those that approach him with a pure heart and undefiled lips. But she held her peace, longing to accomplish her evil desire. And I gave myself yet more to fasten in prayer that the Lord might deliver me from her. All right. But trusting in Allah and not taking matters into his own hands, we get to learn another example. When dealing with a narcissist, Trusting in Allah and not taking matters into your own hands. And actually correcting them according to the law as well. You see, he said, The Lord willeth not that those who reverence him should be unclean, nor do if he take pleasure in them that commit adultery. So you have to hold fast to the law too. Because the law is the standard. If you don't hold fast to the standard, then you're not helping the, the narcissist come out of narcissism and the spirits of it. You're enabling. And we don't want to be enablers. We want to be someone that stands for righteousness and help somebody come out of their iniquity. All right. So holding fast to the law, we get to see that. Okay. And he gave himself to more fasting and prayer. So the more things became tough on him, 
the closer he got to Alahayim, not further away, right? Because many of us, when things get hard, we'll go tug off to a corner, right? And we'll go be off to ourselves. But what Joseph did, he cleaved more to Alahayim. He started fasting. He started praying. He was cleaving more to Alahayim. And even for a narcissist who deals with these spirits, when things get hard, cleave unto Alahayim. Don't go off and be to yourself and give place to the devil. But cleave unto Alahayim. Start fasting. Start praying. So that Alahayim may actually hear you and actually send you a remedy or give you instruction or deliver you from whatever it is that you're going through at the time so that you can actually be strengthened to actually keep the law. Okay. Let's continue, Brother Kostafo, please. And again, at another time, she said unto me, If thou wilt not commit adultery, I will kill my husband by poison and take thee to be my husband. I therefore, when I heard this, rent my garments and said unto her, Woman, reverend Salahayim, and do not this evil deed, lest thou be destroyed. For know indeed that I will declare this thy device unto all men. She therefore, being afraid, besought that I would not declare this device. And she departed, soothing me with gifts, and sending to me every delight of the sons of men. Right. So remember that Elohim sees our works in darkness and secrecy. For one opposing such behavior, don't be in agreement with lewd behavior, but do what's right in the sight of Elohim always. Exodus 23 and 8 says, And thou shalt take no gifts, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Right? So even when she's trying to flatter him with gifts, trying to soothe him with gifts and sending him every delight, don't accept it. Because if you accept the gift, you're only enabling. And you may fall yourself find yourself being pleased with the gifts and then it perverts your judgment all right so let's be focused okay and making sure we're doing everything that Allah is telling us to do right because we have to keep the law in this too even when dealing with a narcissist you have to be more on guard and more cleaving to Allah in the law to actually help them come out of it because they have to have the righteous example in you to then see that their ways are not right. So that their ways may be reproved and that they may come unto Elohim in the law. Okay? Testament of Joseph, chapter 6, verse 1. And afterwards, she sent me food mingled with enchantments. Right. Now, remember from the anger lesson that the spirit of anger and fornication leadeth one to witchcraft. I think the word in the lesson was, what was it? And you remember the word that was used? I do not. Well, technically it's witchcraft, but I was trying to see if I remember the word that it said. Um, So you see that she wasn't getting what she desired. Now we get to see she's actually starting to get angry. And the spirit of fornication is leading her to then go and deal with enchantments and deal with sorcery. And that's the spirit of anger and fornication actually leads a person to do that. So let's be mindful. Okay. All right, let's continue, Casa, please. All right. And when the eunuch who brought it came, I looked up and beheld a terrible man giving me with the dish a sword. And I perceived that her scheme was to beguile me. And when he had gone out, I wept, nor did I taste that or any other of her food. So then 
After one day, she came to me and observed the food and said unto me, Why is it that thou hast not eaten of the food? And I said unto her, It is because thou hast filled it with deadly enchantments. And how saidest thou, I come not near to idols, but to the Lord alone? Now therefore know that the Allah of my father hath revealed unto me by his angel thy wickedness, and I have kept it to convict thee, if happily thou mayest see and repent. But that thou mayest learn that the wickedness of the unholy hath no power over them that worship Allah with chastity. Behold, I will take of it and eat before thee. And having so said, I prayed thus, the Allah of my fathers and the angel of Abraham be with me, and ate. And when she saw this, she fell upon her face at my feet weeping. And I raised her up and admonished her, and she promised to do this iniquity no more. But her heart was still set upon evil, and she looked around how to ensnare me, and sighing deeply, she became downcast, though she was not sick. For a narcissist not being able to fulfill their desire through covetousness can lead to health issues. Let's rather our desire to be of love of the law that we may fulfill that and be full in the faith, not giving ourselves unto death by wicked desires of the devil. Right? We have to make sure that we're not giving over to covetousness but that we're content. We're content with the law. We're content with doing right. We're content with doing the desires of Allah Hayyam. Because we see with the Egyptian woman that she wasn't able to, to fulfill her desire. And we see everything that is taking her through. So for a narcissist, you have to be very mindful of your own desires. And what those desires will take you through. Trying to fulfill it. And unfortunately. It doesn't fulfill anything. Once you fulfill the desire. You just feel like you conquered it. And then you go on to the next desire. Because it has no substance. But the law has true substance. And when you fulfill the law, you're full of the faith. You're full of Allah Hayyam. You have Allah Hayyam. You have Ahaya dwelling with you. Yache dwelling with you. The Holy Spirit dwelling with you. The fruits of the Spirit dwelling with you. You're full. Your cup runneth over. You're no longer desiring any other thing. You're not desiring your own desires, trying to fulfill them and being led to, to dry places and being thirsty. But yet you have the living water. You're quenched. Let's be mindful of that. And let's truly give ourselves over to doing what's right and to keeping the law and to walking in true love. Let's continue, Brother Kasa, please. And when her husband saw her, he said unto her, Why is thy countenance fallen? And she said unto him, I have a pain at my heart, and the groanings of my spirit oppress me. And so he comforted her who was not sick. Then accordingly seizing an opportunity, she rushed unto me while her husband was yet without, and said unto me, I will hang myself, or cast myself over a cliff, if thou wilt not lie with me. For anyone dealing with the narcissist, please be aware some threats are to get a reaction out of you. And some are serious, not learning how to deal with situations from their childhood. So please pray for discernment that Allah may be with you, even as he was with our brother Joseph, to give him understanding when something is truly serious and when something is just to get a reaction out of you. Okay, because once once a narcissist gets to the point where they want to, they make them threats to hurt themselves. That's when you may need some external help. 
you may need um, the elders of the church. You may need a prayer group. Even if you pray unto Elohim and he gives answer to help you in a dream, um, whatever the case is, do seek help when it gets to this point, okay? Because we don't want anyone to hurt themselves. And, and this is usually what happens when they can't fulfill the desire, okay? So definitely be mindful, okay, for your own safety and for their safety. Right. And when I saw the spirit of Belier was troubling her, I prayed unto the Lord and said unto her, Why, wretched woman, art thou troubled and disturbed, blinded through sins? Remember that if thou kill thyself, Esteho, the maid wife of thy husband, thy rival, will beat thy children, and thou wilt destroy thy memorial from off the earth. And she said unto me, Lo, then thou lovest me. Let this suffice me. Only strive for my life and my children, and I expect that I shall enjoy my desire also. But she knew not that because of my master I spake thus, and not because of her. For if a man falleth before the passion of a wicked desire, and becometh enslaved by it, even as she, whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with a view to his wicked desire. Right. Okay. For if a man hath fallen before the passion of a wicked desire, and become enslaved by it, even as she, whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with a view to its wicked desire. Okay, this is definitely narcissistic, a narcissistic viewpoint. Okay, this is the moat that is in your own eye. Okay, let's hear this. Okay, for if a man has fallen before, the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it, whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with the view of his wicked desire. Not seeing the right in that area because his lust is blinding him or her in that area. And that is the moat that is in their own eye. Okay. In that area or areas, they can't see a right because their own desire, their own passion is entangled in it. So they can't see it correctly. All right? So we have to definitely be mindful not to have our own desires in things. This is why we've been harping so hard on the good inclination and not allowing to be double-minded to have another desire in the good inclination or to look for gain or something like that to be single-eyed because it falls into everything so we don't want anyone to have that moat in their eye where they can't see a situation correctly or they can't see a topic correctly because they have some interest or some desire or some gain or something that they have pleasure in in that area where they can't actually see it correctly okay we have to be mindful of that and be honest with ourselves and speak truth in our own heart that we do have something that is hindering us and blinding us from being able to see something correctly okay You got anything on that, Kasifu? No, sir. Uh, let's continue. If you don't mind, please. All right. Chapter 8, verse 1. I declare, therefore, unto you, my children, that it was about the sixth hour when she departed from me, and I knelt before the Lord all day and all the night. This is the time to cleave the Elohim, as I said before. When times get hard, don't go off and be alone. And dwell in your thoughts or dwindle in your thoughts, but actually cleave unto Allahim. 
and start praying and fasting and inquiring and making your supplication known. Okay, let's continue, Kasa. And about dawn, I rose up, weeping the while and praying for a release from her. At last, then, she laid hold of my garments, forcibly dragging me to have connection with her. All right. So we see, even in the anger lesson and in the pride lesson, uh, we see by maintaining the relationship, it only gets worse to the point of physical altercation. Being given over to your desire is a dangerous thing, so you can't see a right. This is why only through Elohim can one overcome these spirits, all right? So be mindful that if you're dealing with a narcissist and you're maintaining the relationship, you're staying in the relationship, it's going to continue to get worse. It's not going to get better. So at this point, even Joseph understood. He said, and about dawn, I rose up weeping the while and praying for a release from her. He's like, okay, I need to separate from her because I need to get away from her because it's getting worse. It's getting bad. And he understood that. Okay. So this is the time where you do need to separate. Okay. Even before the physical altercation, once you started making the threats of self-harming, that's a good moment to know, okay, now there needs to be some separation going on. And definitely pray to Allah on when that should be. Okay, and don't just walk according to your own accord. Even as Joseph didn't walk according to his own accord, he actually waited on Allah for the deliverance. Okay. Go ahead, Brother Kasa, please. When therefore I saw that in her madness she was holding fast on my garment, I left it behind and fled away naked. And holding fast to the garment, she falsely accused me. And when her husband came, he cast me into prison in his house. And on the morrow, he scourged me and sent me into Pharaoh's prison. And when I was in the bonds, the Egyptian woman was oppressed with grief. And she came and heard how I gave thanks unto the Lord and sang praises in the abode of darkness. And with glad voice rejoiced, glorifying my Allah that I was delivered from the lustful desire of the Egyptian woman. All right. So stay in your joy no matter what happens, knowing that it's from Allah And when deliverance comes, praise him no more. Because he heard your prayer. Okay. And the good thing is, is that during this separation, or what do they call this? Um, what do they call it? The narcissistic term? Narcissistic discard? Yes. Well, technically, yes. Even in a narcissistic discard, praise Allah, okay? Because usually it gets to the point where either the narcissist feels like... Um, just depends. If you called it off, if you called off the relationship, the narcissist will feel like you have the upper hand. Okay. And praise Allah for that time when you separate so that they can actually examine their works. Okay. They call it no contact. Right. So cut off communication, allow them to focus on themselves and give them time. And Lord willing, they actually come to repentance and actually do what's right. But make sure you're praying unto Allah to know when to come back with them if such case comes, because you want to make sure that they truly repented and that they're not just operating in deceit and guile. Okay. And for a narcissist, when this time comes, please examine yourself. If it gets to this point, please examine yourself and repent and confess your faults and don't try to find justifications for your faults or try to continue to operate in guile and deceit but instead reproving yourself and actually becoming circumspect to the law and start working on yourself so that you can actually come out of these spirits and actually take the time to work on yourself okay praying and fasting because you need Allah those things are great. 
so that you can actually start working the law, okay? All right, let's continue, Brother Casa, please. And often hath she sent unto me, saying, Consent to fulfill my desire, and I will release thee from thy bonds, and I will free thee from the darkness. And not even in thought did I incline unto her. So you see, Joseph was steadfast in the faith, holding fast to the faith, knowing that he was in the hands of Elohim. So let's make sure that we're in the hands of Elohim and holding fast to that faith and not consenting to do evil just to get out of a situation, but making sure that we understand that all things that befall us come from Elohim, right? And we count it all joy, whether we're in bonds or whether we're free, okay? Let's continue, Kasim, please. For well, Elohim loveth him who in a den of wickedness combines fasting with chastity, rather than the man who in king's chambers combines luxury with license. And if a man liveth in chastity, and desireth also glory, and the Most High knoweth that it is expedient for him, he bestoweth this also upon me. How often, though, she was sick, did she come down to meet me at unlooked for times, and listen to my voice as I prayed? And when I heard her groanings, I held my peace. For when I was in her house, she was wont to bear her arms and breasts and legs that I might lie with her. But she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned in order to beguile me. And the Lord guarded me from her devices. You see, therefore, my children, how great things patience worketh and prayer with fasting. So ye too, if ye follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer, with fasting and humility of heart, the Lord will dwell among you, because he loveth chastity. And wheresoever the Most High dwelleth, even though envy or slavery or slander befalleth a man, the Lord who dwelleth in him, for the sake of his chastity, not only delivereth him from the evil, but also exalted him even as me. For in every way the man is lifted up, whether in deed or in word, or in thought. My brethren knew how my father loved me, and yet I did not exalt myself in my mind. Although I was a child, I had the fear of Allah in my heart, for I knew that all things would pass away, and I did not raise myself against them with evil intent, but I honored my brethren, and out of respect for them, even when I was being sold, I refrained from telling the Ishmaelites that I was the son of Jacob, a great man and a mighty. So you see the humility of Joseph and see how he was so focused on Elohim, that Elohim loveth him. Elohim looketh upon him. Elohim guarded him. He said Elohim guarded him from her devices. Right? You see the humility. You see that he's not taking anything into his own hands or taking any praise for himself. Okay, that keeps us in that humility and lowliness of mind. So keep that in mind for everyone so that we all can have that. And so we can all give Allah the glory and that he may continue to cover us and help us. All right, let's continue, Casa, please. Chapter 11. Do ye also, my children, have the fear of Allah in all your works before your eyes, and honor your brethren? For everyone who doeth the law of the Lord shall be loved by him. So we see this again. Let us take heed and allow this to enter into our hearts. We get to see, he says, have the fear of Allah in all your works before your eyes. Right? So we have to see the law in everything. We have to see the law in everything and be looking for the law. What are we supposed to do according to the law? In this scenario, in this environment, what are we supposed to do according to the law? What am I supposed to do according to the law when this happens? We have to have the law before our eyes, before all our works. Okay? Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. 
And when I came to the Indocolpite with the Ishmaelites, they asked me, saying, Art thou a slave? And I said that I was a homeborn slave, that I might not put my brethren to shame. And the eldest of them said unto me, Thou art not a slave, for even thy appearance doth make it manifest. But I said that I was their slave. Now when we came into Egypt, they strove concerning me. Which of them should buy me and take me? Therefore it seemed good to all that I should remain in Egypt with the merchant of their trade, until they should return bringing merchandise. And the Lord gave me favor in the eyes of the merchant, and he entrusted unto me his house. And Allah blessed him by my means, and increased him in gold and silver and in household servants. And I was with him three months and five days. And about that time the Memphian woman, the wife of Pentefri, came down in a chariot with great pomp, because she had heard from her eunuchs concerning me. And she told her husband that the merchant had become rich by means of a young Hebrew. And they say that he had assuredly been stolen out of the land of Canaan. Now therefore render justice unto him, and take away the youth to thy house. So shall the Allahayim of the Hebrews bless thee, for grace from heaven is upon him. And Pentephris was persuaded by her words, and commanded the merchant to be brought, and said unto him, What is this that I hear concerning thee? that thou stealest persons out of the land of Canaan, and sellest them for slaves. But the merchant fell at his feet and besought him, saying, I beseech thee, my master, I know not what thou sayest. And Pantiphrys said unto him, Whence then is the Hebrew slave? And he said, The Ishmaelites entrusted him unto me, until they should return. But he believed him not, and commanded him to be stripped and beaten. And when he persisted in this statement, Pantiphrys said, Let the youth be brought. And when I was brought in, I did an obeisance to Pentephorus, for he was third in rank to the officers of Pharaoh. And he took me apart from him and said unto me, Art thou a slave or free? And I said, A slave. And he said, Whose? And I said, The Ishmaelites. And he said, How didst thou become their slave? And I said, They bought me out of the land of Canaan. And he said unto me, Truly thou liest. And straightway he commanded me to be stripped and beaten. Now the Memphian woman was looking through a window at me while I was being beaten, for her house was near, and she sent unto him, saying, Thy judgment is unjust, for thou dost punish a free man who had been stolen, as though he were a transgressor. And when I made no change in my statement, though I was beaten, he ordered me to be imprisoned until he said the owners of the boy should come. And the woman said unto her husband, Wherefore dost thou detain the captive and well-born lad in bonds, who ought rather to be set at liberty and be waited upon? For she wished to see me out of a desire of sin, but I was ignorant concerning all these things. And he said unto her, it is not the custom of the Egyptians to take that which belongeth to others before proof is given. This therefore he said concerning the merchant, but as for the lad, he must be in prison. Now after four and twenty days came the Ishmaelites, for they had heard that Jacob, my father, was mourning much concerning me. And they came and said unto me, How is it that thou said that thou wast a slave? And lo! We have learnt that thou art the son of a mighty man in the land of Canaan, and thy father still mourneth for thee in sackcloth and ashes. When I heard this, my bowels were dissolved, and my heart melted, and I desired greatly to weep, but I restrained myself, that I should not put my brethren to shame. And I said unto them, I know not, I am a slave. So we get to see true love. This is the love of the law, not to operate in anger but to rather give place to the fruits, to love them that persecute you. Giving time for them to repent and not desiring them to be punished for what they've done to you. Right? So this is true love and coming out of that hatred, not allowing that hatred to want that person to be put to death or to suffer some tragedy or to go through affliction, but rather 
that they may repent and actually you desire for them to prosper. Okay, that's the true love. And you've seen that love from Joseph, not wanting to make his brothers look bad, but suffering affliction for their sakes. That's the selflessness. Okay, let's continue. Then therefore they took counsel to sell me that I should not be found in their hands, for they feared my father lest he should come and execute upon them a grievous vengeance. For they had heard that he was mighty with Allah high man with men. Then said the merchant unto them, Release me from the judgment of Pentifree. And they came and requested me, saying, Say that thou was bought by us with money, and he will set us free. Now the Memphian woman said unto her husband, By the youth, for I hear, said she, that they are selling him. And straightway she sent a eunuch to the Ishmaelites and asked them to sell me. But since the eunuch would not agree to buy me at their price, he returned, having made trial of them. And he made known to his mistress that they asked a large price for their slave. And she sent another eunuch, saying, Even though they demand two minas, give them. Do not spare the gold, only buy the boy and bring him to me. The eunuch therefore went and gave them eighty pieces of gold, and he received me. But to the Egyptian woman he said, I have given a hundred, and though I knew this, I held my peace, lest the eunuch should be put to shame. All right. So for us as believers, we have to know when to hold our tongue and when to speak a word in due season. Because it wouldn't have done any good. Allah didn't tell him to speak, right? Allah didn't tell him to correct the man or to say something. So we have to be mindful not to do our own will through our own pride or vain glory to speak or to say something, though it's true. Okay? So this is what I was speaking of earlier, that speaking the truth to your neighbor doesn't mean that you're always bringing forth what it is that they're doing wrong. Okay? Um, Proverbs 15 and 23, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? So make sure you inquire. If Alhaim doesn't tell you to say something or the Holy Spirit doesn't guide you to speak, that means that you don't say anything, right? So Rock 5 and 11, be swift to hear and let that life be sincere and with patience give answer, okay? So make sure you're slow to speak, okay? You don't want to just be hasty and say something that may get you into a worse predicament, okay? Let's continue, Katha, please. Testament of Joseph, chapter 17. You see, therefore, my children, what great things I endure that I should not put my brethren to shame. Do you also, therefore, love one another, and with long suffering hide ye one another's faults? Right. You see how hiding your brother's faults from others destroys the hatred that proclaims it to all men? We truly get to see the dichotomy of true love of the law First, the hatred of the enemy. Okay, let's continue, Pastor, please. For well, Allah, I am delighted in the unity of brethren and in the purpose of a heart that takes pleasure in love. And when my brethren came into Egypt, they learned that I had returned their money unto them and abraded them not and comforted them. And after the death of Jacob, my father, I loved them more abundantly. And in all things whatsoever he commanded, I did very abundantly for them. And I suffered them not to be afflicted in the smallest matter. And all that was in my hand I gave unto them. And their children were my children, and my children as their servants. And their life was my life, and all their suffering was my suffering, and all their sickness was my infirmity. My land was their land, and their counsel my counsel. And I extolled not myself among them in arrogance because of my worldly glory, but I was among them as one of the least. So we see that Joseph didn't render unto them evil for evil, nor did he revenge them, but loved them and forgave them, and even hid their faults 
from all men. Neither did he feel better than them for their mistake or his stature and glory in vain glory to lift itself up against them, but remain humble in the humility of Elohim and long suffering, walking in the true love of the law. Chapter 18. If you also therefore walk in the commandments of the Lord, my children, he will exalt you there and will bless you with good things forever and ever. And if anyone seeketh to do evil unto you, do well unto him and pray for him, and ye shall be redeemed of the Lord from all evil. For behold, ye see that out of my humility and long suffering I took unto wife the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis, and a hundred talents of gold were given me with her, and the Lord made them to serve me. And he gave me also beauty as a flower beyond the beautiful ones of Israel. And he preserved me unto old age in strength and in beauty, because I was like in all things to Jacob. So pray to Allah for his righteous examples to help us, whether dealing with narcissism or on the receiving end of narcissism. Let us learn from our forefather Benjamin of the heart and mind. Uh, the Testament of Benjamin, chapter 3, verse 1, please. Do ye also, therefore, my children, love the Lord Elohim of heaven and earth, and keep his commandments, following the example of the good and holy man Joseph? And let your mind be unto good, even as ye know me. For he that hath his mind right, seeth all things rightly. Mm -hmm. So cleaving unto the good inclination without allowing selfishness to enter in, keeps the mind good, okay? So let's not be double-minded, but single-eyed, okay? Continue, please. Bear ye the Lord, and love your neighbor. And even though the spirits of Belia claim you to afflict you with every evil, yet shall they not have dominion over you, even as they had not over Joseph, my brother. I would like to know what I mean there. They claim you to afflict you. Right. They claim you. They attack you. They're coming at you. They're trying to persuade you. Okay. Thank you. How many men wished to slay him? And Allahim shielded him. For he that feareth Allahim and loveth his neighbor, cannot be smitten by the spirit of Belier, being shielded by the fear of Allah Nor can he be ruled over by the device of men or beasts, for he is helped by the Lord through the love which he hath towards his neighbor. Right. So walking in the love of the law is what makes Allah want to help us. Right. So if you want Allah to be with you and to strengthen you, then start by walking by the law. And that would actually make Elohim help us. All right, that's why I said, for he is helped by the Lord through the love which he hath toward his neighbor. All right. Let's continue, please. For Joseph also besought our father that he would pray for his brethren, that the Lord would not impute to them as sin whatever evil they had done unto him. And thus Jacob cried out, My good child, thou hast prevailed over the bowels of thy father Jacob. And he embraced him and kissed him for two hours, saying, In thee shall be fulfilled the prophecy of heaven concerning the Lamb of Allah and Savior of the world, and that a blameless one should be delivered up for lawless men, and a sinless one shall die for unholy men in the blood of the covenant and for the salvation of the Gentiles and of Israel, and shall destroy Belier and his servants. You see, therefore, my children, the end of the good man? Be followers of his compassion, therefore, with a good mind, that ye also may wear crowns of glory. For the good man hath not a dark eye, for he showeth mercy to all men, even though they be sinners. A good man hath compassion and empathy for others not to be hardened by their own desires, okay? So let's be mindful of that. We really have to cast forth our own desires 
because they're, they're a hindrance and a block and a stumbling block for us and a stronghold for us that causes us not to be able to uphold the law or to cleave unto the law in Alahayim. Let's continue, Kafa, please. And though they devise with evil intent concerning him, by doing good he overcometh evil, being shielded by Alahayim. And he loveth the righteous as his own soul. If any one is glorified, he envieth him not. If any one is enriched, he is not jealous. If any one is valiant, he praiseth him. The virtuous man he lauded, on the poor man he hath mercy, on the weak man he hath compassion, unto Allahim he singeth praises. As for him who hath the fear of Allahim, he protecteth him as with a shield. Him that loveth Allahim he helpeth. Him that rejecteth the Most High he admonisheth and turneth back. Him that hath the grace of a good spirit, he loveth as his own soul. If therefore ye also have a good mind, then will both wicked men be at peace with you, and the profligate will reverence you and turn unto good, and the covetous will not only cease from their inordinate desire, but even give the objects of their covetousness to them that are afflicted. We see how being that good example will deliver others by seeing your good works and selflessness, no longer giving into covetousness yourself, but by seeing you overcome, they will learn that there's hope and that it is possible. All right, let's continue, Costa, please. If ye do well, even the unclean spirits will flee from you, and the beasts will dread you. For where there is reverence for good works and light in the mind, even darkness fleeth away from him. All right. So reverence. Reverence is a deep respect for someone or something. So having a deep respect for the law will bring forth light in the mind and darkness will flee away. You actually have to have that reverence or that deep respect for the law and uphold it and hold it in high stature and not cast it down or cast it away. And that's what actually allows you to keep it. Having that mind will allow you to keep the law. Okay. Let's continue, Casa, please. For if anyone does violence to a holy man, he repenteth. For the holy man is merciful to his reviler and holdeth his peace. And if anyone betrayeth a righteous man, the righteous man prayeth. Though for a little he be humbled, Yet not long after he appeared far more glorious, as was Joseph, my brother. So we see work in the law bringing forth life. You see how he appeared more glorious. Right? So let's be mindful. Like the law is life. Let's continue, Castle, please. The inclination of the good man is not in the power of the deceit of the spirit of Belier. The angel of peace guideth his soul. He and he gazeth not passionately upon corruptible things, nor gathereth together riches through a desire of pleasure. He delighteth not in pleasure. He grieveth not his neighbor. He sateth not himself with luxuries. He erreth not in the uplifting of the eyes, for the Lord is his portion. A good inclination receiveth not glory nor dishonor from men. All right. So we see the good inclination. So if a man or woman prays you, don't be moved. And if they reproach you, be not moved either. But put all things in supplication to Allah, that he may either have the glory or confirm that which is true. All right. So don't be moved to give place to anger or to vexation. Right. or to give place to pride and vainglory. Right? So let's be temperate in all things. Continue, Casa, please. And it knoweth not any guile or lie or fighting or reviling. You have to understand that these are not good inclinations. Guile, lying, fighting, and reviling are not good inclinations. Okay? 
for a narcissist to come out of these things, first it has to be set in their mind that these are unacceptable and that no good comes from it. For the heart of the person has to hate these works and how it affects those around them to first turn from them, to learn good and to cleave unto it. A person can only come out if it's truly the desire to come out. All right, so they have to see that these things aren't good and they have to hate them. And then they can actually start working good work to the law, figuring out, okay, what is the right way to do things and really searching out the law so that they can actually find a solution or find the right way of doing things so that they can actually start working it and coming out of the evil. Okay. Go ahead, Casa, please. For the Lord dwelleth in him and lighteth up his soul. And he rejoiceth towards all men alway. The good mind hath not two tongues, of blessing and of cursing, of contumely and of honor, of sorrow and of joy, of quietness and of confusion, of hypocrisy and of truth, of poverty and of wealth. So if you find yourself battling between these two tongues, it's a good inclination that you need to examine your works and see according to the law and the fruits of the spirit, what you're doing wrong and neglecting. Okay. So let's cleave onto the good inclination. If we have one that, Hey, I'm doing these things. Let me make sure that I correct myself and that I am speaking truth so that I can actually come out of it. Okay. Let's continue, Casa, please. But it hath one disposition, uncorrupt and pure, concerning all men. It hath no double sight, no double hearing. For in everything which he doeth, or speaketh, or seeth, he knoweth that the Lord looketh on his soul. Remember that Elohim looks on your soul. So when God tries to enter in, be mindful and have reverence for Elohim and his law to bring you back to humility and contentment. Remember holiness with contentment, it's great gain. Let's continue, Casa, please. And he cleanseth his mind that he may not be condemned by men as well as by Elohim. And this is what we have to do. It's a work and it requires long suffering and patience with yourself and others. We have to cleanse our mind by revamping all the things that are against the law and the fruits of the spirit. It takes time and don't be discouraged if it's not happening as fast as you would like, allowing pride to enter in, but be persistent and working good and it will take root in you. Just don't give up. If you fall in your walk, repent quickly, knowing that you're striving to be righteous. And in the process of a just man, he falleth several times, but he gets back up, as Proverbs 24 and 16 says. Right? For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Okay, so let us not fall into mischief where we get going to doubt or self pity or sorrow, and then we stay there. Okay? So let's be encouraged that it takes time to overcome, even as it took Hermes time to overcome. Can we read the Shepherd of Hermes Vision 2, chapter 1, verse 1, please? Hermes Vision 2, chapter 1, verse 1. I was on the way to Kume at the same season as last year and called to mind my last year's vision as I walked. And again, a spirit taketh me and carrieth me away to the same place as last year. Right. So in this story, Hermes actually had a vision a year earlier and he was still dealing with the same thing from that same year earlier. So literally a year passed by and he was still dealing with the same issue. OK, so let's not go into doubt, but let's not go into sorrow because it's taken us time to come out of something. OK, let's just continue putting forth the work and learning new things as Hermes kept on learning so that we can be strengthened to get what we need to come out of it, okay? Let's jump back to the Testament of Benjamin, uh, chapter 6, please. 
Testament of Benjamin, chapter 6, last verse. And in like manner, the works of Belial are twofold, and there is no singleness in them. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, my children, I tell you, flee the malice of Belial, for he giveth a sword to them that obey him. And the sword is the mother of seven evils. First the mind conceiveth through Belier, and first there is bloodshed. Secondly, ruin. Thirdly, tribulation. Fourthly, exile. Fifthly, dearth. Sixthly, panic. Seventhly, destruction. Therefore was Cain also delivered over to seven vengeances by Allahim. For in every hundred years, the Lord brought one plague upon him. Right. So we see how Allah can be against you for your works, right? So the concept that Allah knows my heart and Allah is always with me, no matter what I do, you have to be very mindful of that error and that lie that's being told to you because Allah comes against you, right? He will chasten you because you're not doing what's right. That's exactly what chastening is, right? So let's flee malice so that Allah is not against us in our life as he was unto Cain. Okay, let's continue, please. And when he was 200 years old, he began to suffer. And in the 829th year, he was destroyed. For on account of Abel, his brother, with all the evils was he judged. But Lamech was 70 times 7. Because forever those who are like Cain in envy and hatred of brethren shall be punished with the same judgment. And do ye, my children, flee evil doing, envy and hatred of brethren, and cleave to goodness and love. He that hath a pure mind in love looketh not after a woman with a view to fornication, for he hath no defilement in his heart because the spirit of Allah Hayyam rested upon him. Mm -hmm. So this is the goal for men and women, regardless of narcissism. This is our goal to get to that point, to get to that real true love and a pure mind of love, right? Not looking after a woman or a man with a view of fornication, but he hath no defilement in his heart because the spirit of Allah Hayyam rests upon him, right? So let's, have that pure mind in all things, okay? For as the sun is not defiled by shining on dung and mire, but rather drieth up both and driveth away the evil smell, so also the pure mind, though encompassed by the defilements of earth, rather cleanseth them and is not itself defiled. Right. If we put on a pure mind, the evils from the world can affect us. Seeing that Allah aided us in our good works, so whether from our childhood we struggled with vulnerability or neglect, we now have one to trust in and to set our works unto him that Allah may protect us and being completely pure, being harmless as doves, yet walking in his wisdom, being wise as serpents to withstand evil in those that work it. For many have been hurt, being pure of heart, without wisdom of Allah and given over to evildoers, corrupting their souls. You have to apply things quickly. Procrastination is a sign that you don't want to do it, and it's not from the heart. So we have to get in the pattern of making changes quickly, even if we have to strive to force the change. So that they can become habits, taking accountability of the bad habits we've become accustomed to, to change. So we're going to touch on parents suffering from narcissistic spirits and or an enabler. We're going to touch on a couple of scriptures on that. And then we have a couple of more scriptures, then we'll be finished. So thank you for your patience. Uh, we're going to go to Sarat chapter 30, verse 1 through 13. Chapter 30, verse 1. He that loveth his son causes him off to feel the rod, that he may have joy of him in the end. Right. So for parents, 
make sure that you are correcting your children, okay? Hold them accountable so that they can actually learn to be accountable and actually do what's right, okay? This is why we cause them to feel the right often so that they they know that we're holding them accountable to something. And that's the love of us holding them accountable, okay? So we will have joy for them in the end. By holding them accountable, they actually conform to the law and conform to doing what's right. Okay, let's continue, please. He that chastiseth his son shall have joy in him and shall rejoice of him among his acquaintance. All right. So make sure you do these things when they're young and rear them up in the right way so they can go in the right way. Okay. You might want well to mention the scripture says, okay, the part just remembering the anger, we're talking to narcissists and people, we are learning to overcome anger and such. We don't want to take the scripture according to the wrong desire to think it's okay to be angry and spank our children. That's going to turn into a problem. The scripture says, be angry and sin not. If need be, go sit down and calm down when one can speak to the child in the spirit of meekness. And even correct the child if it requires a spanking to do it in humility and in temperance. Not being frustrated or anything like that. Well, you have the scripture, um, don't provoke your child to wrath. Yes, sir. Right. So you, that literally is the law. Um, Ephesians 6 and 4. And ye fathers, and the ghost of the mothers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we have the law actually to actually correct that so that we can actually do it the right way. So don't be angry and deal with your children to provoke them to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and admonition. So you actually speak to your children. You tell them the right way. You say, okay, well, I'm going to give you a spanking so that you can understand that what you did was wrong. Okay, it's not about angry and lashing out on your children. Okay, because that's not temperance. Right. And that verse covers both how you speak to them and when you have to spank them. Because right. if you, if I'm angry and I'm speaking to them in my frustration or like, man, it's overwhelming and I'm speaking to them in that grievance, whether it be out of an angry tone or like an overwhelmed tone, I'm still provoking them to wrath. Because right. I could te I'm teaching them. That's how you react to situations by how I'm reacting. Right. And I'm also corrupting their emotional health because they'll learn that that's acceptable to be spoken to like that. Or it's that's the norm. Yeah. Or to think that's how you speak to somebody. Yeah. So. And then they'll get emotional stress off of also feeling like they hurt their parents or like. I'm grieving my parents. I'm making them. I'm grieving my parents or they'll they'll go into, like we spoke of when it comes to the narcissist, saying that even their parent is, um, is, is what's the word that was used? Um, it was the beginning of the lesson that when they see that even when they talked about the world. Oh, the parent is even their parents are emotionally reactive. And their parents are dangerous. Like dangerous, even, their, the word, even their parent hurt them, so they right. can't trust anybody. Right. So you see how that happens. Dealing in that anger, it actually makes the children think that you're dangerous too. And then they don't have that. They don't create that emotional connection, a bond with you. Seeing that um, they're emotionally vulnerable and and <laughs> to to being hurt by you. So definitely be mindful. Thank you, Kasifo. Praise Allah. Verse 3. Sirach chapter 30, verse 3. He that teacheth his son grieveth the enemy, and before his friends he shall rejoice of him. All right. So he that teacheth the son grieveth the enemy, because you're not allowing the enemy spirits to dwell in him. You're teaching him the right way, you're teaching him why. And you're giving understanding and you're holding him accountable. And you yourself are doing the right thing. This is the thing about parents. 
You actually have to be doing the right thing yourself to then teach your children the things that you are learning and the things that you've learned so that they can actually do the right thing too. And you have to be walking it. You can't just be a hypocrite and speaking it and then doing another because they're watching your actions. Children don't listen to words that much. They, they watch what you do because that's how we actually win people over through our actions as we spoke of in this lesson. So be mindful that you have to make these changes yourself and hold yourself accountable to then be able to then help your children and teach them and hold them accountable. Let's continue, please. Though his father die, yet he is as though he were not dead, for he hath one left behind him that is like himself. Right. So you want to rear your children up in the way that they should go. And you want them to be like you or better than you. So continue helping your children. This is why parents have to be truly selfless, right? And this is why it's hard for a narcissist parent to teach their children to go in the right way because of the selfishness, right? So being a parent, you have to be selfless. You have to put their needs and the things that they have going on before yourself. And you have to be mindful of yourself. At least you cause a stumbling block to be before them, okay? So be mindful of those things. You got anything on that, Casa? Well, that was good. While he lived, he saw and rejoiced in him. And when he died, he was not sorrowful. Right. Because he got to see that he was leading his son in the right direction. Right. So he's not sorrowful. Like, oh, like I, I messed up. He's like, yes, I did what was right in the sight of Elohim. And I taught my son the things that's right in the sight of Elohim. And I was walking in a good example. And my son got to see a good example before I left All right he left behind him an avenger of his enemies and one that shall requite kindness to his friends All right and that's what he's going to do because he's following after your example okay so you got to make sure that you're walking it and talking it yourself okay he that maketh too much of his son shall bind up his wounds and his bowels will be troubled at every cry. Right. So don't don't sit there and, and make too much of your children as in, in making them seem greater than they are. Okay. So don't make too much of them. Right. Teach them the way that they should go. Be an example. And, and praise Allah when they do things right. And correct them when they do things wrong. But don't make too much of them like they were perfect and that you didn't didn't have any problems with them and they were perfect and they were this and that. You do that, you're going to bind up your wounds, right? And, and we're going to see why you're actually going to bound up your wounds. And his bowels will be troubled at every cry because you become an enabler to your child. And this is what we don't want. We don't want to enable our children. Well, we're troubled at every cry, everything that happens to them. We're running, trying to make sure they're okay and not paying attention to what's truly going on with them, right? Because we're blinded. This is what happens. You get blinded because of your love and, and what you want them to be. And this is a lot of times what happens to narcissist parents is that you formulate that thought of who you want your children to be. And you are not seeing the reality of who your child might be, right? So make sure that you're putting in the work yourself, being that person that you want your children to be and that Allah wants you to be and then teaching your children the things that you're learning and not making too much of them and not being troubled at every cry because sometimes they're going to go through things. They have to go through things too. 
so that they can learn the lessons that they need to learn. Because a lot of times, Elohim may chasten the child. It may be something that you don't see. So don't be troubled at every cry. Know that just like Barnabas said in 19 and 6, the accidents that befall us count as good, knowing that all things coming from Elohim. It was needful. Okay, so trust in Elohim. Okay. Let's continue. You got anything on that, Kasim? Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing how that turns the, the child becomes the over narcissist through that cockering, the overindulging, as we talked about it in the beginning of the lesson, with how it starts in the parenting environment. Mm -hmm. and that. Yep. And here we go. This is the next part, and this is the overt narcissist right here. The and horse of it. Hmm. So this is the making of the overt narcissist right here. An horse not broken becometh headstrong, and a child left to himself will be willful. Right. So this can actually go for overt or covert narcissist when you when when being a child, because it says a horse not broken becometh headstrong because it's not corrected. Right. So it becometh headstrong in its iniquity. So you can see how a lot of the, this is for any narcissist, they're headstrong in what they're doing wrong. And even if they say that they're, they confess that they did something wrong, they don't take accountability to change it because they're so used to being left to themselves, they're willful in it. So you can see how it actually is shaping a narcissist. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Especially after if you grew up where when every time you cry or someone came to rescue you. Right. You get to go right back. They'll come rescue you, bind up your wounds, and you get to go right back to what you're doing. There's no accountability. All right. And that becomes the norm in life. All right. I'm doing what I want, but when I cry, that should be enough for you to give me space to continue doing what I want. Or to come enable me or help me. Yeah. That's what Ahab, he grew up in that environment based off his reaction. He went mm -hmm. to cry to get somebody to go do what he wanted done. Yes, he did. Continue, please. Cocker thy child, and he shall make thee afraid. Play with him, and he will bring thee to heaviness. Right. So if you cocker them, right, you're like babying them, not correcting them not holding them accountable. Um, everything they do is right. If you do that, they're going to make you afraid because they're not going to respect you. And they're going to treat you the same way that they treat everyone else, just like anger. It has no respect for father or mother or brother, right? So you conquer them. They're going to make you afraid because they never been corrected on anger or hatred. And when those spirits enter in, you're going to be an enemy too. You play with him, and he will bring thee to heaviness. So if you play around with the things that they got going on, and you don't correct it, it's going to bring you to heaviness. Right? It's not talking about like playing with your children, having a good time with your children from time to time. It's talking about you play with the things that he's struggling with, that you see, and you don't correct it. It's going to bring you to heaviness. Okay. Continue, please. Laugh not with him, lest thou have sorrow with him, and lest thou gnash thy teeth right. in the end. So when you see what he got going on or she got going on, don't make fun of it. Don't make it funny. It's not funny. That's your time to be serious. And let them know that you're serious. Like, hey, that's not okay. This is why I want to sit you down. We're going to talk. Like, don't laugh with them and make it seem like it, it's a light thing. Because if you do that, you're going to be sorrowing with them. Because they're not going to take you seriously. And they're not going to take it seriously. And they're going to continue doing what they're doing. And you're going to end up gnashing your teeth with them because you will respect other persons 
and you didn't correct your child. Okay, you didn't do it the right way. Okay, so make sure that you're serious. Of course, definitely do it in love and nurture, but definitely you have to be stern and serious in having that conversation with them and not making it like it's fun and games because you don't want to rub them the wrong way or you don't want them to not like you, okay? Like we're parents. We're not their friends, okay? We have to make sure that they go in the way that they're supposed to go. All right. You got anything on that, Casa? Hey, man. When speaking with the child about these things, like you talked about, to ensure we, as we mentioned earlier, staying out of the wrong spirits when we speak. For just as we discuss in Gad about if somebody um, deny, don't get into a passion with them, less taking the poison from thee. If you're talking with your child about something, as Zachary talked about, sit them down and everything. Got to stay in the right spirit so that the wrong spirit doesn't enter into you to cause them not to be able to receive what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. there's spiritual warfare in here. We don't want to give any spirit place to stay there or to justify what's being done to help bring ourselves or whatever we may have going on and also bring our children out of the struggles they're facing right. okay and you gotta you gotta be mindful that a lot of narcissists are still children because they didn't develop the actual essential things that they were supposed to develop as a child so even in some of these that we're talking about concerning children these same things would apply to many narcissists having that conversation with them, being serious, not giving over to any spirit, keeping the law, keeping your eyes set on the law, having that conversation with them, being honest and making sure that you're not cockering them or enabling them or, yeah. you know. Playing with them, yeah. Right. Things on a laughing matter, whether adult, child, it's a serious conversation to have. And it's funny, after saying those things, it literally gives the overview. It says, give him no liberty in his, in his youth and wink not at his follies, just to make sure that you understand what it's talking about, okay? So that's literally what it was talking about uh, for a few verses, okay? So don't give him no liberty in his youth. Don't let him just do whatever he wants to do or she do whatever she wants to do. You actually have to hold them accountable and make sure that they're doing what's right. And wink not at his follies. So if you see something, don't just cast it away or brush it to the side. Make sure you correct it. Okay. You don't want to just let anything ride. Okay. You want to make sure like, hey, I'm going to at least say something to you, though I may say it one time. And if you receive it, praise Allah. If you don't receive it, I'm going to leave off to it. But if you do it again, I'm going to tell you again because I'm your parent, okay? I'm not going to give off to reproving you, okay? Though I may not sit there and harp on it, um, if you do it again, I'm going to reprove you again because there's another scripture that we're supposed to continue to reprove our children. Well, yeah, don't be ashamed of... um. In Sirach 42, it talks about the things not to be ashamed of. It says in verse 1, Of these things be not thou ashamed, and accept no person to sin thereby. Of the law of the Most High and his covenant, and of judgment to justify the unholy. Jump down to verse 5. Of much correction of children. So, right. so you're going to have to correct your children a lot. It's just part of being a parent. But you just don't want to harp on something at one point where they don't receive it or you end up getting into a passion yourself. Okay, so make sure you say it. If they receive it, okay. If they don't receive it, give off to reproving. If they do it again, reprove them again. Say it one time, okay. If they receive it, praise Allah. If not, 
give off to reprove it. You have to do that over and over and over again for children, okay? That's holding them accountable. Like, I'm going to continue to tell you, you know, and when the Lord is gracious, you will receive it when it's time, when you're ready. Okay? Yeah. And keep praying for them. Right. Praying and fasting, just as Joseph. Yeah. And you don't want to be nagging at them, so to speak, right. because you're teaching them how evil spirits operate. Because if anybody has had or come to understand the spiritual warfare that we are in, evil spirits speak over and over. They weigh on us. Whereas the angel of righteousness, Zach, will mention in the lesson how he's going to tell you what's right and leave you to make a choice. Because one rebuke with love is better than a thousand rebukes. Mm -hmm. So just so you can know in everything we're doing, it's helping exemplify righteousness. Okay. And preparing on the story of Elohim. Right. Because the angel of righteousness operates according to the law. Okay. Well, the angel of wickedness doesn't operate according to the devil's law. So you get to actually see how the angel of righteousness will tell you something one time and then leave you to make your decision. Where it reproved you one time and that was it. Where the angel of iniquity is like the angel of wickedness it's like over and over it's constantly in your head and you're like this i keep hearing this over and over yes that's a clear indication that it's not the right spirit <laughs> it's a fit clear indication you can exemplify the bashfulness gentleness and tranquility of the angel of righteousness or the fit of anger or bitterness of the angel of wickedness You ready? Now, the, the purpose of spankings, right? We're going to get into that. Let's read Sirach 30 and 12. Bow down his neck while he is young and beat him on the sides while he is a child, lest he wax stubborn and be disobedient unto thee and so bring sorrow to thine heart. So we see that the spankings are actually to bow down his neck. It's actually to humble him or humble her and beat them on the side while they're a child. At least they wax stubborn, right? And be disobedient unto thee because they were never humbled. Okay. So that's the reason why we, we spank. It's not because we're angry. It's not to be done in anger, but it's just to bow them down, to bring them to humility so that they will not be stubborn and disobedient against you, okay? What's the last scripture on that one? Chastise thy son, and hold him to labor, lest his lewd behavior be an offense unto thee. Right. So chastise thy son, and hold him to labor. So make sure you put him to work, or put her to work, right? That's how you chastise them. When they don't want to do right, put them to work, put them to labor, or make them clean up, make them go wash dishes, make them go clean the yard, go mow the yard, go do whatever it is that you can put them to labor to do, right? And that's the chastening for them, okay? And it helps them actually learn how to do work, how to work. It's going to help them learn how to work righteousness. Okay, and I hope that really helps you guys in, in really raising and rearing your children up. Okay. Let's be honest with Elohim and ourselves to do what's right in his sight, not what's right in our own sight, nor comparing ourselves among ourselves to use the excuse, I'm doing better than someone else, so I'm all right to continue being double-minded toward Elohim. Okay. Let's jump over to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to go through verse 3 to 6, please. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, 
but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Right. So no one wants to do anything wrong, right? But it's not about the mistake. It's about the heart. Are you trying to truly get it right? Or are you just trying not to get caught? Okay, so let's focus on ourselves to get the moat out of our eye so that we can get the beam out of our brother's eye. Not trying to lift ourselves up against them or to operate in vainglory toward them to feel like we're doing better than them, but to actually focus on ourselves to be able to help them to focus on ourselves and to get ourselves correct in the law so that we may be able to help them and to get rid of our own desires that are causing us to struggle and be double-minded and be a hypocrite when it comes to the law in Alahayim. Okay, so let's focus on doing what's right, not just trying not to get caught, okay? All right, let's go into Proverbs 28 and 13. And this is going to truly help us to do all things with sincerity and singleness of heart and mind that we may actually prosper in our works of righteousness. Okay. Casa, uh, when you're ready, please. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. All right. So he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Let's, the word covereth. Can we get the definition for that, Casa, please? Sure. H3680, a primitive root, properly to plump, that is, fill up hollows, by implication to cover for clothing or secrecy. Clad self, close, clothe, conceal, cover, cover self, flee to hide, hide, overwhelm. So we don't want to conceal our sins. And if we conceal our sins, we're not going to prosper because we're not going to come out of them. Okay. So be mindful to confess your faults and to be honest and speak truth in your heart about the things that you're doing wrong and confess them to Allah and pray unto Allah and find in the law what's going to help you to come out from operating in that sin or that transgression. Okay. So let's not cover our sins or conceal them try to hide them from people or try to hide them from ourselves or hide them from Elohim. Okay. Can we get the definition for prosper, please? He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. 86743. A primitive route to push forward in various senses, literally, figuratively, transitively, or intransitively, to break out, come Come mightily, go over, be good, be meet, be profitable, cause to prosper, make to prosper, effect prosperity, make sin prosperously, essentially. It's all good. I got you. <laughs> yeah, that one's no behind. Right. So if you conceal your sins, you're not going to push forward. You're going to stay right where you are, right? So let's make sure that we're confessing our faults so that we can actually prosper. We can actually push forward and grow because that's what happens with a lot of narcissists or what happens with narcissists is that they, they don't prosper. They stay right where they are and they don't really grow. They don't really change. 
And that's because they're concealing and covering their faults and their sins. But if we actually confess them, it's actually going to help us to push forward. It's going to help us to prosper, all right? But whoso confesseth, right? So you confess it, right? That's you confessing your faults. That's you um, repenting of your faults and forsaketh. Can we get the definition for forsaketh, please? Sure. A primitive root to loosen, that is relinquish, permit, commit self, fail, forsake, fortify, help, leave, destitute, leave off, leave, refuse, surely. So surely refuse, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you got to loosen it from you. You have to turn from it. You have to hate it, right? So you forsake it. So you actually have to confess it, and then you have to bring forth works that you actually have to do to actually loosen it from you, to stop doing it, to hate it, okay? To not do it anymore, okay? And if you do that, you're going to have mercy from Elohim, and he's going to help you prosper in your good works, okay? I thought you talked about with parenting, the child learns to just cry that somebody's going to come at every cry to help the enabler. But here we see confess and forsake will receive mercy. You talked about whether child or adult overcoming a narcissism, we have to understand who Allah Hayam is. It's like we're retraining ourselves to his parenting that he wants us as children or as people to confess and forsake, not just cry about it and hope for him to enable us to stay where we are or just give us a pass where we are. Proverbs 28 and 13 goes for everybody. The children have to do this too. They have to <laughs> learn this. When the parents are learning this or the parents are doing it, they have to teach it to their children. Okay. So you see what I mean? It's the same thing. They have to teach this to their children too. The children have to learn how to confess their faults and how to repent. They have to learn that. That's an essential skill for just being a believer. You know what I'm saying? So they have to learn to confess and forsake too and not to cover their sins, trying to hide them. Right? So this is definitely, this applies to everyone. Okay. Yeah. So definitely be encouraged. Anyone that's dealing with the spirit of narcissism, anyone that is, um, dealing with a narcissist to be encouraged that there is a way out of it you just have to put in the work and you have to truly want it and desire it you know so we pray that everyone enjoyed the lesson if you want to make hebrew readers church your church home please send us an email at hebrew readers at gmail.com we'd we'll love to have you we hope everyone enjoyed the lesson if the lesson was informational for you and, and helpful and truly um, strengthening for you. Please share the videos. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate every share. Um, may that holy name be exalted. We thank Allah Hayam. We thank Ahaya. We thank Yajay Christ. We thank Ruach Kodoshi, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us. And may that holy name be exalted. You got anything before we go, Brother Kostafu? Everything was great. Lesson is a great lesson. Hope is edifying for everyone. Well, praise Allah I am. And we hope everybody has a blessed day. And may Allah I am keep you all. Inshallah. HRC, 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 HRC,